Okay, listen, listen to me right now. Listen to me right now. Listen. I have reviewed this couple in the past, okay? And I I feel like your life is a reflection of what you put into it. And I don't take kindly to people who – like, I'm always – open to a victim story, but after a while, like your participation in the environment is sort of like consensual. And so at first I'm like really empathetic to Will Smith and very like, you know, and then eventually it's like, how much of this is your own doing, my sir? You know, and a part of it is like, he's a victim, he's not a victim. I don't know, do people not respect themselves enough? I'm not sure. It just feels like they're never on the same page. And I think that's what warrants so many people making fun of them is that it never feels like they're on the same page. Let's check out what was past Britney. What was past Britney's huge criticism criticism she had for them? Listen, when I was in the height of my trauma, when I hadn't gotten therapy or I was in the middle of therapy, it was really hard to hear criticisms about my body and what I look like. But now when I'm healed and better, it's just so funny to me. So the question is, are you allowed to, while you're in trauma, you know, claim you're making fun of me and it hurts me? Or should we rule society based off of like a healthier version of ourselves? Because healthy people can take a joke. That's what I'm saying. It's a joke, right? And then look at your life, Jada and Will. I'm talking about the Alpecia thing. Your life is a joke. If you can't maintain consistency, structure, community, a healthy outlook, and a good communication style, who the fuck are you to give people advice? Now listen, That video of Will Smith and Jada and him talking about, hey, you're like putting me online. You're putting me on live Instagram. I'm uncomfortable. This is my brand where he looks like very like in his feelings. I feel for that man. And I just want to take him away from her and hold him. And then another part of me is like, hey, you fucking grown ass 50 year old man who's a multimillionaire. Grow up, divorce this bitch and own your life. And no, that's not going to happen because he's in his trauma. Because Hollywood does not allow for healing. It does not allow it. And so in turn, sometimes I feel like maybe people don't deserve it because they choose consistently this living fucking hell on earth. And I will never understand why. Because, well, no, okay, that's a lie. Skirt, skirt. I do understand (laughs) why. Because I was given opportunities throughout my life to reach these moments. And I just was like, nope, nope, nope. Because I saw what it landed. And it landed a Will Smith Jada marriage. I don't want that. I would rather be single for the rest of my life than have a Jada Will Smith marriage. I'd rather be single the rest of my life than have Kim Kardashian bullshit marriages and relationships. Do you get what I'm saying? These are not relationships I admire. I do not see these people and think, man, I wish that was my life. But at one point in my life, I was celebrity obsessed. I grew up in a household that did not love celebrities. My parents... Um, don't worship celebrities they worship God so when I became friends with like my liberal friends and they were all into Vogue and brand names and celebrities I became obsessed because I was like yeah is this what I want and then I fell out of it again because I was like none of these people are happy though you know how many women I meet that are like yeah I'll suck a dick to be in a movie and then on on the other side these women were like I was forced to do this to keep a role and I'm like okay please Selma Hayek in um freedom Okay, we love the energy from past Brittany. This was like a year ago. I'm trying to, uh, uh, April 20th, 2022. So this Brittany was one month away from getting diagnosed and two months away from meeting her husband. (laughs) Okay, so this Brittany was two months away from meeting her now husband and moving to Croatia. She literally... Has no clue what's about to happen. I love this energy though. And I think the problem is, is like you have to have this weird balance between having like strong sympathy and empathy and compassion. You know what I mean? Um, For people. And then realizing that you also are like, can look at people and be like, I don't know why this is your life, but it's your choice. You know what I mean? Oh, that's so fucking funny. Discord says he talked about he talked about before how much how his value is to never leave a marriage. Even his last wife, after she cheated on him, she had to divorce him and he wouldn't let it go. Yeah, I think there's there's probably like for me, like a level of toxicity there where I feel like, hey, you know, if there's like a reason to leave, you should leave. Or if there's a reason to end it, you should end it. But it is kind of interesting. Yeah. Okay, let me show you. Um, let's go to Abba and Preach's video. I'm on preach. Here they come. Oh, they made a really short video on this. Okay, let's watch Abbott and Preach. 
And we're kind of we'll have a conversation about Jada and um and Will. So interesting. But but the thing that surprised her candid new memoir, Worthy, she opened up about an issue that has been kept secret until now. There are so many surprising things in the book, but the thing that surprised me the most that I actually had to reread it right. because I said, is this true? Right. Was that in 2016, you and Will decided that you were going to live completely separate lives. Yes. It was not a divorce on paper, hmm, right. but it was. You know what's interesting? I don't know if you guys know this. Do you know... Um, Danny DeVito and his wife, they've been married like 40-something years. They also went on their separate ways. Uh, Hugh Jackman and his wife, married 27 years, went their own ways. And it's interesting because these people obviously form very strong connections. They don't want to lose their relationships with these people. They love them so much, but they do go their separate ways. And I am curious on why Will and Jada didn't get a formal divorce. Like, what was it? You know what I mean? Um, does she want to stay relevant badly? So badly, you know, I don't know what it is about jada but she rubs so many people the wrong way and i think it's maybe because okay look i'll tell you the truth there is a little bit of a pet peeve i have of people who act really really strong but any slight like they can't she takes herself so seriously she's not fun that's what it is i feel like she takes herself so seriously that it's not fun something about jada makes me feel on edge Versus Will, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I've been enjoying the fuck out of his TikToks. Have you guys seen his TikToks? I will show you his TikToks after this. I've been cracking up. They've been very funny. I've enjoyed them a lot. And I think a part of it is like Will feels like a guy who's just like young and goofy and lighthearted. But he like stays with this woman who's like an ink, like a heavy, a heavy weight to like her energy is just like a heavy weight to it. I'm not. Yeah, I don't know what it is. Ingrid says, I think she's pretty egotistical. I mean, that's definitely, I think so too, right? I I just like, you know what I mean? Hey, girls. Hey, Chad. Hey, Brittany. Hello. Finally bought the membership. Let's go. I've been editing the Dolma video. It's coming out, guys. I'm really excited. Um, She comes off as overly sincere but not introspective. Oh, interesting. She comes off as overly sincere but not introspective. Interesting because sometimes a lack of introspection does look like a lack of sincerity. So I wonder if that's kind of the dilemma with with Jada, you know, a divorce. So from the year 2016, which is seven years ago now, <laughs> yes, y'all have been apart. Yeah. But in public, the couple who married in 1997 denied wow. the gossip about their marriage. This interview on Bravo's Watch What Happens Live with Andy Cohen yeah. was taped a year after Will and Jada separated. So uh, how long have you guys been together? Yeah, you know what it is? You know why? Okay, two things. One, it kind of feels like they're always gaslighting. So it always feels like they're telling us a truth to stay relevant or a false truth to stay relevant. Like, if you guys were separated, like I'm assuming they're about to back up their relationship right now, right? Don't, you know, keep my wife's name out of your mouth. You know, that slap we saw last few years ago, whatever it was. There is something disingenuous. Like there's something, there's something that makes me feel like we're being scammed a little bit, which is very odd to me. You know what I mean? I think they want it to be very serious. I remember years, years, years ago, I did when I was in my celebrity bubble time, I did think like, oh, it's cool that Will and Jada have an open relationship. That's that's dope. But the way they talk about it is so toxic. That's why I'm saying like just because you have an open relationship doesn't mean you're fucking more profound than monogamous people if you, there's only toxicity in your open relationship, right? Like I don't value people who are like quote unquote progressive if their progressive relationship isn't always, isn't also mimicking some sort of ethic or moral something that they follow, right? So with Will and Jada, I remember thinking like, oh, cool, open relationship representation. And then I remember thinking like, oh, no, like what a horrible representation. Uh, 23 years. Wow. Yeah. See? And like you're excited. You're like, oh, my gosh, they've been together so long. How do you keep it hot? Um, how do I keep it hot? Fuck my son's best friend. <laughs> Fuck my husband. I forgot we were watching an Evan Breach video. Imagine Tupac Shakur. Have my husband live out the fantasy of slapping men in front of me. 
I'm running the red table talk as if I had a real open discussion about my marriage and then being a fraud the whole time. <laughs> That's go hot. In. Go in. I don't know. I, I, go, I, no, go in. Go I haven't in. seen any of this. No, no, but go in. Over the next several years, Jada and Will kept up the appearance of a committed married couple. And I always thought they were so pretty together, and I always thought they looked so good, and their kids look good, and it's a whole little package. Sometimes I do think there is this desire from Will and Jada to be like that couple, to be that family, uh, and to be like good representation of like a family that comes together. Because after the slap, you'll remember that um, Jaden put out that tweet, like our family sticks together, our family's a unit, our family's this. And I think that's a nice narrative. And I think that that's, you know, but there's obviously something wrong here. There's like a lack of consistency here. And every time I see that, I go, mm. like when people are not on the same page, it's like, oh, couple. They even faced a scandal when Jada had what she called an entanglement with a family friend. It's not the friend of the family. It's the friend of the one dude that was your son. Okay. How do you guys feel about that? Moms having sex with their son or daughter's friends. I'm going to be real with you. Once again, I would like to preface this that I come from a bubble where my parents are my parents and they have their friends and I have my friends and our friends do not overlap. One time, my mom and I tried to overlap with some friends because they were like basically cousins. It was a shit show. It was the worst thing possible because I am so progressive and my mom is so Catholic and they're all so Catholic. You can imagine me being progressive and telling my mom's friend stuff about my life made my mom's friend, like basically our cousin, feel so uncomfortable, right? So no, I tried that one time when I was like 19 years old. Worst mistake we ever tried. At worst, but we... They thought they were like influencing me for the better, hanging out with some like Catholics, but like, oh girl, it was a nightmare. It was the worst thing we ever did. And so no, like my parents have their friends and I have my friends, period. Like don't like to mix groups, so weird, not a vibe. And a, a, like, it's just, you know what I mean? It's so weird, but then I know other people. And again, even if my friends are older, like I have friends into their 50s, I have friends in their 40s, I have friends in their 60s. I, even though the 60s are my parents' age, my friends are my friends. Their friends are their friends. Like my parents are not going to hang out with my friends. They're totally different, right? I couldn't imagine it. I would be, I would not be amused. Like I just would not be amused. Mm -mm. If I have a kid, my kid's friends are not my friends. Amen. They're not friends of the family. Yeah. The friends of my kid. You're going to have a play date with Tommy. Tommy's not my friend. Right. I mean, they could be friends of the family. But Tommy's not my friend. You can't bang your, your son's friends. Yeah, right. you can't bang your son's friends, people. Like, super weird. Don't do that. But then again, like, do it if it's your bubble, I guess. Like, that's the thing. It's like, this is a cultural bubble thing for me. Nah. <laughs> Absolutely not. Actually, even like, uh, how do I say this? My, like, uh. Even with like, even as I've grown older, like my friend's parents are still like, if they saw me as someone sexual, that would be a huge red flag, right? Like, cause I'm, I'm in my thirties, but they knew me as a child. So like red fucking flag, like even my friend's parents, if they started to see me sexually, like I'd be like, what is happening? You have known me since I was a child. Like there's something there that should be sacred. I think I admire, um, proper boundaries and relationships between like older people and younger people in terms of how they grew up together, the mentor relationships, like these things should not be sexual. Actually, depending on who you talk to, even in BDSM, some people recommend that your mentors in BDSM are not people you actually directly play with. Like I never directly played with my mentor. My mentor and I were not in a relationship. My mentor and I did not do BDSM together. She instructed me on how to do scenes safely. She introduced me to play partners. She took me to events. She had me read books, but she never played with me. And I think w that really helped make it clear our relationship was like apprentice. You know, like I was her apprentice. Like I was learning. I was her mentee. I was learning from her. And so it's, you know, it's one of those things where I, I kind of adhere to that as well, where if you're going to do scenes, you can do instructional scenes, but nothing that's too intimate. Like there should be like some sort of boundary. You know what I mean? Not, not all the time. I'm sure some mentors can do scenes with their bottoms and not make it weird. But it, even in BDSM, there's some conversations about this. So even when it comes to parents and kids in the neighborhood, it just it's a really weird idea. And so, I, you know, everyone's different. But yeah, Woody Allen has entered the chat, bro.
<laughs> That's what I'm saying. Woody Allen, if you're anywhere close to that story, if you relate in any way to Woody Allen's story, like so, in a, I don't know how he could think about doing this. Like what is wrong with people? It actually freaks me out when men take special, have special attention, like tend to, this is so bad because I'm generalizing, but like there's a specific group of men, a very small group of men that take special interest in little girls. And I swear to God, I would not put it past them to raise those little girls just to sleep with them. You know what I'm saying? Like there is a specific group of men, the Woody Allen groups of men. If you're like Woody Allen vibes, if you justify Woody Allen, if you think nothing is weird about Woody Allen and what he did, you are not coming around my kids, period. Uh, that's the real problem. I don't care if these are right. because I know some families who take in their, you know, their kids' friends as almost their own kids or sure. own family. Yeah, that's sure. fine. You just can't bang them. You can't bang them. I, I, I never thought I would have to say this, but I guess I do. As a parent, you can't bang your kids' friends. You know why? Because your your kids might want to bang their friends, bro. I feel like if your kids want to bang their own friends, they can't because now they've banged their mom. You know, I just feel like your kids should have the right to live their own life. I just feel like their kids should like have the right to have their own friends and their own life and their own lovers and they should never know each other. Have you seen that trend on TikTok where the girls go to a person's home and she goes, who's your father? What's his name? Because your apartment looks the same. And it's like a really interesting idea. But yeah, mm -mm. Mm -mm. no ma'am. I mean, you tan physically, but it's, I don't know. Listen, hey, we here in. That is one way of getting out of the friend zone. <laughs> <laughs> I was friend of the family, now I'm banging them all. <laughs> Forget that. That's just truly being a part of the family. Yeah. What better way to ingratiate than make babies? Oh, you part of this family? Yeah, I'm inside your mom. <laughs> That's <laughs> wild, bro. Neither let the public know they had already split. So I guess my question is, I feel like you're a straight talker. I am. Hmm? I feel like you're a straight talker. I am. <laughs> <laughs> is that what we feel? Yeah. Is that what you we feel? You and I decided we were going to take our space and what happened. Yeah. And then I got into an entanglement with August. Mrs. Entanglement is a straight talker. Bro, is this a whole interview satire? Is this run by the onion? So... Yeah, Jada really brands herself as being like very strong and very stoic and very honest, but she feels very dishonest to me. And I think it's because she's always trying to paint it like she is in the right. She's always trying to paint it like she's perfect. She's always trying to paint it like even when I'm messy, I'm messy in the way that like real people are messy. Why do that? Like what was the reason? I think just not being ready yet. Mm still trying to figure out between the two of us yeah. how to be in partnership, right? Hmm. And in regards to how do we present that to people, you know? And we hadn't figured that out. Hmm. During our walk in Baltimore, Jada reflected on their breakup. Why did the relationship fall? Yes, she is so performative, agree. Not sure. Oh, well, why it fractured? That, that's a lot of things. Yeah. And I think... All eyes on me. All eyes on me. me. All eyes on me. I think people say that, but I doubt it. You think it's just another man? It's just no, another? it's not another man. It's her not fully being with Will. Not one. No, she's only with herself. I feel like Jada is team Jada. Look, there's like a Trump-esque energy in people that I noticed. Jada is pro-Jada. Jada is whatever team Jada wins. She's not team Will. She's not even team her kids. And also, no offense, red flag when your parents name you after them. Huge red flag. It's like your parents don't want you to have your own identity. I believe it. I said it. That's how I feel. Like calling their kids like named after them. My partner and I just talked about this again. Another reason I married this man is right away. He's like, how do you feel about the fact that they named their kids after them? I was like, narcissist. He's like, gross. And I was like, it's disgusting. Like what you don't you want your kid to be basically like, basically you want to hear your kid, their partner, when they orgasm, your name come out of their partner's mouth. Like it's weird, bro. Like I don't like it. It's cringe. Like I don't like it. I saw this TikTok of a, a boy who's like, hey, so you know how you named me dad's name? 
when you scream dad's name out during sex, you know, you're screaming my name out during sex. And mom's like, what? No. And I'm like, literally, that's what are you doing? Like, let your kids have their own identities, bro. I can't I do not understand parents that name their kids after them. Like, ma'am. Wanting that. She said it at the first place. She don't want that. And then after. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Finish. So she said that she don't want that in the first place. I mean, she's a straight talker. I got to take our word, no? <clears throat> she said that, not me. But she's not a straight talker. And irrespective of whatever, she maybe she has feelings someone else. Where does the fucking, the friend, the, the son's friend come in? Where does the public embarrassment come into all this stuff? She got a lot more problems than she's in love with somebody else. On the list of stuff that she doing, why it's not working, I, I highly doubt Tupac's at the top. Personally. I didn't say that. Tupac. Um, what do you guys think about the idea that she said, like, Tupac's her soulmate? I think that's interesting, right? I I wonder, like, you know, from the stories you hear about Will and Jada, from the fact that she's kind of frustrated they even have to get married, or, you know, the way she rejects him, and the way that Will performs for her, and, like, trying to win her affection. I feel like so much of Jada is just Team Jada that she's not a safe enough partner to be with. Like, if your partner isn't really working as a team with you, like, why are we on this team, right? Like, Team Trump, Team Jada. Uh, Ma'am. <sighs> it's just so weird. I don't think that's fair, but it can be weird. You mean the naming your child after you? Most people do it because they think they have a legacy. You don't. But also, like, what is legacy? Like, I, again, you're saying my kid is now a part of this name. It's the same thing with last names. I think we should start normalizing changing your last names. My partner and I have considered making up a last name and having our own last name. Again, we don't know what we're going to do in that regard, but it's like, what is this? I, this Again, I understand there's something in my past. I used to love having my family's last name. I thought it was so wonderful and powerful, but it's like such a construct, right? It doesn't mean anything unless you put the meaning on it. So what meaning are parents putting on naming their kids after them? They are, they are putting a meaning on it. And I think they should examine that meaning. Why am I naming my child after me? What do I think this does? Because it definitely denies your child their own identity to some extent. You're literally saying you are a copy of me to such an extent I'm going to name you my name. Like at what point, right, do we want to actually actively participate in having individual children, even though they're a part of our genetics and even though without us they wouldn't be here? It's still that idea that I want my child to just be such a like a their own person, right? It's really interesting. First sons of Latinos are usually named after the dad. It's a culture and legacy, and it seems less weird to me, just patriarchy. Yeah, exactly. It's about legacy, and I just think, like, it's weird. True, Brittany, do you still have your last name, or did you change it to his? No, I haven't changed it. Like, we haven't changed too much paperwork. With immigration, mm -mm. changing last names is a pain. So I still have my last name, and he still has his. So paperwork with changing names is the biggest pain in the butt. Like with immigration, they told us not to do it because it would be too hard to change all my paperwork before immigrating here. So nope. Uh-uh. Um, but then if you get tired of that name, can you change it again? Sure, why not? Change your last name as many times as you want, girl. My partner and I also consider using a brand new last name for us or going back through our family tree and finding our favorite one. Ooh, that'd be fun. You know, my sister and her wife made up a last name. It actually has meaning to it. It's cute. See? I'm telling you, there's something about that that's nice, right? My ex and I were going to make up our last name too. My dad passed when I was little and I'm proud to have his last name. I am getting married soon and I am torn on what I should do with my last name. Fair. So see, you're keeping it alive because you want to keep the memory of your dad alive, which I think is fair. You could make it a last name. You know, in Croatia, um, they don't have middle names. So when I did my legal paperwork here, they were like, what do we do? What do we, what do you want to do with your like your middle name? I was like, what do you mean? They're like, what do you want to do with it? And I was like, what do you mean? They're like, well, you we don't have middle names. And I was like, oh, so I had to combine my first and middle name. That way it would match all my paperwork if they saw like if I had to be called in for something. So all my paperwork matches. I kept my middle last I kept my last my middle name, but I combined it with my first name. So that way, if they look at any of my paperwork, I just wanted it all to match for, you know, but I thought that was so interesting. Like I, I just, I wasn't prepared for that. You know what I mean? 
that she was in love with someone else. She was just not in love with Will. Okay, well, it doesn't matter. Not in love with whatever it might be. You said Tupac Shakur, so that indicates it's somebody else. Sure. Is that, that's, I'm just going off what you said. But you it's just like it's, like, it's like it's someone that's good. It's not, I wouldn't call it love because it's something that's really unattainable. You know what I mean? But it's holding that person to that unattainable standard that is dead on top of that. You know what I mean? The, oh, I wish it would have been something else. I wonder, I wonder. Yo, being next to it, I wonder what would happen if it's fucked up. You're not necessarily in love. To be honest with you, like, I really do you think like Jada rode the Will train? I mean, Will is obviously more likable and more famous than her. And the only reason I know who Jada Smith is, Jada Pickett Smith, is because of Will Smith. Like, let's be real. I can't even name a Jada film. I'm not. I, does she have a large fan base? You know what I mean? I'm with a person, but that person is looking behind your mind. Let's put it that way. Most people who get married or get in relationships have that what if with somebody else. That's not even necessarily what? always the issue. Because as you get in relationships, have that person is looking behind your mind. Let's put it that way. Most people who get married or get in relationships have that what if with somebody else. That's not even necessarily always the issue. Because as you get into a relationship, you settle into the groove of it, that excitement, that thrill goes away. You think about that one person who just gave you that feeling before and you you, you put the roast in the classes. The issue with this lady and watching her interviews into the groove of it, that excitement, that thrill goes away. You think about that one person who just gave you that feeling before and you you, you put the roast in the classes. Nah, my brain forgets. My brain is like, who? Like, guys, you have to understand, in like 20 years, the people I've dated in my past will just be like randos I dated. My dad used to be engaged to a woman who didn't become his wife, right? I asked my dad about her. I was like, do you ever think about this woman? He goes, oh. No, I mean, she's like, she's, I knew her 30, 40 years ago. Like, of course, like, I hope she's okay, but like, no. And I was like, yeah, like you got, like for me, I'm just like, I forget. Like there is no memory of my exes. I never think about them. I think about me at that time. Obviously I tell stories from that time, but I think about me from that time. I do not think about my exes. I do not think about our sex life. I do not think about the thrill I had with them because it icks me out now because I'm married. I'm in love. Like I... Nope. Like when I move on, when I break up from someone, that's it, girls. Like, whoop. not initially, like you always need time to get over a relationship. But like, no, 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 ma'am. Like, <laughs> like that is such a weird narrative in my head, at least. I don't know about you guys, but yeah, mine just go, whoop. like, I do not remember. And like, I do not. Yeah. I don't even think about my ex-husband. And that was only three years ago. Yeah. Like, I don't even... Like, I know it sounds hurtful to some people. Like, I know for a fact, like, I'm sure some of the moms that I'm close to with my ex-boyfriends probably or girlfriends probably. Well, my girlfriend's mom was dead. But like, you know what I mean? I'm sure they feel kind of bad. Like, oh, like, because we had such a bond. But I don't remember your sons, girls. Like, I remember your sons. Like, God, like, you know, but I don't. I I don't pine after your sons anymore. You know what I mean? Like, I'm married. Like, I'm in love. Like, I'm with somebody else. Like, I. This narrative is so weird to me, but I, I think people hold on to the memories because they want to say, like, I was important to you. And it's like, yeah, you were important to that version of Britney. But this version of Britney, like, it's hard for you to be important to her because, like, you are not in her life. Like, you weren't even meant to know her very long. Like, I always wonder, like, I wonder if, like, I wonder what that that guy I told you guys about, the older one who got in a car accident with me. Like, I sometimes I wonder, like, oh, I wonder if he's alive because <laughs> like he had a crazy life you know he could you know his dad disappeared when he was really young and he was like gonna go out set out and find him I wonder if he ever found his dad but like otherwise I don't think about our relationship together you know I don't think about what if like I don't have what if feelings because that would inc that would insinuate that I didn't make the decision in my life like I've made all the decisions in my life to move on so I can't what if my own decisions girl you know what I mean I think that is true if there are no closure, unresolved issues between you and that person, hence the what ifs. Ah, okay. I could see that. I think for me, because I'm like, I made, like, I make these decisions. I'm the one who, like, I break up. You know what I mean? So I guess for me, it's like, I don't have to what if, right? My life, maybe? The issue with this lady and watching her interviews or after anything happens is what does she do to Will? I had an entanglement. She don't take accountability. No. She deflects blame. She puts it on other things. She obfuscates everything. At the top of the list of reasons why they're probably not together, somebody else is probably at the bottom. 
Because there's a lot of things you can work through. Sure. You know, the whole Tupac thing is a funny meme because of the fact that she said some things and they've danced and like, oh yeah, he's dead, whatever. And she said some weird shit. I'm not gonna lie. Ah, the one who got away kind of shit. See, I don't believe in that. I don't believe in the one who got away. I don't believe in woulda, coulda, shoulda. I don't believe in right person, wrong time. Either that's your person or it's not. Forget about them is kind of my belief. So I could see people who believe in that. Like if you are, you're in a bubble where you believe in like the one who got away, like I don't buy into that. The one doesn't get away. You get married. <laughs> like the the right person doesn't get away. You get married, you know? The shit she said about Tupac, is I'm a fan. Weird. She's something else. But me watching her behavior, I'm like, I would look at all of those things before the fact that she's in love with some dead man. Concur. Mm. Yeah, no. Concur. I me mean, watching maybe... that Red Table talk with her and Will, that's divorce to me. Why would you broadcast that thing? But it's just the things that she was saying during that yeah. interview. Okay, but Tupac, okay, he died. Yes, so he didn't get away. He died, PB says. Okay, but Tupac... Maybe some people feel like he got away from her on purpose. Like, listen, Tupac died and it wasn't supposed to happen. Maybe if Tupac never died, him and Jada would have been together, right? Maybe that would have been what happened. So I think that's fair, but I think that that's, I think it is inconsiderate and borderline, I mean, I would say unethical to marry someone when you're interested in someone else. You remember? Oh my God. Did you see this season of Love is Blind? We're going to talk about it. We need to talk about it. Okay. We should talk about it tomorrow. Okay. We should talk about Love is Blind tomorrow. Even though I should do a podcast about it. Mm, I should talk. I want to talk to you guys about it though. Never mind. We should do tomorrow's episode on Love is Blind because literally it was crazy. One of the girls married somebody even though she wasn't in love with him. And I'm like, ma'am, Tupac was with another woman when he died. <laughs> I mean, okay. So again, again, whatever we're talking about, like she can't just marry somebody while she's pining after somebody else. That's why I think people are so worried about people being truly committed to them, right? I think that's the thing that I'm looking for is I want my partner to always understand that I prefer him over other people, period, to such an extent that I don't even notice. Like I was at the store today with him and I started to process the people in the store and I was like, oh, there's like people here. And I started to pay attention to the people there and I realized I think I'm paying less attention to people because I'm not, I'm just so focused on us and what we're doing for our home and like getting, like, like I'm thinking about groceries and I'm thinking, and it's not that I'm ignoring the fact that there are other people, but I think when I was single, I would have noticed the men and women in the stores more. Like I just would have noticed them and I would have been like, oh, they're kind of cute. Should I go talk to them? Because I'm an approacher. So I'm not even thinking about them. And today I was, I noticed two young people and then a bunch of old people because there's a bunch of old people in the morning. And I realized like, oh, in my past single life, I would have approached possibly these people or made a gesture at them if I found them attractive. But now, like, I'm just looking for, uh, you know what I mean? So Jada just seems so unfair. She just seems like she treats Will so unfairly. But then Will continues to defend and consent to it. It's like if you've got a chronically cheating partner and the husband or wife goes back to the partnership. At some point, they are initially a victim. And at some point, they're just consenting to their consent being violated, which is sort of like a weird. It's like a weird idea. Can you consent to your consent being violated? If you go back into a marriage where someone chronically cheats on you, if you go back to a marriage where somebody chronically hits you or assaults you, like, are you consenting to the pain or what are you consenting to? Is Will consenting to Jada's, I would call emotional abuse? Is he a victim of Jada or is he a victim of his unwillingness to leave the relationship? Is he a victim of his own childhood trauma, his own like ethics that tell him to stay? I've met so many couples. I've worked with so many couples who genuinely, genuinely, genuinely feel like they are bad if they leave their marriages. And a part of me, look, as the person who like doesn't like divorce except for abuse reasons, let me tell you something, right? If you've married the wrong person and they are not a person that you truly married thinking this was your person and you married them as a placeholder or settling, let them go. Get divorced for their sake alone. You know what I'm saying? And so there's something about this that I want to make sure it's clear if you're in a traumatized enough state or if per people have lied to you about getting into the marriage with you, I think that's what happens is somebody, the person who's actually in the marriage for love 
is often lied to by the person who isn't in there for the same reason or something happens along the way. Like there's, you know what I'm saying? There's like a disconnect that occurs, which is why I think most people are settling, which is why the divorce rate is so high. Because I think people do settle into relationships and then they wake up one day and they're like, oh my God, what am I doing? Why am I even here? You know? And then they say it so nonchalantly, like, yeah, I wasn't even in love and I got married. And I'm like, ouch. You know what I mean? He can be a victim and an abuser and yet it can also be a victim and an abuser for sure. I don't know if Will's an abuser though. I'm not, I haven't seen any content that I have seen that tells me Will is abusive to anyone but himself. Do you guys agree with that? Has anyone seen any news about Will that shows him being abusive? Because I feel like Will is only abusive to himself, which is like self-inflicted wounds, right? Like, I don't know. You know what I mean? Have you read his book? I have not read his book and I've not read Jada's book, but I heard in his book, there were some interesting tidbits as well. What do you guys think? By the time we got to 2016, we were just exhausted with trying. I think we were both kind of mm. still stuck in our fantasy of what we thought the mm. other person should be. Oh. You know what it really sounds like? Wow, projection and it's finest. Yes, Will has been abusive. Wait, what was it? I don't know this story. Or do I know this story? And I forgot. I don't I don't remember if Will has um done something. Not to Jada. Oh, but wasn't there a relationship with the actress on Fresh Prince? Oh, did he hit a girl? I don't want to say that out loud if that's not true. Did he have domestic violence charges? Will's a cheater. Ooh, I haven't heard anything confirming Will as an abuser. I mean, cheating is abuse, right? Does hitting Chris Rock count? <laughs> I mean, men are men are toxic masculinity. You know what I mean? Interesting. Kind of makes me sad that people just spend forever with whoever because that's what they're supposed to do. I know. It makes me sad too. Yeah. Some people will say people like Will are being manipulated or brainwashed uh, so they have less agency. I mean, I still think that could be true though. I, I'm not saying you have less agency. I'm saying there's an explanation. Because again, it doesn't – like you need that explanation for it to even make sense. Because why would a person stay in a situation like that? it would make sense that they were manipulated, brainwashed, or abused, right? Because you're just getting an explanation. It's not about giving them less agency, but I do think, obviously, if you're brainwashed, you do have less agency. And I think if you're abused, you might not know how to get out of that circumstance unless someone authentically gives you a, a way out. You know what I'm saying? Um, this is why it's so nuanced and complicated. At what point is somebody accountable for their actions? That's, it is very complicated, right? I was like, every time she talks, she says we, but it feels like she. Someone's not tired of trying when they get up on stage and slap a man for disrespecting his wife who hasn't been with him for six years. That don't sound mm -hmm. like somebody who's done with trying. Does that sound? Well, no. And that's the problem is like, is Will trying to such an extent that at this point it's like inappropriate? But then Jada, I'm sorry. Like if they don't come out that they're separated, you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know if Will is just making gestures towards Jada that are meaningless or if he's trying to get her back or but I think Jada is 100% not being as transparent in the situation. His book explains a lot about his issues. I think he ultimately doesn't see her and he sees his image and ideal of what he wants. None of that. Yeah, that could make sense. That could make sense. Yeah, he said in his book that he watched his mother be abused by his father in front of him. It caused a lot of issues with his relationships with women. Okay, noted. That could make sense, right? One person pointed out how he guilted her into saying, staying in the marriage. I don't think that classifies as abuse. He weaponizes niceness. I could see that. I could see that. Yep. I do think he weaponizes niceness as well. I think he has a lot of ego, which prevents him from seeing Jada, and Jada ultimately resents that. Well, just like she said just now, right? Like we were sick of fighting for a person who wasn't even in the relationship type thing. This is what I mean about fighting for people's potential or living for people's potential. And I genuinely see this as a huge difference in my relationship now. My current partner, my forever partner, the one difference between him and every other person I've been with is that I like him just the way that he is. Now, that doesn't 
What I mean by that is I like his values. I like the way he thinks. I like the person that he is. If he stayed like this for the rest of his life, I'd be pretty happy. And I like who I am and he likes who I am and we work together. We're not living for a version of ourselves. We're not holding out that one of us will change. We're just holding out that we'll be the same consistent growers that we are now. We're both very into introspection and philosophy. We want to grow and be better. So like the things we're working on are working are working on the things we've already worked on, but we're getting better at it, right? Like getting better at working out, getting better diets, getting better relationships with our introspection. But we're not trying to change each other. We're not saying like, oh, I can't wait for the day when you stop doing this. It's more like, oh, I'm so excited that you're working on uh, staying in shape and working out. Uh you know what I mean? Like, it's not the same. Like, I remember I dated people that I was like, I can't wait for you to change and be somebody not like this. You know what I mean? So I could understand that from Jade and Will. And like, Jade and Will both have like image, pristine image concepts around them, even though they're not pristine. They do come off as like a very specific image. It's almost like a nice, again, the image is good. It's like curated in a way that I do like, and I like Willow's music. And even Jaden has a vibe. But at the same time, feels so performative it's kind of sad i don't know i don't know sounds like to you no somebody make a joke at an award show you go up and slap that person does that someone like someone well, like who's giving I, up I on think, the marriage i think in that video i think in, in that video <sighs> that we when we covered that i said that it just looked like a whole lot of he's going through it yeah He's going through it. Yeah. He's still calling her my wife yeah. when she's saying, Keep my wife's name out your When you say it like that, he was trying to gain power at that time. That's what it looked like. You're trying to get till he's losing grip on something. He was going through it. It all makes sense. And she's like, Yeah, nah. He, he still didn't. He still didn't give, didn't give up, but at some point you got you got to give it up. The person is disrespecting you all day, every day, and all night in the social media, in the media, going to talk about you. Stop! If you're over it, you're making mileage with the names, the the, the, the dude's name. Jada says she considered a legal divorce, but could never go through with it. I made a promise that there will mm. never be a reason for us to get a divorce. We will work through mm. whatever, mm. and I just haven't been able to break that promise mm. but you still live separately we live separately it's weird but you still live separately we live separately but you still they did her dirty bro separately we live separately does she have something in her teeth and nobody told her wait you guys can't see because i'm in the way my girl got something in her teeth and nobody told her, right? Am I crazy or is that a stain on my? Nope, that's not a stain on my monitor. Did my girl have something in her teeth and nobody told her? The interviewer didn't tell her? Am I crazy? Ma'am. Wait, did you guys, can you guys see this? Like, do you see? Can you guys see this? Did I make it big enough? That is crazy. How did no one tell my girl she got something in her teeth? Mm. Mm. Okay, ma'am. Anyways, if I don't know. There's something. Um, it feels. They said before they don't believe in divorce. Yeah, there's something crazy here. Like, look, again, this feels like abuse to stay in the divorce. Or to stay in the marriage, sorry. Zoom in and hands. Oh my gosh. Anyways, she had, okay, she had, okay. It looks like one of those teeth gem things. No. Like, but again, like, okay. It's a decorative jewel. No, it, fuck it. No way, bro. But you still live separately. We live separately. That cannot be a jewel. It literally looks like a piece of pepper is stuck in the girl's mouth. I refuse to believe this. I refuse to believe this. I 100% refuse to believe this. That's a jewel. That's a jewel. That is not a pepper flake from a salad. That is a gem. No. That's a gem. It literally looks like pepper got stuck in my girl's teeth. There's no way. There's no way that is a decorative. That's jewelry, bros. 
You're telling me that that's jewelry. That's jewelry? For real? Rip. <laughs> no. It's a gem? It looks stupid. Take it out. It looks literally like black pepper. It looks literally like a black pepper got stuck on her teeth. What? Who does? Nobody love this woman to tell her, no, mom. Where are her kids? Are they not hip enough to be like, mom, it literally looks like there's pepper in your teeth, girl. Na, 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 na. Nobody loves these people, bro. Nobody has a Britney in their life to be like, nah, this is not it, girl. You literally look like there's pepper in your teeth. That's crazy. That is crazy. Nobody loves anybody in this world. I always pay attention. I'm telling you, if you love someone, tell them they look stupid. Okay? Like if you love someone and they like and you ask her, like, girl, I gotta tell you, can I can I give you an opinion? It looks like there's fucking pepper in your mouth. Get a better gem, girl. Oh, she's showing, okay. Discord's showing me a snap where she like shows it off. Nobody loves her. Nobody loves this woman. Nobody loves this woman. I'm telling you, tooth gems can look good. This one. Okay. Like, mm, I don't, this. Mm, mm. It's weird. You see this? Yeah, we live separately. It's, it's off. This is what I think. What do you think? I think Will looks like a chump. That's all I think. Unfortunately. But Will went from that man to like never want to be that man in my later years. Say that again. Will went from my younger years being that man to never want to be that man in my later years. Yeah, really. I look at Will and he just looks so pathetic to me. That's what's so sad when like there is a thing about. <sighs> that's the thing is like. Why does Will look pathetic and why does he look like a sympathetic victim? Is it because he has too many, too much privilege and he doesn't make a better decision? There is something about that. Like your place on the privilege scale can cause people to no longer have sympathy or empathy for you because if you can't get out of a bad situation, who can? And at the same time, that is a victim loop that people go down, which is very, very bad, which is like, I should be able to get out of this. I'm tough. I should never have experienced this. It's like, you want to be very careful that you know anyone can be a victim. It doesn't matter how rich you are. Anyone can, can suffer. Anyone can. So it's like, it's very hard. Like I want Will to, I want us to be thoughtful about victims. And we also need to have a conversation around at what point do you got to let people just live their lives, right? So like as an older sister, as a parent, you know for a fact you will watch your siblings and your children go through things that you wish they could avoid, versions of pain you wish they could avoid, right? But at this point, like why isn't this man? We don't look at men as victims. I just don't think that's true. Will has been, we've been cheering for Will as a victim for years, I just think like some people don't look at men as victims and most of those people are men. There is a huge group of women that have been working very hard to get people to, to notice male victims. And a lot of men are also speaking up for themselves. But there is this like, at least in my bubble, men can be victims. But as a society from all the internet I'm on, even watching Abba and Preach, We've all been very vocal about Will getting out of this relationship. I have a podcast about it from last year. So it's like Will has Will is one of the most like in my opinion public men who are victims. You know what I mean? So I'm not sure if that's you know, I'm not sure how that's working out like you know what I mean? I'm not sure. Yeah, you can't say we though, like you, like your groups of men. Because again, like in my circles and feminist circles and queer circles and uh, progressive male circles, like they've been fighting for male victims. Uh, if whether or not you want to join their cause is up to you. But with Andrew Tate's in the world and Elon Musk's, like they don't really believe in male victims. They only believe in their friends who are victimized. Right. That's the problem. You know what I mean? Can you name a high profile victim in real life? I mean, like Terry Crews came out and he got a huge amount of support. Right. Um, but the thing is like a lot of men don't want to talk about things. Men made fun of Terry Crews for being assaulted. Men, mostly men made fun of Terry Crews for coming out as a victim of assault. So again, like you can say society doesn't care about men, but who is society? Who are the primary like 
people in power in society. It's men. So again, like you can point fingers, but men made fun of Terry Crews for coming out. Women supported Terry Crews. Queer supported Terry Crews. People supported Terry Crews, right? Men made fun of Terry Crews because they said, well, like, what the hell? Like, Terry Crews is huge. You could have punched that guy out. He's still a victim of sexual assault. So again, like, I'm all about the shift in bubbles. I'm all about people doing different things. But when I see people try to do it different and they're getting mocked by the same people who claim they never get seen, my bros, you can't even see yourselves, you know? Also, Will never came out uh, thinking of himself as a victim. True, Nero. Okay, that is true. Brandon Frazier? I don't know the story about Brandon Frazier. Oh, yeah. And Terry Crews was assaulted by a man. What happened to Brandon Frazier? I don't know about Brandon Frazier's uh, story. What was his? I'm not pointing figures. I'm just saying how society does. But, like, again, who is society? So I agree in the in the bigger bubble, sure, but in the micro bubbles, like people are trying and that's why like we have to have a push for, I guess, society to change. But again, I can't get men to find themselves. If men won't refuse to see themselves as, vic as victims, like I don't know what to do. You know what I mean? Like I don't know what to do, right? Like if you guys aren't willing to admit like you have trauma, I can't even get YouTubers to do it. You see YouTubers in this space all the time like, oh, my childhood was literally horrible oh but I was fine no problem like nothing I'm definitely not impacted by it and it's like men men really got a hard time admitting that they are traumatized I told Wick he was traumatized because normal adjusted people do not go through society assuming everyone is out to get them that is trauma like and people are like that's not trauma like again normal adjusted healthy humans do not go through society assume assuming everyone is lying to them or could hurt them that is a learned behavior. Where did you learn that somebody might be lying to you? Like, where'd you learn that behavior? You know? So it's it's very interesting. You know what I mean? And the fact that he went up on stage and slapped somebody over some lame joke. Okay? Mm. Right? Mm. Over a woman who ain't even really his. Fucking other dudes. Disrespecting him all the time. Will just look like a chump. Look like a chump. That's all it comes down to. I could have seen something happen like where there would be reconciliation, but after this, mm. I, I'm in. I, I'm putting myself in the shoes of uh, uh, Chris Rock, and I'm like, I'm writing a new special. You slap me over what? Yeah, Will slap me over our wife. <laughs> our collective wife. <laughs> yeah, she for the streets now. We've been knowing. She, she boy, she been through this separation. You, you, but you. Damn. Okay, wait. Yeah, yeah. Has a great point. People realized his victimhood was due to his massive ego and not being the typical victim loop that happens in most relationships like this. They victimized each other equally for ego and money. I think that does actually coincide with what Abin Preacher talking about about the slap. I think that's probably true in this circumstance because the slap, like, it was so confusing the slap, and now it's even more confusing. And so I do think that's probably more accurate. I think Yaya is probably right on that. Where. Will feels like an unsympathetic victim because he, one, doesn't see himself that way and two, denies it. But three, no matter what happens, this man will defend her. And at some point you're like, girl, you deserve her, which is why the name of my podcast last year was maybe Will deserves Jada. You know? Okay, hold on. It's believed that Frazier was blacklisted by Hollywood because he claimed he'd been sexually abused by a former president of Hollywood Foreign Press Association, Philip Burke. No way. I believe it. He accused someone in Hollywood of essay and was blacklisted for it. He got pushed out of the industry for trying to speak up, I believe. Yeah, man. Okay, so, okay. First of all, I totally fucking believe that because Hollywood is disgusting and I hate it and I'm not going to put my, If I ever have kids, you ain't going to Hollywood, kids. Sorry, you can become a YouTuber maybe, but like we ain't going to no Hollywood girls. Oh my God. MMM says... Uh, yeah, men and some women make fun of male victims because of the effects of the patriarchy that teach men that they're less of a man um, to be weak or emotionally vulnerable. It sucks, honestly. It does suck. It does fucking suck. That sucks. Like, okay, when I hear YouTubers, especially allegedly progressive YouTubers who say like, don't cry in front of women, don't be sensitive in front of women, lie to your woman, do not tell her the truth, do not be honest with her. I'm sitting here like, bro, again, if you're dating healthy, adjusted people who are honest with you and forthcoming and honest with themselves and their like realities, you're going to find people like, I love it when my partner cries, I cry, he doesn't mind when I cry, I don't mind when he cries. Because like, if we're watching an anime... <laughs> You think we're not going to cry? 
Like it's it's good to cry with your partner. You know what I'm saying? Like crying is a normal human emotion, y'all. But some people are like, if a man ever cries in front of a woman, like there's nothing I like more than honesty. And crying is a part of honesty. I'm honestly going to cry at this anime right now. And I need it to be chill. Like, you know what I'm saying? I don't know how many times my brothers and I have literally cried during like my hero academia, watching Endeavor have his arcs. And you're like, you know what I mean? I love that. My family, like, listen, we, I okay, okay. So there's something to be said about like how you're raised, what's allowed, what's honest. But yeah, when I see people on the internet literally push these same things because they haven't healed from their own bullshit trauma, and it is, it is real trauma. It's so frustrating because you're literally continuing the narrative that men aren't allowed to be victims or men's victimhood is invalid. And that's bullshit. Of course, if, if anything, obviously men are traumatized. Have you seen the world? Have you seen war? You, what do you think that's from? That's crazy, bro. Crazy. Ugh. Will Stick since the 90s was being the clean rapper. Maybe part of it is that. Oh, good point. Already seeing Will as a corny, weak man in the context of hip hop and rap. Just something I noticed. Maybe. Yeah. In overall society, not in bubbles. I mean, overall society is a bubble, right? Because like not everyone works the same everywhere. Yeah, she mar She created a marriage advice type show the entire time they were actually separated. <gasps> Wait, that's such a good point. Did Jada Smith's show literally go on while they were separated? That's a scam, bro. Is that a scam? That's why nobody likes these people. The you're right. Wait. Wait, I think you're right. So their show. Bullshit. That's so funny. Stop. You slapped me over what? Our wife. You slapped me over the fact that. You know what this is? Hey, this about? is whenever you go out with a girl and you go to the restaurant and her ex shows up and it's like, who's this dude? And she's like, yo, my God, we've been broken up since like two years ago. Nah, man, you mine. No. You mine. That's how pathetic it is. I, I don't even watch yeah. that. But it's not. It's different. It's different because Jada goes with him in public. They were in public about their separation. Jada plays this game with Will where it's like in public, as far as anyone knows, we're still a couple. Did Will and Jada ever talk? Oh, hold on. Did Will and Jada, Will and, uh, did Will and Jada ever do anniversary posts? Will and Jada anniversary posts? Did they ever do like Instagram posts? Posts? Okay. Will Smith Anniversary tribute to wife Jada is beautiful and really deep. 2018. Since joining Instagram a few weeks ago. Let me pull this up for you guys. Um, hold on. Um, okay. Since joining Instagram a few weeks ago. Oh, fuck. Uh, Will Smith has been a little, a little bit goofy, a little suave, and a little retro. On Sunday, he's a little bit sweet and a little bit philosophical. Philosophical, philosophical. Anyway, Bright Star 49. <laughs> Bright, cringe. Okay, celebrated his 20th wedding anniversary to wife Jada Pickett Smith, okay, by posting a wonderful throwback photo from their big day in 1997. This was, okay, literally, this was just a few years ago. 20 years ago today, we held hands and walked naively down the aisle. Here's what I have learned since. Okay, blah, 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 blah. Love is freedom, love is giving, love is listening. Okay, love that. Um, happy anniversary, my queen, blah, blah, blah. And then congrats to Will and Jada on the milestone. So that's the problem, right? Does Did Will know they were separated? And then are we just being scammed? Like, that's fine. I love being scammed by Hollywood. It's a turn on. 2018. We're in 20, 2018, 19, 20, 21, 23. So that's just, wait. Is that the separation? Am I doing my math right? 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. Okay. That was the end. Wait. Wasn't 2018? No, 2016 is when they broke. They went on a break, right? Or they separated. Yeah, so this was two years after. It was, I thought, I, th I heard it was six years ago, but didn't she also say 2016? I think the interview said 2016. But like, that's what I'm saying. What is happening?
Maybe that was the last year they posted or they did a. Huh. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. You know what it's like? It's like when you're in a group of friends and somebody roasts you in that group of friends, but they too big, so you don't want to fight with them. So the next person that laughs, you start fighting them. They didn't make the joke, right? The one who really stabbed you was a person, but you can't fight with them. So you fight with somebody who laughs. Why? Just because you don't want to adhere or deal with whatever. That's what it looked like. You didn't. Th yeah. Because he can't I beat up. He, he can't slap Jada. You can't slap Jada. You can't throw you, hands with. You can't, she can't. You can't, can't slap Tupac. You can't, you can't throw hands with uh, August. You can't throw hands with. And he was intimidated with by, by Tupac. That's what he said. His words. While he's talking mm. about uh, what a clown. run quick C, you're like getting jiggy with it. I know you're not gonna slap the man, right? Is this like heterosexual problems? Can I be real with you? Is this like lack of introspection, like heterosexual problems? Like you are competing with a dead man. But, like, also, you're competing with, like, a wife that isn't being transparent or honest with you. There's layers here that I feel like are almost, like, it's, it's like, I don't know. It's, I just find it to be so cruel. Like, there's something about it that's so cruel. And there's another part of it where I'm, like, are you in this together? Oh, she brought on marriage counselors and therapists to pretend like they were still together, not separated. That's what I mean. If Will is in on it, then him and her are just fooling all of us and we shouldn't care about this. Like, are they in on it together? Is this the plan? Do you think they sit around and cuddle and they're like, how should we fuck with the public tonight? Like, do you think they like literally are like, <laughs> like, is that why they're not getting divorced? Because it's like cheaper to stay together. And do you think like, do you think they're even writing a book that's even a lie in of itself? Because, guys, if they got, if they were still together right now, we wouldn't even know. Just like we didn't know they were together. But, the, okay, the last six years plus, okay, they were separated. But to us, they were together. And now she's saying, oh, I wrote a book and we've been separated. But they could actually be together. Do you hear me out? What if the conspiracy is that they cuddle on a couch together and they're like, how should we make legacy money for our family? Because what if they're just playing this game? What if they're like two A's? They're completely outside the bubbles and they actually are just like, like, hey, fuck it. We're all going to die. Like we're just people on a planet and we should just make as much money as we can. How do you want to do it? Oh, let's write a couple books. Let's paint this picture of us. Let's have the world think anything they want of us. Let's make a bunch of money. Like, is that what's happening? Or is it like a genuine, like, am I watching Will Smith literally lose his mind in front of me? Because it feels that way sometimes. It feels like he's literally losing his mind in front of us, which I think is just me feeling like I'm losing my mind when I think about Jada. You know, what is the case for Jada being abusive and Will being a victim? I'm not finding anything convincing. Well, I think it's the fact that does Will, is Will under the impression that he's in a loving marriage and that his wife is loyal to him? Or is Will under this impression that if he just acts a certain way, his wife will accept him? Is she telling Will, Will, if you just act really good for me, I'll be with you, baby, and only you will. If you just do what I say, if you are really good, if you're a very good boy, I'll be there for you, Will. I'm the only one who loves you, Will. No one else loves you. Like, it sometimes it feels like Jada is like seriously manipulating what, because she's manipulating us, guys. Think about it. She's fucking with us. You think, it feels like she's fucking with her husband, but maybe they're both fucking with us. Somebody's lying, and we know it's at least Jada. Right. We know at least Jada is definitely lying and probably will. But the fact that they had that red table talk as if they were married when they were allegedly separated. And by married, I mean together. So they are lying, period. Like this book is almost dumb of her to put out because she's basically saying like, yeah, I've been fucking lying to all of you, you dumb fucks. And we're all like, what? Like what's happening? I swear she's like Andrew Tate. She's she's like the girl Andrew Tate. She's fucking scams and tells bullshit stories, makes money giving bullshit advice. And then she says, like, yeah, I've been lying to you. And everyone's like, no, that can't be it. Right? Brittany, the conspiracy theorist. <laughs> I'm just saying she's been lying. So if she's been lying, you know, I think there's definitely an element of Will being more likable. And so people want to sympathize with him. True. Maybe they're just in on it. Maybe it's just like a couple 
who's fucking with all of us and they're making lots of money on us. And like, I don't even know if I'm mad about it. Like, make your money. You know what I mean? Like, but it is a lie. Right? So, yeah. Yeah. Again. Wait, that's wild to put that intention on her like that? Why? Wait, which part? Which part? We've seen so many videos and evidence, her own interviews. Wait, what what intention on her? The one, which intention is crazy to put on her? Because like, she's been, she just said in her memoir that she's been lying to all of us, right? And we're all looking at Will like, did you know you were also separated? Because he said, and I quote, keep your wife's name out of my fucking mouth, or your fucking mouth, and assaulted a man and lost his status at the award ceremony, couldn't even go back in. For a woman he separated from? You know what I mean? Like, something is weird. Yeah, that, that's crazy. Clown. But you said it the best. You said it the best. He went from... Think about who he was when we were growing yeah. up. He was in the coolest movies. He was doing songs that not everybody liked, but everybody still got jiggy with it. You get me? Right? People loved his no, character bro. on Fresh Prince. We love they Fresh loved Prince. him in the movies of Bad Boy. 100%. He had the body. He had everything. Everybody was looking at him. He had a pristine life in the background doing charity work. Everybody was looking at him like he's that dude. And come to find out, you look behind the curtains, and the dude is basically a cuck. He's Nico 2. Point. Don't. Cucking is a valid kink. No. That shit crazy to me. It is. So. It, it is. How do I feel about the man? I don't know. I don't know what to say about this guy. It's just sad. As far as she goes, she's what she is. That's crazy. because like, And what? now you don't understand why them kids are so weird. What? How can they not be? <laughs> yeah. You know what? I'm going to say this too. Willow and Jaden, for the weird environment they had to grow up in, came out very good. They did good. Well, Will's oldest... Is not nowhere near that because that's oh, not yeah. who he had. Will's oldest seems well adjusted, actually. His oldest kid. <sighs> that's Weirdo crazy. Central. But yeah, so we'll see when the full interview comes out. There's anything more interesting, but that's all I got. Anything else you want to say? I just wish that she she yeah, shut the fuck up with that. Jada, stop talking. She's trying to make some money. I know she's trying to make some duck, duck some money. Sure. But it's like she, you 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 did enough. It's cool. We we no, like no. No, absolutely not. She married a chump. She should make as much money off that chump. Good for her. So these chumps learn. Stop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what? Put out a tell-all book. Say his dick game is weak. Say whatever you got to say. So that anybody watching this never tolerate this kind of behavior again. I'm of the opposite mindset I preach. I hope she destroys Will Smith. Yeah, don't half-ass it. Because I don't ever want to see this kind of garbage again from any other individual. Will, throw him to the wolves at this point. That's how I feel. I see what you're saying. I disagree. But I see what you're saying. But, yeah, no. Hey, he chose her. You, you, I understand. He made his bed. He got lie in it. Jesus Christ. Hey. Well, he, he doesn't lie in it. Everybody else is. Well, I saw him slap Chris Rock. That's him lying in it. Hmm. I'm saying... He, yeah, yeah, yeah. I got you, though. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Everybody's lying in it. No, but he's lying in the bed, too. You just watch it. <laughs> Can you watch that August come through his crib and be like, hey, you want something for breakfast? Like, nah, you got that pipe in your wife. That's crazy. That's crazy. Okay, first of all, Abba has a bias against open relationships and swapping couples. But I will say, I think Abba and I are more on the same page where after a while, like, what are we really looking at here? Um, okay, hold on. I want to see. I want to see. Um, I think you're right that there are plenty of couples that just stay together because it's easier. I agree with you. It's where famous it would uh if you're famous, it would be easier to just stay together. I agree. I think that's probably a part of it. Um, Brianna says, because you don't know her to say she's saying this, and that is in Will's ear. We don't well, of course I don't know that literally. I'm giving it as a possible theory. We don't know what their connections uh conversations are when they are talking. And Will won't say either. Yeah, but like we have enough evidence from their talk shows, from their interviews, from their books now of at least enough. Like, again, like the, I'm a YouTuber, right? Like I could be very wrong in the same way that people are constantly wrong about my life as well. And if I'm wrong, I'm wrong, right? But Will and Jada created an environment where it's very much a lie. So we have a right to be suspicious of them, right? Like they, she just put out a book basically admitting that she's been scamming everyone in relation to her show and that there isn't a consistency with her content, right? So I don't think it's totally unfair for us to assume she's also manipulating anyone else in her life. You know what I'm saying? 
So what? Abba recently said he'd be open to open relationships? Nah. What? What? Oh, okay. Interesting. So again, I don't know why anyone feels like I f- I feel like Jada and Will are both scamming or one person is lying more than the other. So either someone is a victim in the relationship and being lied to, but the public is definitely being scammed, right? So like, I don't care, scam away, do your Hollywood shit, everybody lies, whatever. Um, but I don't know why it wouldn't be that weird for Jada to be in his ear like that. You know what I'm saying? Because she's obviously not protecting him and he's not protecting her unless, again, they're on a on a scam team together, you know? People out here doing wild ass shit at what's seen as a lower level, like YouTubers and Twitch streamers, Hollywood manufacture shit on the whole new love level. Yeah, I know. There isn't much that seems too crazy. True. Like, there is, like, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, you would be shocked at some of the stories behind the closed doors of, like, YouTuber life. But Hollywood, I think, is, like, probably times a bazillion, you know? Probably times a bazillion. Yeah. You should explore the Musk situation with his dozens of kids. Bro, I've talked so much shit on Musk. <laughs> Uh, Brittany, did you hear they're now linked to Scientology? Yep. We went down the Scientology bubble yesterday and I think we talked about that, like the celebrities that are tied to it, you know? I agree with Abba. Show this to the world because every man that would be, that would still be, would never, wait, hold on. Every man that would be a, or would be Will will never be a Will after watching her disgusting personal personality. Maybe. Hopefully. You know what I mean? I don't know. But listen to your words as you describe this phenomenon of a different image being put forth in reality. The weight is all on Jada and that's not fair to say. Well, there's a reason for that, right? Why wouldn't you assume that they had a conversation about what they want for their images? I mean, I did give that as a hypothesis as well. I both said they could be scheming. It's just that the way the story gets told in public, they've either schemed it so Will is the victim and she's the bad guy. Do you, do you know what I'm saying? If they, okay, if they came together as a couple and orchestrated this, then they chose to make her the villain. She's obviously the villain in the story. She says it herself. She's the villain. You know what I mean? Because the way she interviews, the way she talks about Will, like, it's villainous. Now, if her and Will both agreed to making her the villain and him the victim, then great. They're both scamming us both. But if he didn't agree to it and he's just as confused or just as like naive about protecting her, then he's a victim and she's not. You know what I mean? Did you hear Britney Spears has a memoir coming out in a few days? I'm hyped to read it. Girl, I'm so hyped. I'm so hyped. I've already like, yes, I'm on top of it. I want it so bad. That is one memoir I'm picking up. Like I'm going to I want. I hope there's an audiobook. Like I'm ready. I'm ready. You know what I mean? No, Nero, Brittany, Brianna Williams is like, Brianna's a real person. She's like very active in this community. She is not a troll. You know what I mean? She's unreasonably defending Jada. She's, she's, she's allowed to have an opinion. Brianna is like a part of our community. I know that username. Like she's chill. She's not a troll. But not an equal weight, such as you're inserting words in their mouths about their conversations behind closed doors. I, girl, I'm a YouTuber. We do that all the time. That's what they want us to do. Will and Jada want us to guess what their relationship is. That's why they make it public. That's what they want us to do. Literally, girl, why do you think they have their shows and their books? That's what they want us to do. I am just doing what they want us to do, which is talk about them. She wants us to talk about her. That's why she makes wild statements. That's why she puts out a tell-all book. She wants us to theorize about her relationship so she can become more famous. I'm doing what Jada wants, you know, but that is my theory. That is how I live my life. I look at people and I look at their actions and I said what I said. You know what I mean? I don't think it's wild to say that there could be a possibility that Jada is being incredibly toxic and manipulative based off of the way we've seen things. And I'm not going to give equal weight to both Jada and Will because of the way they're presenting themselves in public, Jada owns most of the responsibility by the way it's being presented because she's the only one running her fucking mouth. Will is trolling everybody while Jada is opening her fucking mouth. Let's watch a TikTok. Jada is the one talking. Will yeah, is the one gyne- not talking. Yeah, blow gynecologa. Все ток, Hold on, планово. my TikToks are random. Yeah, oh my gynecologa. god, I hate TikTok. Why is it? Hold on. 
Okay. How do we go to Will, Will Smith's TikTok? Hold on. Will isn't talking, right? So Jada has to have the responsibility because she decided to make sure she her voice is the only one that's being heard, right? Okay, here, check it out. This is Will. This has been Will's response. So he said, notifications off, smiley face, okay? Fun fact about me, I can sleep anywhere, okay? Fine. Next one. I got something for you. Here's Official the thing. statement. So my opinion of, of the... I got something for okay. you. Here's the thing. This is Will. This is what Will is giving us about his relationship. Okay. That is what Will is saying about the relationship. Okay. A lot of people might not know, but he proposed <laughs> to you while he was in jail. I talk about this in the book when I go to see him in Rikers. When I wrote about that in the book and when I had to um, talk about it, uh, speak my words for the audible version of the book. That was probably one of the more painful parts, seeing him there, the condition that he was in and having to leave him there. <clears throat> and um, he was in, he was, he was in, a, he was, he was, he was in bad shape. And so when he asked me to get married, hmm. he was at Rikers. And I knew at that time that, A, he needed somebody to do time with him, hmm. which I was going to do anyway. He didn't have to marry Okay, so she's like, she talks about uh, Tupac and proposing to her. And notice that she doesn't choose him. She says he was a soulmate but didn't choose him. I feel like Jada is an opportunist. She picks it if it's convenient, right? So are y'all living together? It's just this beautiful connection. Pro we will. Mm -hmm. Look at that. We Not will. right now. But you will. But yeah. You will. yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, Why yeah. do you say that with such a clarity? Um, because that's, that's what it's going to be. That's mm -hmm. where it's headed. Yeah. Why do you think she shares this? Like, why do you think she's sharing private information about her relationship with us except to sell books and except to sensationalize her life and except to make money? And she's willing to do that at the consequence of her relationship, whether or not they've agreed to it or not. Even if they've agreed to it, some things are meant to be private in a relationship, right? You don't have to. You can make it famous, but then people are going to make guesses about why you're doing it, right? Because she is giving us mixed messages, right? And that's what's so confusing. Right? There's a reason why she's being memed so hard. My spirit was baffled and my spirit's spirit children were baffled when William slapped Christopher and spoke the words, keep my wife's name out of your mouth because that ain't called me his wife in 10 years. People don't know this, but William and I have lived separate lives. It's like embarrassing. It's like she's embarrassing him and whether he's in on it or not, it doesn't matter, right? And that's what's kind of crazy is like she she's allowed to say everything. She can tell us his dick size and what color it is and how it tastes. But again, like weird. It's weird, right? And she's the only one talking. So, you know. Jada Pinkett Smith here. Oh, Jada Pinkett Shakur, actually. Shakur? As in the late Tupac Shakur, rest in peace what, to my husband. What about Will Smith? Who? Your husband, Will Smith? I've never met that man Will in my fucking life. Will Smith? Oh, you mean the homie I had kids with. The homie? Okay, okay no. Like, there's a reason why people are memeing on her so hard, because every time she talks, it's like, if my husband talked about me the way that she does, it's like, ma'am. And so it's fine. Like, it's fine. I don't care, because they could be both scamming us. But if they're not, then there's something seriously like weird going on, right? It's like weird. Anyways, I'm all about us having different opinions. They're public figures. I'm a public figure. You can cons like make a conspiracy about my life all you want, but use what I've said at least. You know what I'm saying? Like use what I've said at least, you know? Jada, we're just going off what she said. She said she's been lying to us for years. They've actually been separated. She was very confused that Will slapped Chris and called him her his wife. She's like, why would he do that? Why would Will 
slap Chris on behalf of his wife. I'm not his wife. Oh, but I'm going to run a show where I'm going to make who knows how much money claiming we're still married and we've worked through all our problems and we're this great couple. No wonder people will be falling for Andrew Tate and everyone's scams. That's what I'm saying. The world deserves to be scammed. People will literally tell you I'm lying to you. And you're like, no, that's not the answer. They, they, they don't mean that. And I'm like, they just told you, girl. So anyways, you know, whatever. Kay says we have enough information based on what they presented to make inferences. Doesn't mean the inferences are gospel. True. And we know everything. But we know we don't know everything. And it's still fun to guess. Literally. We're just, we're just guessing. You know what I mean? We're just guessing. But if you haven't read his book, how can you say these things? Yep, I haven't read either of their books. That is true. You know, I'm just going off of what I'm seeing, you know. You know, I'm just I'm just having fun, you know. She's looked like she's having fun, whether it's because it's a game to both of them or she's a total narc or screwing Will over. It's pretty fucked. Yeah, it just feels really weird. We're going on with, yeah, we're only using what they're saying publicly to kind of make an idea of what could be happening. Like I do with everything I watch. Literally like, oh my God, Sophia, welcome to the memberships. Yay. I always wonder about that, guys. Why do you think people get defensive of public figures? Because like I look at all of us as public figures. When I talk about love is blind people, I also know they're real people. But that's what we do. Like that's what I've been doing with my content for years. That's why I, I listen to talk radio. That's why I watch therapists. That's why I watch everyone look into everyone's relationship, whether they're right or wrong. It's just fun to see. Hey, did you see what I saw? And are we all seeing the same thing? And like, oh, I wonder what's actually true. Why do you think that sometimes we get defensive over some people? But like, do you guys, what do you watch if you don't watch people talk about other people? Because I only watch people that talk about other people. I watch Abin preach. What is Abin preach's whole shtick? There are people who talk about other people. I watch Dr. Kirkonda. He's a person who talks about other people. I watch Brittany Simon. She's a person who talks about other people. So why do you think we get defensive when we watch people theorize about other people if that's not like what content are you consuming because that's the content I consume that literally is the content I consume you know I consume all kinds of content but I watch documentaries which is what people talking about other people interviewing about other people crime stories people talking about other people talk shows people talking about other people like you know what I mean it feels like a weird for us not to talk about other people you know what I mean? Since that's the best-selling shit anyways. We love gossip. <sighs> Gotta agree that Jada is an opportunist, obviously. I had another video to show you about this. What was it? What was it about this? I had it. I was on my mind. I don't know. I think she, Rock Plato says, I think she's wanting to unmesh her life public image from Will. She married him out of codependency because she thought he was going to save her. Maybe. How it tastes. I tuned in for an interview. I mean, I think we all would. Brittany's already talking about Justin Timberlake's dick. God bless her and him. You know, the jokes are hilarious. I understand the criticism, but all this other ish is wild. Interesting. Yeah, that's fine, I guess. Um, I feel I get you, you know. I'm so glad you said if my husband talked about me the way she does. Did you see the video where she called Will's discomfort foolishness? <laughs> I'm Googling. Foolishness. Ain't it fun living in the real world? So Will talked to the New York Times or gave a statement, and this is what he says. Uh, we'll put it up on the screen. This is from the Times itself. The memoir Will Smith said in an email kind of woke him up. She'd lived the life more on the edge than he had realized and that she is more resilient, clever, and compassionate mm. than he'd understood. And this is the quote. When you've been with someone for more than half your life, he wrote, a sort of an emotional blindness sets in and all you can do, uh, and you can all too easily lose your sensitivity to their hidden nuances and subtle beauties. Did, it sounds like an emotional blindness, he didn't see you. Is that kind of what it was, that he 
I think, yeah, that's so universal in relationships. He didn't see me and I didn't see him, right? Yeah. And so we kind of had to go. Oh, the one where Will didn't want to be. F oh, yeah, the one where um, Will doesn't want to be filmed. I saw that a few years ago. We talked about that, right? You know, Esther Perel is coming to the table. She's going to be at the red table. Would you say she has been is instrumental in you and I redefining our relationship? I would say, don't just start filming me without asking me oh my goodness. if you could film Astaire, me. Astaire, come help us again, please. We're dealing with foolishness. Don't. No, nah, no, nah, she, yeah, because she don't just. Would you say that she helped us heal mm. the hurts that we caused between one another? My social media presence is my bread and butter, okay? So you can't just use me for social media and not, you know. Oh, and by the way, Jada obviously uses Will. Again. Jada would be nobody without Will Smith to the level she is at. Don't just start rolling. I'm standing in my house. Don't just start rolling. Don't Please start. watch a stare at the red table because she's helped us a lot. Can't you tell? You know, a stare Perel is. Oh my gosh, is Will acting? I don't know. Is this. I always felt like this was authentic, but do you think Will is acting? Well a memoir let's just be real okay ain't nobody coming to see you otis you i really didn't want to get married but we only got married because gammy was crying i was married. under so much pressure you know being a young actress being yeah. young and, and i was just like pregnant and i just i was just like i didn't know what to do but i just knew i was like i never wanted to be married because the wedding was horrible it Jada, was a horrible. It, it was a mess. Jada was sick. sick she yeah, was very yeah, unpleasant. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't cooperate with anything. You were six anything. months pregnant at the wedding. No, I was no. three, three months. Three months. Three months. It wasn't a day in my life that I wanted anything other than being married and having a family. Wow. Well, Thank the good Lord. Literally five years old, I was mm -hmm. picturing what my family would be. We tied. <laughs> you have me masked. I can't stand this woman. She's honestly a real life villain. She is pure evil. You know, smiling while talking about your not so divorcee divorce is diabolical. Diabolical. And she acts like the way she shakes her head and like she acts like everything that comes out of her mouth is profound. <laughs> and she's trying to... I'm sorry. That is true. That is true. Think before she speaks. Yet, she's going on um, national television to talk about her relationship without her husband's input. Or and maybe not her husband. The man that she's in a relationship with or what. Chris Rock was a good sport about the slap incident, but now after a lot of stress, he's telling Jada Pinkett Smith to finally shut up. After Chris Rock was slapped by Will Smith at the Oscars, he was offered the chance to press charges and have Will Smith arrested, but turned it down. The Academy was going to escort Will Smith out of the Oscars. Because Will Smith was actually abusive and controlling during his marriage, and we've all been wrong about Jada this whole time. Guys, make sure to hit the plus sign. I'm gonna have more of this you don't wanna miss. Sound out in the comments, conspiracy tell me theories. what you think. But here is a new article that's spinning things and saying it's Will that's actually the bad guy and he is completely controlling, and they're giving examples on how this is and that we're being unfair to her. Take a look and we're gonna discuss. Divorce is not an option. Will Smith turns his notifications off as fans point out his controlling ways in resurfaced interview after Jada Pinkett Smith claims they split years ago. It is a mouthful of a title. Many are spinning the block on how they view Jada Pinkett Smith after the set it off actress started last week to reveal some secret aspects of her marriage to Oscar winner Will Smith. After sharing with the world that the two, while still legally married, have been separated since 2016, a resurfaced clip has emerged with the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air star seeming to have set the tone of their marriage as far back as 2007. In an interview with Entertainment Tonight, Will Smith once said, it's my responsibility to make me happy and it's her responsibility to make her happy. Wait, who's Joy Sparkles? Wait, I think I know this. Wait, who's Joy Sparkles? Is this a lady? Wait. 
Who's Joy Sparkles? Why are you guys saying her name in my... I don't. I used to think Joy Sparkles was similar trope to you, Brittany. I'm so sorry. Wait, who is she? Didn't she have a controversy? Wait, that kind of sounds... Like, I don't know who that... I mean, I think I know who that is, but I don't know who that is. Like, I know the name. Ugh. Tell me who she is. Who is she? Should I stop watching her? No, I feel weird watching her. Is she a creep? Is she weird? Hey, Jada. Yeah, um, Jade, Jade and Willow not even here is for real. Uh, uh, uh. Everyone's just memeing on her. Hey, nope. Jade. Wait, who's Joy Sparkles? Now you guys make me feel like I shouldn't be looking at her videos. We haven't called each other husband and wife yeah. in a long time. Well, I mean, he called you what is going wife on? Wife at the slap. I right keep now. my wife's, wife's name. name out of your yes. mouth. Yeah. Chris looks to me and he says, Jada, I meant you. I meant no harm. Will's still talking. He's like, oh. he's still, because now he's mad because Chris is talking to me. And I go, Chris, this is about some old sh Look yeah. what Jada made him do. No. Poor Will. That's what the narrative became. Ultra's wife who forced him to go to the table and sit there. Now look at what she's done. She has the power with an eye roll to make him go up and slap somebody on stage. We haven't called each other husband and wife. Yeah. Oh my gosh, Jada. Hey, Lab. I've seen your videos. You see my videos? Of course. Okay, well, what's your favorite pizza in New York? Fat Joe just told me about a spot called Pat's. Okay, let's go get wow, a slice. Fat Joe. Mine. You are? This is it. It's my favorite food with french fries. Pizza with french fries? That's crazy. Do you have a secret talent that no one knows about? I can tap dance. Psych. <laughs> <laughs> that actually looked pretty good. Oh, if you had a pet parrot, what would you teach it to say? I love you, Jada. I love you, Jada. How do you. Man, this girl. If Will looked back and was trying to give me whatever the hell it was I was asking for, it, it, it wouldn't, he wouldn't have been able to accomplish it anyway. Because if I'm not connected to myself, if I don't have a good relationship with me, there's nothing he can do. So I was going to be asked out anyway, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, that's part of the journey. There's no right or wrong. Everybody's always trying to find the good guy or bad guy in people's stories. There's no good guys or bad guys. We're all wounded trying to figure this shit out. You know? And so it took me a long time to realize it is not his responsibility to make you happy. He can't. It's impossible. But it took me forever hard-headed stubborn you know because that romantic idea and that's why i talk about checking the boxes it's like i did everything i was supposed to do you get to have your dream how come i'm not having mine and that's because will was doing what he wanted to do <laughs> he was making himself happy he was making himself happy and he says that to you doesn't he he says you when you separate he says he wants you to go and... He's like, go. Go. Go make yourself happy? Go make yourself happy. Hmm. And how did you receive that? Not well. <laughs> 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 you gotta do it on your own. You gotta do it on your own. Yeah, I'm gonna call bullshit. Bullshit. If you're settling in a relationship. Diary of a CEO. I actually am subscribed to him. Hum, subscribe to him. I was in a cycle of self-hatred and it was just a really dark time. I want out and I knew I had to make it look like an accident because I did not want my kids to think that I had committed suicide. Please welcome Jada Pinkett Smith. Jada, I knew you as a Hollywood actress. I never knew you were the daughter of two drug addicted parents and a teenage drug dealer yourself on the streets of Baltimore. I really thought I was gonna be the next big time female drug dealer. I was absolutely fearless. But getting two nine millimeters pointed at you. They pointed two guns at you. That's a big wake up call. But what happened? Somebody set me up and then I had to always have this tough exterior. 
now. As I'm dismantling my defenses, I'm in a really raw place. The holy slap, what happened? I knew I was gonna get blamed, but like, it was insane. You say protection is your love language. Did you see that as a act of love? The entanglement conversation. We broke up. And then what did you do, Jada? My mother, my kids, they were like, how could you do this? Do you regret putting that out? Honestly. I've got this wonderful picture that I found. Oh, I know that picture. Do you know why this is relevant? I let it go back to when we played as kids with Penny Chains. Yeah, I lost them back to back. That's the way it is. I just want to start this episode with a message of thanks. A thank you to everybody that tunes in to listen to this podcast. By doing so, you've enabled me to live out my dream, but also for many members of our team to live out their dreams too. It's one of the greatest privileges I could never have dreamed. We I love it. This channel every week. Support this channel, community. like it, I subscribe this to platform. them. Ada. Yes. I always believe that in order to understand someone, you have to understand their context. And having read through the entirety of your book, there was this line that stood out to me, which I think might be, might summarize the most important part of your earliest context, mm -hmm. which is, when I go in search of the origins of my broken heart, it is the sense of not being the priority to the two people who gave me life that creates a fracture in my feeling of worth. Yeah. Why did you write that line? Because it's true. You know, it's like our parents are like our first mirrors. And so my parents were really young when they had me. I mean, my mom was 17, right? 17, 18. She was 17 when she was pregnant. I think she was 18 by the time she had me. So youth on top of addiction. And hmm. I just realized, you know, as I was going through my life in different therapeutic settings. Do you think that Jada saw Will as like her ticket out? Because her ticket died, which was Tupac. And now Will's her ticket out. I'm sorry. I'm just like, I'm being very, like, I'm just saying. Is it possible? I'm not saying it happened. I'm not saying it's a fact. I don't know this woman. I'm saying, do you think some part of her saw Will as her way out? Because, you know, her way out had died. Settings. I was like, oh, wow. Like, the first mirror I had was kind of non-existent in a way because drugs were my parents' priority, you know, during my upbringing. And so I didn't really get the reflection of feeling like a priority to the sure. people who brought me That's really hard. into the world. Now, so she has like abandonment issues preemptively. That's really difficult. Thank goodness my grandmother came into the picture, you know, and she really, she was a, a beautiful, powerful mirror for me that, you know, even to my, you know, it's still a mirror for me to this day um, where I could see myself. I could see the beauty of myself. I could see. Like, look, I'm going to be really honest with you. You know, during COVID or even in general, how many people stayed in relationships because they literally could not afford to break up? Or how many people were already like exiting the relationships but stayed in them because they couldn't afford rent on their own? Like, do we really think this isn't happening in Hollywood with Hollywood stars? Like, do we really think people aren't gold digging in a more secretive, specific way? Like, I'm not saying that Jada is doing it. I'm saying, why are we saying it doesn't happen? If it happens with normies in middle class living or lower middle class living where people are literally staying in relationships because they can't afford to break up, which is like so crazy to me, but I kind of get it. Like I've seen people have this problem, right? Do we really think it's not happening to Jada if Jada came from such a rough background, right? Tupac had a fiance when he was in prison. She was with, uh, she was with Will. How could Tupac pop the question? She want. She wasn't even in the country. Tupac, lie, lie, lie. She, maybe. Maybe Jada's lying about Tupac too. That's the problem. Jada lies. That's all we know. So the only fact we know is that Jada lies. So now what do we do with this information? Should we take anything she says seriously? Should we write her off as a crazy person? All we know is that Jada lies. So I don't know what we're supposed to believe about her life. Is the Tupac thing real? Are 
her like you know I don't, I'm not sure what part of it that's why people have a hard time sympathizing with Jada because she like it's hard to with a chronic liar or somebody who lies a lot it's why people's reputation that's why people want to don't want to be known as a liar that's why I work so hard not to lie. And look, I do not lie to the best of my ability. Some people are like, Britney's lied about so-and-so. I've never lied. The fact that people think I lie is so funny to me. And it's so ironic because I'm like, literally, what do I have to lie about? The proof is right there. It's like on the fucking internet. But people would be like, Britney lied. And I'm like, it's right there. It's coming out of their mouth. You know what I mean? But it's not like the trolls don't care. So like ignore them. But Jada, like the proof is right here. And people are still like, well, Jada's probably not lying. Why? 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 Like, why do we, why do we see people lie and then be like, no, they're not lying. Like, do you get what I'm saying? What is being, what is, what, what is the disconnect? For me, I'm like, okay, so you lie noted and everyone's like i'm not a liar and i'm like well you do though you do lie jada lies right so what is the disconnect like i'm just so confused my gifts and my talents was through her and what she was reflecting back to me but um i think it's important that i think it's important if it's possible for children to feel that sense of um that sense of importance, that sense of priority from their parents. Wait, Brianna, girl, are we going to spill the tea together, girl? So it can be true for you, but not for Jada. I, Jada's caught in a lie, girl. Catch me in a lie. Put it on the internet. Show me. <laughs> like, this Brittany, show me where I've lied in the last, like, 12 months, because I can show you where Jada's lied in the last week. <laughs> Literally, you can take a year of my content, show me a lie. With Jada, she's been lying all the last seven days, girl. Like, I don't understand what the defense of her is. Like, I can't, now I can't tell if you're trolling. Like, she literally has been caught. That's why everyone's mad at her. Because they're like, well, if this is true, then you're a liar. But if this is true, you're a liar. If anything Jada says is true, then something she said a week ago is a lie. Thing she said last year is a lie. I don't know if you haven't seen all the interviews. I don't know if you've missed out on some of the information, but girl. I had an air of sort of loneliness as I read through the pages, this kind of lonely young girl who was searching to be recognized and loved and to someone to sort of hold her hand and guide her through those early years. And other than in your grandmother's garden with your grandmother, it, it found like that place of home was never, was never really there. Yeah, I definitely had it with my grandmother. And then once she passed, that's when I took to the streets to like figure out finding my home, finding my tribe, finding mm. my power, finding my identity, finding my purpose, finding my worth. Mm. Yeah. Okay, Good that's dad. hard. Mm -hmm. Rob. Yeah. <laughs> dad he, Rob. Um, he took you for a walk one day. And Is this too fast for you guys? I just like, they talk so slow that I was like, I need to speed this up. Explain to you why he couldn't be your father. He did. I was seven and um, he just said, he said, look, I'm, a, I'm an addict and a criminal and I can't be your father. And I was like, now, mind you, he hadn't really been in my life that much anyway. I didn't really know. He wasn't present in my, in my life enough for me to even know what it was like to have a father. But what I did appreciate in that moment was like, wow, just thank you. Thank you for like being honest. Now, I didn't realize at that time, because I was so young, how that would affect my relationships with men ongoing, you know, as an adult woman. Um, but yeah, in that moment, I was just like, thank you. Somebody is like being honest with me. I'm not crazy. Something is absolutely not right here. And he's letting me know what that is. I'm going to skip around this interview, P.S. Brianna says, but people would say that you do and you disagree. You say that you could see why some people would say that based on how you talk, but it's just like full stop and not a thing with Jada. No, I don't see how people could. No, I say people have a cognitive dissonance, which is a, a disalignment with the reality that could convince them that I'm lying if they don't want to believe a person when they say they lie. So people will come to me be like, Brittany, you lied about this thing. But like, I didn't lie about this thing. I said exactly verbatim the truth. And it was, it was agreed, like the person I was talking about admitted it themselves. But they will play a game with themselves as the audience and be like, no, my favorite person never said it like that. Brittany's twisting it. I'm not twisting it. I'm saying exactly what was said by the person I'm talking about. Jada is twisting her own words. She's talking about her own words. I can't give Jada the benefit of the doubt because she's not congruent in her statements. 
she is lying. She's like two different Jadas, three different Jadas, right? I don't understand. Like I can't be caught in a lie because I have the evidence. I could be like, well, that person said that thing and I agree that they did the thing because they said it themselves, right? Jada is saying, oh, I did this thing. Oh, I didn't do this thing. But in 2016, right? Or while she was having her talk show, she said they were married in a couple and they worked on their marriage. And then now she's saying they were actually separated and haven't been a couple in many years. So it's not, Jada is the person that Jada, Jada is the person I got to, Jada's lying to Jada. <laughs> right? Discord said Brittany might be wrong and might maybe sometimes not hit the mark fully. But then again, last time I checked, it was just because she's human, Avi. And I could be wrong, but the person I'm trying to figure out who's telling the truth is a Jada years ago Jada or this Jada. Which Jada is telling the truth? Right? And that's the problem. I already know you can't actually, I can prove I'm not lying. Right? Jada has to prove against herself that she's not lying because she's the one who told us the lie. That's the difference. Okay, let's skip around this interview because I ain't going to sit through all of this, girl, because I don't want them to be annoyed with me. YouTube has a problem with that. Okay, hold on. Ooh, authenticity and connection with Jada. Fearless. Fearlessness. Ooh, let's watch this section. Authenticity. It's kind of like it's just rough, rugged, and rambunctious. It's interesting, isn't it, in life how a certain type of demeanor or attitude or mindset can help us to survive and thrive in one context, but sometimes we need to figure out how to turn that shit off. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and that's what I had to learn to do. Because you weren't in survival anymore. I wasn't in survival anymore, you know, and I talk about this in the book, you know, how Warren Beatty, bless him, he was probably one of the first people that was just like, hey, you're in Hollywood now, hey, I get it, but why don't you allow people to see some other aspects that charm you have, that smile you have. Like, let's take that, let's take that chip off your shoulder a little bit, you know? And he was the first person really to talk to me in a way that wasn't like making me wrong, right? Mm -hmm. He didn't make me wrong for being who I was. He was just like, there's so much more to you. Let people see that, you know? And that was the first time I actually listened because he didn't make me wrong. And I bet you Warren has no idea that how, how much that conversation and the time that he spent with me really meant to me. It was really awesome because he was, he was so respectful and... He really honored. Form yes, yes, and, absolutely. Like, the reason I paused there is because I'm thinking about what you said in the book after Tony left you, who was your mother's new husband. He left abruptly, abruptly after playing the role of, of a father. And you said the line about um, the rejection was brutal. Something broke inside me. My grief was oceanic. I put, a, on a li I put it on a library shelf labeled unlovable and I tried to leave it there. That's no another word that comes up over and over again, this word unlo unlovable. And it's funny because when people mm -hmm. are, when they feel unlovable themselves, they do often put up these walls, which make them, it's almost like self-fulfilling. Right, you know? <laughs> exactly. And that's the essence of what I felt in Jada when she arrives in Hollywood is this person who's got this sort of little bit of a tough exterior up, but not because, not because she's not, you know. Yeah, not you know. because, you know, it was really just, it was, it was so many things I was trying to protect. It was defense, not offense. Exactly, yeah. yeah, it was. And, and I still to this day, you know, people like, you know, <laughs> I still to this day have to like manage that because mm -hmm. it's just, it's just in me. It's just part of me. It's something because it was such a, um, it was, you know, it, it was something that was built at the foundation. You know, it's in my DNA. Default, it's, it? Yeah, it's my default. So it's like, and I, I do it well. I can just, you won't know anything that's going on. But like you said, it's like, well, then you don't give yourself an opportunity to make the connections that you really want to have. And you're going to be misunderstood. Stood, yeah, all the time, which that is like, that has been my life too. Just misunderstood. Hmm. Another thing I learned. Okay. So Jada feels misunderstood, right? Well, it's not hard to misunderstand somebody who, again, puts on a whole TV show giving relationship advice, puts her relationship on a pedestal as something that to be aspired to, only to find out she's been separated. <laughs> Rip. Like, that's what I'm saying. What? Okay, the other timestamps are your relationship with Tupac. So we're about to go into your relationship with Tupac. Moving to LA, uh, stigma and mental health, Tupac's proposal, confronting inner demons, Jada's insight on love languages, balanced relationships, complexities of Jada's relationship with Will Smith. We're going to watch that for sure. Okay, so do you guys want to watch her talk about Tupac? And then we'll go to Will in uh, her part. From reading the book, which is going to shock you that I didn't know, but this shows how little I am tuned into media and Hollywood. Good for you. Is 
your relationship with Tupac. Oh yeah. He comes over, introduces himself. Yeah, first day of school, Baltimore School of the Arts. And um, I, as soon as I walk in, he's holding- if, if, Is she talking about high school? Are we all like, is that high school? Does she know Tupac when they were kids? Girl, aren't you like 80 years old? So I, that's a joke. She's 50, 60, 50. Like, my God, get over it. Yeah, get over Tupac already, dude. She, like, he was like a, how young was Tupac when he died? Wait. How young was Tupac? Oh, I'll just Google Tupac. Tupac. We love Tupac. God rest his soul. But like, was he not a child when he died? He was 25. When were they in love? Were they in love in college or high school? Either way, bro. They went to high school and college together. Okay, but either this is what I mean. I move on. He died. See, as a as a former Catholic myself, you need to move the fuck on. People die. But also, if you can't, don't remarry. Court. He's holding court. He's a like he's a charismatic from day one. He's holding court. And I'm like, who's Who's that peanut head dude over there? You know, and I'm coming in. I'm rocking. You know, I'm Jada. I'm walking in. I got the rat tail. I got. Ooh, Codependent, uh, codependency usually means you lie to protect others. Please, 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 or please, please. My guess would be that Jada of the last many years was a liar and prioritized will there's public image over telling the truth. Probably, Brittany. Do you feel like if Jada was a normal human being who listened to your live streams, would she be better off? Maybe, maybe. Emphasis on maybe. I don't know. Jada feels very. I don't know. Uh, hmm. Brittany, they were best friends growing up, like family. Okay. So she, so he wasn't just a boy. Like she, he, he was like, but still like, okay. I feel like there's an unhealthy attachment she has. Uh, but to be fair, most people I feel have very unhealthy attachments to people who have died. Like genuinely, it's like, I, I don't blame people for going through the trauma of, Clinging to the memory of a sibling dying or a husband dying or a child dying is a very intense experience and I've never had it. Um, and even though I was surrounded with death my whole life and I've had like people close to me die, I've also been raised to radically accept death as a part of life. Like death is 100% going to come for you and you have no idea when it's going to come. But holding on to the dead is like a cardinal sin in my bubble. And it feels like Jada holds on to it, but so does the public. Oh, you were with Tupac? You knew Tupac? Tell us everything about Tupac. Leave this man alone. Let him rest. It feels like she's still making money off a dead man. You know, now it's her story and that's great, but we don't care. We only care about Jada's story because Jada knew Tupac. I'm sorry, but it feels true to me. You know what I mean? I could be wrong. You know what I mean? It just feels like we only care about Jada because she knew Tupac. Because I would, I'm interested in Tupac too. I would, I want to know more about Tupac. I don't really want to know more about Jada. You feel me? I don't know. That's just my opinion. You know, I don't, I don't know what, Jada just feels very untrustworthy to me because I can't tell what her motivation or her, like her intentions are. And this might be a part of what she said. She puts up walls. She hides herself. She's not authentic. You know what I mean? I'm not sure the fly clothes you know and he turns and we our eyes just meet and i'm like oh and then you know I, i'm i'm going to hold my court you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> and so then he comes over you know I, my, i'm like oh okay cool yeah whatever and so he comes over and he's like hey i'm tupac and i'm like tupac the name from the gate was just like i never heard a name like that before that was such a powerful different name and i was like tupac and he had this big smile and i was like it's not a lot of people that have that kind of like charisma and courage to just walk up on me on just like I'm Tupac I'm you know what I mean you need to know me you know and from the from right from there inseparable we became the best of friends from that moment on we just connected it was as if we already knew each other it's crazy P people will find it hard to believe that at that age in that environment it wasn't a romantic thing I know people have had a really hard time you know understanding that Pac and I had a hard time understanding why it just didn't we didn't have it and I talk about it in the book you know that being on the back of porch of my house and we're like having this discussion I'm like okay Pac just kiss me and he kisses me and it's the most disgusting kiss between <laughs> us both. Wait, now I'm very confused about this story. Okay, Brianna says in the black community, she was hot shit. So people were surprised when she got with Will, but we shipped it. Is it because Will is like not as hot as Jada? Like what was the disconnect there? 
How do you know? How do we know when she tells the truth when she's told so many lies? That's the question. Oh, I mean, he pulled back just like, and I pulled back and I was like, see, dummy, you know, and from there it was just like, and then there was one more time. Wait. He kissed me and it was just like. I'm so confused. Doesn't she go on to say that he proposed to her? But then she said, I'm so confused. And I talk about that in, in jail when I go to see him in Danamora. That's a whole nother thing. And once again, it's just like, dude, doesn't work. But throughout our relationship, we definitely had this beautiful closeness. Okay, fair. That was I believe it. really intimate. Sure. But never physically intimate. A lot of emotional intimacy, a lot of um, intellectual intimacy. Mm -hmm. um, we just knew how to reach each other in ways that was very difficult. We knew how to get around each other's walls. And okay. we didn't get offended when we would fall into our defaults of okay. defense, which could be pretty fierce between the two of us. He was quite. <gasps> Will the Greatest says, I think in his book, Will said Jada actually rejected him at first. I bet she did. Well, she rejected Tupac too, apparently. Uh, a powerhouse. And so was I. We could be very challenging. What is it about Jada that men like? I don't get it. When we got right. I mean, as a queer person myself, like she's beautiful, obviously, but she doesn't seem very like I'm not attracted to her. Like I'm not drawn to her energy. She makes me feel very like. Yeah, I don't get it. Held up. So arguments, we were very passionate, but because we were one in the same in that way, we kind of understood that language like, oh, this joke is, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So we didn't get offended a lot until one particular time, which comes later in the book. Yeah, when you come from the same place, where you know, the origin stories, you don't have that misunderstood thing yeah to talk about because you understand i just understood him mm -hmm. i just understood him and he understood me he really got me and he really knew how to pull my coattails in ways that a lot of people didn't and same for me with him i just knew how to reach him in ways that and, and that had everything to, and i think because we didn't mm -hmm. have that kind of i think sometimes physical intimacy can really get in the way mm -hmm. you know um true and i think that god just made it that way in which god oh, was like god <laughs> God, mm, God, okay. Um, I get the radical acceptance of death, not sarcasm. Genuine question is grieving or mourning an attachment to the dead or the process of letting go or something else. I feel like grieving is the process of accepting. I feel like to radically accept something, you have to allow yourself to go through the motions. I don't think radically accepting something means you don't feel emotions. You know, I think radical acceptance is the end result of feeling your emotions and going through the motions and allowing yourself to be a human. I think radical acceptance is often packaged like this thing of, I am so radically accepting that I wouldn't even care if my own child died. It's like, no, you don't become a psychopath, sociopath. You just become a person who goes, okay, my child's dead and I'm going to mourn and I'm going to be distraught, but I'm not going to let this ruin myself as a consciousness. Some parents will have the death of a child ruin them there's a mom on tiktok that i see and her children died and she feels like it was kind of her ex-husband's fault and as i'm watching her she is letting the death of her children tear her apart she's lose in my opinion losing her consciousness like her stability to the the very real reality that she's lost her children and again i will never know what this feels like because I don't have children who have died. So I'm not trying to say that I have, I can have, I can't have empathy. Like I can't put myself in those shoes, right? But I also understand as somebody who's seen my aunties lose chi children, who's seen people around me lose children, maybe it's just like an immigrant perspective or a, um, an Iraqi perspective. Yes, it's devastating. But there's a part of it like we're like, that's life, dude you your kids will die and it's not right that you'll have to bury your own children but again like the adults in my life many of them have had to bury their own children so maybe it's just because of where i've come from or where my family is from i probably i mean we're we're catholic right so we assume like you know it's so sad when a child dies but at least they're getting into heaven you know so there's like a upside to it and then on top of that i think it's like radically accepting that we were all going to die and so mourning is a part of that radical acceptance, you know? Does that make sense? I'm not sure how much of my radical acceptance in relation to death has to do with the way that I was raised, you know? Like there are infamous stories in my family about children who've died. My grandmother has lost a few children, like birthed children. They were alive. 
and they're not here. My father, I have an aunt that died when she was young. I don't, I never met her. It's very sad, but everyone talks about it like, yeah, well, kids die. Like people die when you, <laughs> it sounds bad to Americans, I think, or into first world countries that are very, very privileged because your children don't die on you maybe, but like everybody knows there are parts of America where your children die on you. And so I just, you know, you have to keep going, you know? So I think it's a part of that where like there are parts of America that know what it's like to leave, like lose children young. And I come from a family that loses children young sometimes because of war. So yeah, I'm just trying to say that I don't want to write this off as like, I'm saying it happened. You know what I'm saying? Does that make sense? I'm sorry. I feel like I'm, I don't want to discount anyone's feelings, but I want to make it clear. Like it's like finding joy through suffering. You know what I mean? Like something horrible can happen, but it's also part of the story. You know what I mean? Um, like there's something about some people just have really hard lives. You know what I mean? They have really hard lives. And so death is sort of a part of that expected hardship. You know what I mean? Like I used to think that if I lost my whole inner circle, I'd go crazy. But the truth is, no, I'd be like any of my aunties or my grandma. I'd stand up strong and tall and I would carry on because like everyone's going to die. You know what I mean? I think it also depends on how many kids you have. If you have 10 children, you can't allow the death of one to ruin the whole rest of your family. Maybe. Yeah, if you're expecting your one child to be the only one you're going to have, I can see why that would tear you apart more. I could see that. I could see that. Yeah. Not that I would say that, oh, if you have 10 kids, like who cares if one dies? I don't think that's what they're thinking. But I could see how you could pour all of your self into one child versus when you have 10, you really know they're going to leave you one day, right? So maybe it's that. You know what I mean? Agreed, because if you don't feel your emotions, you're not radically accepting the existence of them. Exactly. I've watched this interview and I feel like Jada is still mourning Tupac and remembers the bond. Yeah, it does feel like that. Like, I, that's what I'm saying. Like, I could not get into a relationship with somebody who talked about their ex this way or even a friend this way. Because look, even if Jada, like, I'm going to say this very nicely. My husband and I, it would be cheating if we emotionally vented our relationship problems to anyone but us, a therapist or a priest. Like if I went to my sister or my besties or if I called like if I called one of my like besties and I was like telling them all about the intimate like intricacies of my relationship and if I had any problems in my marriage and I didn't go to my husband about it, that would be considered like a, a form of infidelity for me. Where I'm like, what are you doing? Like, why are you talking to anyone but me unless we need someone who's wiser than us? And in that case, we'd go to a therapist or a priest or somebody who's like not our friends. It sounds like if Tupac was still alive, Jada would have still wanted to like metaphorically cuddle with him and be intimate with him and share with him. And I think that that would be a huge problem in a marriage for me. Like your besties, in my opinion, can't come before your spouse in my opinion, if your spouse is like the one you're supposed to be with for real, for real. Because everyone, like for me, I have multiple soulmates, but the one that's my husband, that soulmate, like that person gets priority. My besties that are my soulmates, they don't get priority over my husband. So for me, I feel like Jada sometimes, if Tupac was still alive, maybe she wouldn't have married him or maybe she would have. But I feel like if she didn't marry him, it feels a little bit like she would have still been calling him behind Will's back. You feel me? Like, I just feel that. Like that would... You know what I mean? Nero says, unrelated question. How do you start being okay with people criticizing you, not seeing you? I feel bad about it so quickly and feel like I have to change myself. Honestly, I hate... Ugh, I struggle with people... I struggle with people who can't see me personally. And I usually work on it by venting it to my partner or my siblings. And usually the only way around it is to radically accept that like I can't get them to understand me and there's nothing I can do about it. So it is what it is, right? Because truthfully, they will not hear you if they don't want to hear you, right? Um, so I don't know. You know, I think that a big part of it is like does this like – I, I love criticism. I like thrive off getting better. And I almost want to do a call-in show. But the problem is like people never 
criticize you through your lens. They criticize you through theirs, you know? So when people are criticizing you, I think it only feels bad when it feels like they don't see you. Honestly, I think all of us would be open to criticism. And we usually, I feel like people often are when it comes from someone they trust and someone who sees them. Like when my husband or my farm brother, when they give me criticism, I am, I trust their criticism because they genuinely see me and they know where I'm coming from. When other people give me criticism, it's always like through their fear. Even my other siblings will be like, okay, I'm going to criticize you, but like, this is probably my fear speaking. And they're like, don't you feel bad when people do this? I'm like, no. And they're like, oh, that's just my thing then. Like I, they forget, like my farm brother and I are so similar. That's why he can understand me better, I think. So you asked like, how do you start being okay with people criticizing you, not seeing you? I think a big part of it is like, it's okay to feel bad about it. Just like we're going to radically accept that people will die. I have to radically accept that it does hurt my feelings when people can't see me because it's a reflection of me. I can't see them enough to tell them who I am. When we're frustrated with other people, it's, it's, a, it's something we're frustrated with ourselves. I am frustrated that I can't get people to see me. I'm not frustrated that they can't see me. I'm frustrated that I can't get them to see me. It means I'm not skilled enough or thoughtful enough or wise enough, or maybe it just means they were never meant to see me. But I would argue that the problem I have around people criticizing me is like, how can I get them to criticize me in a way that feels uh, like they actually see me, right? So if somebody came to me, because once I got that, um, I was on that panel with Eldorazi and he kept putting me in a bubble I'm not in where he kept assuming like, I don't think he meant to do it, but he was on the defensive about open relationships. And he kept kind of insinuating that I'm like anti-open relationships or something. And I was like, I did poly for like 10 years, bro. Like you're, you're looking at the wrong person. But I think people will hear me talk and criticize me through the lens of assuming, oh, Britney's this way, right? But if people criticize me well understanding my perspective, then I'm like, okay, I'll hear you out. That's why even some of my besties that I love, like I don't listen to their criticism because they only can only criticize me through the lens of their own values, right? And same, I try to be aware that I could only be criticizing people through my values and it, it just feels bad not being seen. So I think you should accept that it's going to feel bad and then accept that it will happen for the rest of your life. You know, TB with the super chat. Thank you so much. Look up old videos of Tupac in high school. Very feminine, intelligent, and soft-spoken. She fell in love with that aspect of him. Not him, the actual human. But he evolved into toxic masculinity and chose Madonna. Tupac dated Madonna? Man, I'm out of the celebrity, like, uh, bubble. Would you say they see you or they don't project their perspective onto you? Would you say they see you or they don't project their perspective onto you? Uh, I would say you, in order to give me, I would say both, right? Because they see me, they don't project their perspective onto me. They bring it alongside. But if you see me, then you wouldn't project your, your perspective onto me, right? But if you don't see me, then you're going to do that. You know what I mean? Like, does that make sense? I find it difficult being seen, but some people are open to seeing what I show them without pulling, putting me in a particular box they put me in. That makes sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. So she wasn't with Tupac? Yeah, I'm confused too. Let's keep going and then I'm going to look up the videos of Tupac. No, no, no. I need you to, to be. <laughs> I, I, I got a plan. Mm. So that's not part of the plan. Did you know, did you in your heart of hearts know that Tupac was going to go on to do what he did? I knew he was going to go to do something. Mm -hmm. I did not know he would become the Tupac we know him to be. But I knew he was going to do something great. In hindsight, when you look back at who he was, the character traits, the ingredients that were within him, why did he go on to do what he did? What was it about him? He wore his heart on his sleeve and he could join you. And so what I mean by joining you is that he's not talking at you. He's talking with you. He had a way of being able to speak about subject matters that he's going to sit with you in your broken heart and speak to you from there because he knows that broken heart. He's lived that broken heart. So, and whether it's your broken heart, whether it's your rage, but he just knew how to penetrate those emotional spaces in people. And that Oh, noted. Jada uses God. I think Jada uses God. Language the way black moms do, if you know what I mean. Okay, so she might not like, like translated to be like, this is how the universe works. Okay, noted. That's what I mean by joining you. He knew how to join you emotionally. 
in so many different verticals of emotion. <gasps> she said they were not even on talking terms when Tupac died. I'm so confused. You know, he was supremely intelligent as well. He was so authentic also and so raw that I think that was really refreshing as well. He gave you him and he was unapologetic. So he's gonna give you his intelligence. He's gonna give you his fear. He's gonna give you his pain. He's gonna give you his anger. Mm. You know, he's gonna give you his sympathy. He's gonna give you his understanding, right? But it was coming from that, that heart space, that, that, that real space within. It wasn't a gimmick. It wasn't like, oh, I'm gonna talk about this because this is what's hot, no. Okay, wait. So Brianna says, shouldn't we? Oh my God, my nose. Uh, should we not extend this thought to Jada or is this different? You mean the idea that like criticizing through her lens? Okay, so. Oh my God. So Jada's lens is that, that's, the, what, that's what's hard is like, what is Jada's lens? We could all be wrong. All of us could be wrong. But if Jada says like, She's a straight shooter. She says it how it is. She's honest and forthcoming. None of that has been true, right? Like I couldn't do what Jada did. I couldn't trick my audience into thinking I was married when I wasn't. Guys, what if I came out and I said, actually, I never got married. I'm not living in Croatia. And I made up that whole story. Would you not think I was crazy? So the problem with Jada is like, I'm trying to judge her through her values and her lens, but I don't know which one I'm judging her through. So I'm defaulting to judging her through my lens, to be fair, because I don't know what to judge her through, right? I don't know what are Jada's values? Who is Jada's, like, Pickett Smith? Like, why, why has she created such a confusing reputation for herself? You know, right, wrong, and different. He gave you his truth. And some truths people could rock with with them, and some truths you couldn't, you know what I mean? And um, but regardless, it was what was real for him at that time. He was always authentic. But it's not easy. It comes with a cost, right? It comes with a cost. Because it's almost the opposite of conformity in a way. Authenticity. Yeah, exactly. And he was a rebel in that way. And I think people really at, at, at points in his career, you know, he could speak. He would speak for the community. And then at points of his career, he would speak from that that really intimate place of woundedness. Mm. Yeah. You know, that so many of us related to. Nobody was speaking to us in that way. That could that could go from ambitions of a rider to shed so many tears to a soldier story. Come mm. on. <laughs> Come on. You know, to I mean, he had so he could speak to us from so many different angles. That is just the evidence of authenticity, isn't it? Because people are multifaceted and then it's no one is just ambition of a rider. Like, yeah. We were all all the all, shades. All the shades, right? But, but are you rolling again? Okay. Right for it. Yeah. And he said he's a little chilly, so it's good for him. Oh. So. <laughs> Somebody will enjoy it. He didn't care. Okay. Okay. My name is Tupac. Years old. Okay. Do you like being 17? And it's like 17 is such a weird age. It's such a in the middle age. You're not 18 yet, and you're older than 16. So. But I like it. It's nice. It's like a learning stage for me. Do you wish you could be 18 and you get some more rights? Well, 18 will bring lots of responsibilities that I don't want, but it'll bring respect that I feel like that's the only way I can get it. You know, I try to be as mature as I can be and demand it wherever I can get it. But 18 is like, you're an adult. You, you, like today, when I had to sign the release form, I felt so bad because I couldn't sign it myself. I had to go and get my mother's and all that. But um, 18 is it's just society's way of saying that you're Tupac, a, Tupac's a little sweet, isn't he? Yeah. Yes, girl, someone is in the drama club. I mean, he seems to be like, uh, okay, have I never seen this? I don't think I've ever seen this interview with Tupac. I've seen this one, the MTV News one, Tupac on Growing Up Poor. I've seen Tupac after he was Tupac. I've never seen this Tupac, actually. That's interesting. I love him. I want to adopt him. Like, he's so sweet. Interesting. You're ready. But 17, like, I think I'm ready now, as ready as I'm going to be in this world. But so it's OK. I guess 17 is all right. Do you think that uh, you should be given more responsibilities or that you have much more value than adults place on you because of your age? Well, well, the way that my mother brought me up is no lies, no, you know, total. 
Jada should take a note. Truth. Everything is real in society. You know, everything. If something's going on wrong in the house, I know everything. So I was, it was like I was given the responsibility before I wanted it. And so now I can't really differentiate what great responsibility is because I've had it for so long. You know, so she, she taught me how to be ready for it. And so that's good. And I think it's good because. I love him. I know that, it, and it's taught me that when you get out there, the responsibility is staggering. And I'm ready, I'm going to be a little more ready than someone who's grown up um, in Disney World, you know, with Santa mm. Claus is coming. And so. We all love him. I. Jada looked at him as a girlfriend. Yeah, is that what happened? Is Jada Okay, I was <laughs> I was listening to this Reddit story that was wild, and I'm not saying this relates, but I was watching this <laughs> Reddit I was watching this video for this Reddit story, and it was like, "Hey, I've been married to my wife, and her gay best friend moved in, and like she's known him his, his whole life." And she said they were soulmates and that I would never understand the relationship she has with him. And she keeps picking him over me. Like, she keeps ignoring our anniversaries and us going out to be with him. And she says, like, I'll never understand how close they are together. Even though he's gay, he's her soulmate. And, like, no one comes before him, even her husband. I don't know why, but I'm kind of like, I feel like this relates somehow, but probably doesn't, you know? You know, I'm, I think I'm growing up good as... In all sense of the word, I think I'm growing up and learning I love about him. responsibilities and everything. What do you think is the hardest thing about being, you know, being your age? The audio is so low. The hardest thing about being my age is proving to society that I understand what's going on. Like, we, not everybody, but frequently, teenagers are stereotyped and being loud music loving, girl chasing, car wanting, not caring about the world, mm. coke heads, you know, <laughs> drinking coke and smoking and being drug addicts. And, and I mean, in some ways we are. I mean, I chase girls and want the car and loud music. In the 60s, you, they changed a lot and those teenagers were given respect because they, they changed a lot and they did a lot. We're given no respect and we have to do a lot I mean, the word. I know. I'm sorry. His skin is so lovely. Okay, I'll show you because I know other, I know like famous Tupac. I don't really know this Tupac, like 17 year old Tupac. Like, I've never seen him. He's so sweet. His mom was in the Black Panthers, I think. That would kind of make sense, though, for him to be such an activist, you know? No secret, but the world is bad shape. So we have to do a lot. We have to do a lot of good things. So I think we deserve a little bit more respect. And why do you think it is that adults? Don't give you the respect you deserve. Fear. They're scared. They're, oh, they're scared. Fear is the root of all evil. Of watching us grow up. They're scared that when we get the power or responsibilities that we won't be able to handle it. And they're scared that, that uh, well, I don't think, in this generation, I don't think that. Uh, Do you, okay, watch, look at this. Tell me what does Tupac. Because uh, this is the Tupac. Maru Shakur mean. Okay. It means. I was named after this Inca chief from South America whose name was Tupac Amaro, but it's a lot of people named Tupac Amaro. It's like a whole tribe named Tupac Amaro. So my mom named me after this Inca chief, and I think the tribal breakdown means... Do you think he had to become more masculine presenting for society to accept him? You know what I mean? Like, I'm curious. Um... I am curious. Everybody knows this interview. This world is such a, um, and when I say this world, I mean it. I don't mean in an ideal sense. I mean in uh, every day, every little thing you do. It's such a, gimme, gimme, gimme. Everybody back off. You know, everybody's like, you taught that from school, everywhere. Big business. If you want to be successful, you want to be like Trump, gimme, gimme, gimme. Push, 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 push. Step, step, step. Crush, crush, crush. That's how it all is. And it's like, nobody ever stopped. Just, you know, I feel like. Instead of us just being like, slavery's bad, slavery's bad, bad whitey, bad whitey. I mean, all right, let's stop that. And everybody's smart enough to know that, I mean, we've been slighted and we want ours. And I don't mean by like, uh, ours, 40 acres and a mule, because we passed that.
but we need help. I mean, yeah. for us to be on our own two feet, us meaning youth or us meaning black people, whatever you want to take it for, for us to be on our own two feet, we do need help because we have been here. We have been a good friend. If you want to make it a relationship type thing, we have been there and now we deserve our payback. It's like you got a friend that you don't never look out for. You know, mm. you dressed up in jewels. Now America's got jewels and they got, they paid and everything and they lending money to everybody except us. And it's like, you know, everybody need a little help on a, on their way to being, you know, self-reliant. You know what I'm saying? That's the whole thing about the album, about the Special Olympics. Everybody need a little something and they to be independent. No independent person just grew up and was born independent. You worked and you learned teamwork and you learned cooperation and unity and struggle and then you became independent. And we have to teach that and it's still that. And why is it that they want to do that? I mean, if this is truly a melting pot in the country where we care about and Lady Liberty got a hand like this, she really <laughs> loves us, then we really need to be like that. And it needs to be the black kids. If there's a, a white person who got money, then you need to help them. He need to help black kids, Mexican kids, Korean kids, whatever. But it needs to be real. And it needs to be before we all die and then you say, oh, I made a mistake. We should have gave them some money. We really should have helped these folks. It's going to be too late. You know what I'm saying? And then that's when you got to pay your own karma. And that's when Ooh. God make you punish. When you, God punishes you. Because I feel like, you know, it's too much money here. I mean, nobody should be hitting Lotto for $36 million and we got people starving in the streets. That is not idealistic. That's just real. That is just stupid. There's no way Michael Jackson should have, or whoever Jackson, should have a million thousand, drupal billion dollars and then there's people starving. There's no way. There's no way that these people should own planes and their people don't have houses, apartments, shacks, drawers, pants. Well. If they earned it, then I, then I think that that's good and I, I think that they deserve it. But even if you earned it, you still owe. Because look at me, I'm not, I don't have that mega money, but I feel guilty walking by somebody. I, I got to give them some mail. And if I know I got $3,000 three, $3, in my pocket, mm -hmm. I feel like it's wrong to give that person a quarter or a dollar. It's wrong. Only you know what you got in your pocket. And that's wrong. No matter what they do, if they take it and drink it, they take it and drink it. But I mean, you... Man, Tupac had the heart of a community, though. He's like, he has this, like, um, he has, like, at the core of what he's saying to me, if I had to, like, view Tupac through the bubbles, it's almost like Tupac says, like, I'm just talking about what's really happening. And it's, it's, I agree with him in theory that it is kind of crazy that we're not able to, as a species, stop going to war, stop raping, stop stealing, stop like it's amazing that as a species we know but we can't do it. But guys, how can you ask people to be better when your own friends and families family members are cheating on their spouses? When your own friend and family is raping your cousin? When your own friend and family is murdering somebody? When your own friend and family is rigging the system? When your own friend and family lies to you, right? Look at look at around you look at your own family members look at the people around you right look at the people who kill you from your own neighborhoods look at the people who kill you from your own places look at the, the men who rape you in your own families like at the end of the day you would think we have evolved past this but we haven't and it's a part of being a human being all of this destruction and conflict and chaos is literally so human and to radically accept that, we have to feel the mourning. We have to do something about it. But the thing we have to do about it is accept it. And then we can be better to the people around us. Until we can remember that all of us are human, so all of us are capable, we'll justify our bad behavior as like, well, at least I'm not doing that. At least I'm not doing that. At least I'm not doing that. And then we'll feel righteous and like pointing our finger at other people. Like, at least I'm not doing that. And the thing is, is that you can't live your life, you know, completely feeling guilty over the fact that you have a better life than someone else because that's not reasonable. But it is amazing to me, right? That like, I'm thinking like, I can get along with you. Let's just be neighbors, right? But in America, it's about to get tense because we're in election season, right? We can't even get people to get along through election seasons. And it's not any different than it's been before. This idea, like it's worse now than it's ever been. It's not. Tupac is saying the same shit we're saying right now, that it, the youth is going to inherit a horrible government. It's hard out here. Black people need some sort of acknowledgement of the hard work they're putting in to build the states. Everything Tupac is saying, we're still dealing with now. And we're going to deal with it like we dealt with it before. And the future generations are going to deal with their own version. 
right? Ripley says, sometimes I think it's just best if we can uh, do is make, wait, hold on, Brittany. Sometimes I think the best we can do is make ourselves the best versions we can be and show others how to be the best versions of themselves. Example, cases lead by example, ex ex totally, right? Right. Like, you know, saying at least I'm not doing that sounds inherently exclusionary. Well, it's also um, a way to like um, ignore responsibility, right? Um, well, at least I'm not doing this. At least I'm not doing this. Which again, I get it. Listen, as a person who criticizes people and like, looks at why they're doing things. This is why, listen, I, I know I'm, I'm burning bridges left and right here, but I'm really not, to be honest with you, right? I rarely burn a bridge with people. Most people get along with me. I, I keep most of my friends. Everything's great. But look at the way I treat people, okay? I will call you out if I feel like there's some fuckery going on. And at the same time, I feel like if you're fucked up and you're a mess, you should go live out that journey until you learn to be a better person, whatever that means. But I look at Jada and I look at her and I say, in a healthy and reasonable relationship, certain things should be happening that don't seem to be happening, right? If not just consistency and transparency, right? With your spouse, like, and I'm not seeing that, right? So again, and again, I don't burn the bridges. I'm open to talking to anybody unless I've blocked you for like safety reasons because I feel like some people are unhinged here. You're not burning bridges. You're expressing your perspective. Well, yeah, of course. Like I've, again, like the biggest bridge I burned in the last like year or whatever, like I did not burn that bridge. I did not close that door. Okay. Like I'm still open. But the problem is, is like in order for that door to reopen, that person has to stop saying, well, at least I'm not doing this. At least I'm not doing this. Because that is what's happening. I can't even get people to stop breaking the consent of their marriage vows. <laughs> whatever that means, or people recontextualizing their relationships. You want me to criticize, like, how do I not criticize Jada and Will, right? I want them to just, like, exhibit healthier relationship actions in order for me to say, hey, they're doing their best. And they are doing their best, but it also is the reason why there's so much conflict in society and in marriages and life, because there's something, there's a lie here that's so clear to me, but I don't know what the lie is. Is the lie that Jada's lying to herself? Is she lying to Will? Is she lying to us? Somebody's lying. And right now, Jada's the only one talking. You know? We should be able to objectively discuss these things without burning bridges or picking sides. Well, if only, right? Because ultimately, you're going to come head to head with people that are just unreasonable. Like, there are people I have blocked on this. Like, I won't talk to the Thorps. Um, I don't associate with like them. They've like tried to paint me. First of all, Ben Thorpe the other day called me a Jew. And as much as I would love you know, to be associated with the Jews, but they, and they are my cousins, to be fair. We both, you know, I get it. Jesus is our cousin. I'm with you. I'm Iraqi and I'm an Assyrian, but thank you for staring at me. He called me a Jew princess. He said I was a Jewish typical princess. I don't even know what that means, but it sounds racist. <laughs> I don't even know what it means, but it sounds racist. Okay. But like, I looked at him and he's this guy who says he's Catholic, doesn't even follow Catholicism at all. So I'm ignoring that. And the way he abuses and manipulates his family, like, I don't want to talk to him. I don't want to talk to someone who abuses his children and his marriage and abuses the title of Catholic. Like, I don't want to talk to him, right? And some people are like, oh, then you're not, like, open to talking to people that are different from you. No, I'm not open to talking to specific levels of dysfunction. I'm not going to talk to Mr. Girl. Certain levels of dysfunction I refuse to engage with for my own mental health, right? Like, I'm not doing that, okay? But there is something to be said about being able to at least bridge the gap with people you can at least meet. And the problem is, is like people have often said to me, hey, this person isn't perfect, but at least they're getting our message across. This person isn't perfect, but at least like our side is winning. What side? I'm not on the same side you are. My side is making like my life better and my family's life better and trying to be a, a, like a good person within my values. So when you say like, oh, it's okay, look at this politician or this YouTuber or this political person. Yeah, they're shitty in this regard, but at least our side is winning. Who's, what side? Whose side? I'm not on any side. Like, I don't know whose side you on, but I'm not on any side, ma'am. So again, I think like ideally we would be able to get along and make things work and have a conversation. But when everyone thinks you're the reason that the world is ending, it's really difficult. Like again, the world isn't ending any more than it was already ending. The world is always getting better on a very large macro sense, 
okay? And in the micro way, it's so complicated and layered. But if I can't get my friends to acknowledge neurodivergency is real, if I can get my mother to acknowledge being queer is fine, if I can't get the people in my life to stop cheating on their partners, if I can't get, you want me to like, the world is a very big problem to solve. And I'm just trying to solve these little micro problems, right? I'm not on anyone's side. I want to be on whatever side allows people to be themselves and doesn't involve breaking people's consent to such a degree that people are left with a bunch of trauma, okay? Whatever that side is, I want to be on that side. But there is no side. That is no side because nobody can define that objectively, right? Yeah, it's crazy that um, even in the sphere with the amount of, he's even in the sphere with that amount of dysfunction. The, the Thorps, I know, crazy. Crazy, you know? Wrong, Brittany. The sun is slowly dying. We get we got at least another billion years before a supernova. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> rap, rap music, especially back then, was very narrowing. It was like, this is how to be yes. a rapper. So someone willing to be authentic. It's funny, I've seen this over and over again. They they are the most resonant people in the world because they represent us in a way that a lot of others aren't brave enough to represent us. And that's also what vulnerability does. Yes. That's what you do as well in this book. Well, thank because, you. Because you're willing to lay it all out. We can relate to, many people will be able to relate to many parts of you. And, you know, without books like this, we get narrow views. And those narrow views, I mean, those are crafted by other people and they're the least relatable narratives, right? right? Yeah, and we're also multidimensional. You move to LA, you work. Okay, they're skipping to a new um, timestamp. I'm going to skip it to, I'm going to skip it to Tupac's proposal. No, I went to go see him at Rikers and Rikers is actually. So she went to go see him at Rikers. Um, very famous place, very famous person. That's a really, Dana Moore might be where they put terrorists. Rikers is like, I remember going to see him there and um, he was in such bad shape, you know? And um, I, the Rikers, I like, yeah, Rikers was bad. Danamora, yeah, terrorists are there, but far more humane conditions than I would say Rikers. It feels, it feels like the emotion is still right on the surface with you when you think back to these these moments in your life. Oh, yeah. I, it feels like I just came back from seeing Pac at Rikers and I had to leave him there. It was just like yesterday. See, that's weird. Why is it like yesterday? Like, I feel like that's not healthy. You know what I'm saying? It's not healthy that it still feels like yesterday. For me, it doesn't sound healthy. Maybe it is. But I don't, I don't know how that could be healthy, right? To hold on to it like it was fresh from yesterday. I heard that this timeline was debunked. I mean, I keep hearing everything she's saying is a lie. So I don't fucking know. Like, that's the thing with Jada. I keep hearing this was all debunked, that this is wrong, the timeline's off. But I don't even know. But I'm also in a very raw place in my life right now as mm. I'm thawing out, as I'm dismantling my defenses. Mm. You know, I call it the thaw out. So I'm, I'm in a really raw place. Yeah, she she's like with, still crying. He gets out of jail and Suge Knight. I mean, I get talking about timing. Mm -hmm. I think it was like a week ago or two weeks ago that someone's been convicted for Tupac's murder. A lot of emotions. Yeah. How did you feel when you heard about the um, conviction or that somebody that arrested, an arrest had been made? Um, I was like, I was glad that an arrest had been made. This is with someone who we had known had been in the car. He, he had, had done some street interviews about it, you know? Um, and I was just hoping, I was like, well, I hope they're bringing him in because we're gonna get some other questions answered. So, you know, my hope is that we'll get more questions answered. In the book you question, but then you confirm that Pac, Tupac knew how you felt about him when he passed away because you and him hadn't been speaking. No. And I think there's a really important lesson in, in this for all of us. Yeah. Yeah, we had a, we had a huge, fight. Huge. It was one of the biggest fights we had ever had. And um... New York Times, the rap star Tupac Shakur was sentenced yesterday to 11, no, one and a half. Oh, my brain can't read that. One and a half to four and a half years in prison for sexually abusing a fan. He tearfully apologized to the victim. But even as he apologized, he said that he had committed no crime. 
Looking fully uh, recovered from gunshot wounds, suffered in a mugging this week. He was on trial. The 23-year-old performer used his pre-sentencing address to ruminate that his success as a rapper and film actor had, per had perhaps caused him to lose focus. Ah, the rap performer, famous for his lyrics that often deal with violence and sex, said that he was leaving his fate to God. I've been shot five times and he's brought me this far, Mr. Shakur said. I put my faith in God. Once again, I have no shame. What happens happens for a reason. I leave this in God's hands. Mr. Shakur and his road manager, Charles Fuller, 24, were convicted December 1st on first degree sexual abuse, but they were acquitted of weapons and sodomy charges. Gross. Oh, acquitted. Never mind. And Mr. Shakur set, must serve 18 months on the sex abuse charge. He is eligible for parole. He has been arrested six times since 1993 in incidents ranging from assault to gunfire, gunfight in which he was charged, which... Oh my God, Brittany, in which charges were eventually dropped. The two men had acknowledged in the trial that they had oral sex with women, but insisted it was consensual. Man, I can't fucking know, right? Mr. Shakir's statement, because the problem with Tupac is that he was a political, he was a political um, activist. So I can't, and the police system is so corrupt. I This is the problem with it is like, were the women lying? Were he lying? Was the police lying? I don't know. Mr. Shakur's statement followed an emotional one of followed an emotional one by the victim in the case 21-year-old Brooklyn woman who Mr. Shakur was found guilty of groping in his room at a hotel in 1993. She was 19. I was starstruck and in awe of this man, Tupac. Wait, he groped her and got time? Trump fully Trump fully admitted to grabbing women's pussies and he's not in jail. He took his advantage of his stardom to abuse me and betray my trust. The woman testified that she had consensual sex with oral sex with Mr. Shakur at the nightclub four days earlier. But in the hotel room, she said Mr. Shakur wanted to share her with his friends who forced themselves on her. The defense said that she had made the accusations out of jealousy when she saw Mr. Shakur with another woman. See, I don't know, though, because in his statement above, he said... He said that he committed no crime, but he also said that his success as a rapper and film actor had perhaps caused him to lose focus. So I don't know if that means he was engaging in like shit behavior or if that means he did something. You know what I mean? I don't know what that means. As an actor, she probably has to dive into old memories to bring in certain emotions. She relieves it regularly, so she can't really let it go. Super mind reading. Just a thought. Yeah, maybe for Jada. Maybe. It's not clear what he was apologizing for. Later, he apologized again, saying, I got involved. I got so involved in my career and I didn't see this coming that I wasn't more focused. Yeah, I have no shame. I don't feel shame. So that this was a brutal act against a woman. Hmm. I don't know. Every man I know has fucking crossed boundaries, bro. Not literally. Not literally. Every man I know. Everybody chill. But it is interesting. Like, that's interesting. I don't know. What do you do? That's what I'm saying. Like, everyone has some sort of a past to an extent. I don't know if this is true. I wasn't there. And I don't know with all the corruption in the media and everything if it was. But he was convicted. So it could be true. Right? Um... It is complicated, right? And then even if he was like Mike Tyson, I like Mike Tyson, but he's a convicted rapist, you know? And it's one of those things where I do believe in redemption, but it's very complicated, right? Even though I believe in redemption, does redemption allow you to still be trusted in all aspects, right? Yeah, it is very difficult to know. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Hmm. And it was about how he had been living, you know. And uh, I really, at that time, you know, really had to let him know my position. Because you know what? Um, Cass says boundary crossing too commonplace. It really is. Like, um, you know, uh, Charlemagne the God? Like, he has a really horrific story about his wife, right? Um, pictures were taken. A bunch of men, I believe, abused that situation. I consider it assault, right? Like, that's with his wife, I believe. Um, I remember when I first heard that story, I was, like, so put off. But I watch, like, Brilliant Idiots with Charlemagne the God and, and Schultz. 
And it's one of those things where it's very complicated again. And that's why it's like, would I trust these men around women? I don't know. Like Charlemagne has like daughters. You know what I mean? It's just every woman has had her boundaries crossed. I think that's probably true if I'm being honest. Right? I don't know a woman who doesn't got some story. You know what I mean? From like casual to extreme, right? It's interesting. I'm sorry. I'm fully convinced every single heterosexual man on this planet has crossed boundaries, especially with the lack of respect for women's existence. Every man. I, I can't say every man because like there's asexual men and there's men who don't have sex drives and there's men who don't like women and there's men who even when they're heterosexual like aren't interested in dating. There are virgins in the world who have never touched a woman. You know what I mean? So it can't be every man, right? Um, I am so overdated. She's the same bubble as Mr. Girl. Stop. That is so funny. Um, didn't Charla admit to his assault situation on a pod? Yeah. Like he did, as far as I remember. I it's been years now since I've heard the story, but that's why he basically got that's how we knew it happened, because he talked about it like it was a fun story. Like, oh, this is so cute. Look at the front, you know, and just like like it's weird. You know what I mean? Um Yeah, like yeah, like I that's the problem is like I can listen to people, learn from them, but that doesn't mean I want you around my kids. Like, okay? Like again, like my siblings and I again, we have so much like sexual assault in our extended family especially that it's just like just because you're related to me doesn't mean I'm going to trust you with my kids. You feel me? You know? My gay best friend pressured me into letting him see me and touch my boobs. Boots or boobs? Hate looking back on it. Anyone can cross boundaries. That is true. My tits, I mean. Okay, got it. Yeah, I agree with that. I think gay gay men also have cross boundaries. Gay women. I think everyone has cross cross boundaries, probably. But it is weird. Ah, uh, yeah. I don't know. It's fascinating. That I just felt like, you know, where he was sitting with everything was just. It wasn't going to end up well. Right. And we had a magnanimous, I mean, it was <laughs> just beyond the two of us just at each other. Um, and I was just like, fuck that. I'm not calling him this time. He's going to have to call me. He was way out of line. So I really dug my heels, heels in the ground in regards to like, nah, you know, I let my pride, I let my ego come in. I really took for granted that he would be living forever. Like he had already survived so much. Like it never, like I never, I, I looked at Pac as being invincible at this point, <clears throat> you know, cause he survived so much, even so much that people don't know. Could you be with a man? Would you believe a man? If you were with a man who was convicted, ah, that's the problem is like, would you be with a man who was convicted? Would you believe him if he said he didn't do it? Or what if he confided in you that he did it? That's better. If your man confided in you that he did cross boundaries with somebody and he regrets it, would you be able to stay with him or woman or non-binary person? If your partner, you were dating, let's say you were dating somebody for um, a year. And they said that, would you break up with them? Would you break up with them after five years? What if they were with you for 10? What if they married you? See, if they married you, though, that'd be a lie. See, that's why my partner and I, we don't hold anything. Like, there are stories we don't know about each other yet, about, like, childhood or, like, hey, did you ever do this as a kid? But all the important stuff, all the stuff that could break up a marriage, we told each other right away, just in case, right? Um, and it was hard being vulnerable with somebody knowing like they could reject you and then they would just have like your history in their head, but you know, what are you going to do? Um, you know, so like, what would you do? Yeah. What would you do if it was like your spouse? What would you do if you were with them for a long time? Like, what would you do? If they really honestly regretted it, I probably would stay with them. I think I'd have a harder time with the fact that they didn't tell me ahead of time, but also if they told me ahead of time, probably be the reason I didn't continue dating them. Ooh, depends on how bad the boundary crossing was. Good point. I want kids, bro. I'm messing with that. Yep, fair. Fair. You know, if they didn't tell me uh, until a year in, I'd probably breaking up. Fair. 
This happened to me. My ex disclosed some stuff he did and my feelings for him forever changed. I couldn't stay with him. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, that's fair, right? That's what I think about is like, that's why, again, when we were doing our courting, we told each other everything that was a red flag. That that means if he and I found out anything about each other that we withheld, it would be a huge deal because we'd be like, whoa, we already gave you opportunities to tell us all the red flags. So again, it's okay that I don't know everything you did as a child or every place you've seen. Like you can tell me those stories later, but all the like, because that's never going to be a deal breaker, but like a deal breaker, you know what I mean? interesting all about you know um but just like i say in the book i'm like man don't do it don't do it don't 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 hold on to like that prideful part of yourself you know with someone you really care about like no i mean you know he don't have to call me you know it's like nope was that the last time you spoke to him that was the last time i spoke to him that was the last time i spoke to him that was the last time i spoke to him and you know what's crazy it meant absolutely nothing. It meant absolutely nothing. And so that's the test I always what, have. What meant, like, okay, you're in this. What meant absolutely nothing? This beef with somebody. Will this beef matter on your deathbed? And then right away, I'm like, nope, let me give him a call. You know what I'm saying? That's my, that's my test. Almost a year later, he gets shot in Las Vegas. You get a phone call while you're filming on set that he's from, I believe from his mother, mm -hmm. um, Afini Shakura, and saying that he's in hospital in a coma. And a few days after that, you find out that he's passed away. Yeah, I was on my way. When did he propose? You know, Faye was like, no rush. He's going to be fine. Um, he had his fiance there with him and his family. Um, she was like, Brittany, don't you think, don't you feel like you don't really give room for the truth then? Because you said you would break up with him uh, for that on the first date. That doesn't encourage truth sharing. I think... If you're willing to deceive someone so they marry you, you're a shit person and you should die. In a video game. But no, genuinely, like, if you lie to someone in order for them to be with you, you're a bad, that's a bad thing to do. You might not be a fully bad person because I think a lot of people do that. But it is better to tell your truth and have someone reject you than to lie about it and to convince them to be with you. I create a safe space for you to tell me the truth. I am not owed dating you, bro. I am not responsible, right? Like to give you marriage because you told me the fucking truth. Right? Because what is the other side of that? I don't tell you, right? You don't tell me the truth. So what you lie to me? Who's the piece of shit in this situation? I'm giving you a space to tell your truth and I'm giving, you better give me a space to tell mine. My truth is I can't fuck around with your truth and you better be ready for that. You don't want people to judge you for your actions. Make better fucking choices. Spend your life repenting, telling people not to make the same decisions you made. It is so shitty to do something so shitty and then be like, I can't believe people don't want to date me when I'm such a shitty person. I will give you space to tell the truth. Give me space to live mine. Because consent matters. I am not obligated to marry anybody. Okay? But if you date me, you better be telling me the truth. So, you know, come after your trip in New York. So I was on my way to him. And my girlfriend Fawn came to the door. and she, I, I knew as soon as I saw her face that he was gone. Oh, I know that picture. <laughs> yep, that was Thanksgiving. He came to LA to spend Thanksgiving with me. <laughs> and we were at one of my friend's house. You look like brother and sister. Yeah, we look like brother <laughs> and sister because that's what we were. Yeah. Yeah, brother he, and sister. He came to Thanksgiving to spend Thanksgiving Where does with this me. proposal come in? We talked about mental health earlier. Do you, do you know how to grieve someone, the loss of someone like, like that in your life? No, I'm still, I'm still um, working out my relationship with grief. Okay. Actually. So she admits it. That's good. So she knows that she's still working it out. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't really, I, I, yeah, I'm still working that out. Because this chapter of your life was loss. Mm -hmm. Unmourned loss. Chapter 12 mm -hmm. of your book. I've got this other picture that I found that I thought was um, relevant. Oh, now you, do you know why this is relevant? I do. Maxine and, and Tupac are both in, in that the picture. same picture. Okay. 
have a tissue. Thanks. You get nice hugs. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a. Okay, girl, money, resources, like this is amazing to me because like this is amazing to me, right? If I was still grieving like this at this age, after this many years, like I would think so there was something wrong with me in a really significant way. And I can't tell if I can judge Jada on who I am. So I'm trying to like, who is she, right? Like I'm trying to really understand her, but I couldn't imagine having that much privilege and that much resources and not spending every dollar I have on learning how to deal with grief. Is this like cultural? Like, how is Jada this old and this rich and hasn't figured out grief? And she says she's still working on it. But then that makes me wonder, like, how has her life gone that she's still working on it? Which is fair. I know 50-year-olds, 60-year-olds, 70-year-olds, 80-year-olds, 90-year-olds who are still dealing with grief. I know this. I'm not trying to shame her. I'm trying to say something has gone wrong. Right? Like something I feel has gone wrong if given resources, you don't figure stuff out, right? Which is why when I say like, I, I can't tell how lacking, like is she introspective? She's not, like this is, something's wrong. Like something has gone wrong, right? I have a feeling she's acting for sympathy or something. Is she? Like, and again, just Jada, not other people. A lot of people don't have the resources to go to therapy. A lot of people don't have religion. A lot of people do not have the money to deal with grief. But Jada has the money to deal with grief. So then what is she still working on, right? And it might be that she's just working on asking for help. You know what I mean? And so that's, the, that's interesting for me to watch, right? It's interesting. It's very interesting. Can you process grief in a different ways is different stages in your life. Maybe she's done some healing, but other things are coming up now or she's acting, who knows? Yeah, definitely, right? Like, she, obviously, everyone has a different journey, right? I'm not saying she has to be, but like, I don't know how to judge this very well. So I feel like I can't understand it. Like, I can understand so many people. I've dealt, I've helped so many people myself, just like as a good neighbor who are old and can't deal with grief, but they were so poor, they didn't even have the resources to deal with it. So I could understand their circumstances. Like, I understand poor people. I don't understand rich people. Like, obviously, Jada is rich. She's been rich for a very long time. Like, I don't understand people with access, how they, like, I don't understand their version of dealing with grief. So to be fair, like, I don't see this bubble very well. I feel like poor people with trauma, my favorite. I get you. I'm here for you. Like, specifically like poor um like it depends like I don't know I, I don't know like I'm like lower middle class poor like don't know if the lights are going to be turned on but also not too worried about it like I can I understand that because like what was your access to grief right and then I don't know like is it the rich bubble am I having a hard time what am I having a hard time with why can't I see Jada why can't I see her I just feel like with poor people, they don't have the resources, so they go to their family and friends and their aunties and uncles. And they go to their priests and they go to their shamans and they go to their neighbors. Like, we don't have money to pay for therapists. Like, we don't, we learn to grieve through culture. We learn to grieve through family. But Jada's saying she didn't have a family. She didn't have a tribe. So she was looking for her tribe, right? You know what I mean? Like, being rich doesn't mean you figure out shit quickly. No. But it means you would have access to things you usually poor people are missing to get over grief. Like when you meet a person in poverty or who's poor or lower middle class who hasn't had the money to pay for therapy, you're like, yeah, I get why you're still dealing with grief. But then 
rich people are maybe are too famous and too busy. Oh, discourse says, I think there's just too many distractions in that world that inhibit introspection unless they really need it. Yeah. Maybe she's so privileged. She's so distracted. She can't allow herself to grieve. Maybe poor people or people in poverty or like people in middle class actually have the time to grieve or they have aunties and uncles and grandmas. Like to be fair, I had a family. I was I was held by aunties and uncles when I had someone die in my life. Like they would hold me. I have a distinct memory of one of my friends dying when I was like 15. And my my auntie with her big body grabbing me and letting me weep and soak her shirt full of everything, just snot and boogers. And like she had taught me to grieve. And when I think about this boy that I knew in high school that was really meaningful to me, I don't cry anymore. I mean, I'm sure I could if I evoked those emotions, but I'm really crying for myself then. And I'm not crying for him, you know, before I think I would cry for him and then I would cry for me and then I would cry for him again, cry for his mother and his father who lost their child. You know, he was a really good, like a really good person. And he was just dead at 15, right? 16. He was a year older than me, 16. And I remember my auntie grabbing me and I was on my mom's bed and she was visiting our family and I got the phone call that he died and she just like held me. You know, I guess for me, grieving is cultural. Like when we have our funerals, we all dress in black and we come together and we sing hymns and we are grieving together. I can see how Jada maybe didn't have access to that. You know, it doesn't sound like she had that, right? That must have been really hard. So I can see from that perspective that she doesn't have it, right? Like she might not have, you know what I mean? Um, a space to no grief. What do you guys think about that? Is that probably more uh, giving? You know what I mean? I think we would like to think we know, but until we go through the same exact same sequence of events in one's life to get through, what who can say? I think that's wrong. I think that's wrong. Humans are universal. Humans are humans everywhere. Grief is grief is grief is grief is grief. I truly believe we are having universal experiences, but different universal experiences. Jada is not having a unique experience. She's having a unique experience to Jada, but she is not having a unique experience. She is having a very human and normal and common experience of grief, right? We do not have to live Jada's life to know Jada. Many people live like Jada. If human beings needed to live exactly like one another to understand each other, we would never have survived as a species. We can generalize because generally speaking, we are experiencing the same thing. The nuance of that experience with the unique consciousness that you are is different. But grief is grief is grief is grief is grief. And philosophy around grief, listening to mystics about grief, listening to gurus about grief, listening to philosophers when it comes to grief is universally understood. Grieving itself is selfish. Grieving itself is a selfish act. You are grieving for your loss. You are not usually grieving for them. You are usually grieving for yourself, which is fine. But eventually, right? How much can you grieve, grieve for yourself? How much are you going to make it about you? When a tragedy happens around the world and we grieve for strangers, we're not grieving for them. We're, we're grieving at the idea that we could be them. That's not the same thing. We don't know these people, right? It's like Toto says in J, JJK, like, be careful when you try to make other people's tragedy like your story, right? So I think there's something about the universe, like how grief is universal, but nuanced and unique at the same time. Those tiny contradictions of life. You know what I mean? You know? Maybe her bubble doesn't take mental health seriously, so she never tried to figure it out. Yeah, but what about church, God, culture, family, customs? It sounds like she didn't have any of that, which is really sad. You know what I mean? There are probably aspects of loss she hasn't addressed yet or yet has uh, or yet to feel ready to uh, appropriately deal with them. That's fair. You know, what about Prince Harry? Is it different? What do you mean? Oh, like his mom. If she's self-aware 
then she's at the very least lacking in accountability. Mm. Crying is not a sign of immature grief. She is doing it in public. She's doing it publicly, though. Something hasn't been wrong. The dimensions of grief for that particular loss can be huge for her. For sure. Yeah. Hmm. We don't have as much sympathy for wealthy people. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I try to because I think everyone suffers, even the rich. I think they just suffer differently, right? I think she just learned to monetize her life and plays into it because she's an actress. That's another part of it, right? Wait, does Brittany think it's weird to cry when looking at pics of you and your friends when they've passed? Is that supposed to mean she hasn't healed necessarily? Genuinely asking? No. No, of course not. Like, cry all you want. I cry all the time. I cry when I see a flower. I cry when my cat is very cute. I'll just start crying because she's so lovely. You know? Um, I think it is fine uh, to cry when you see photos and memories. I think why you're crying is the thing. She's saying she still hasn't gotten over it. She's still learning to deal with grief. That's different. Um, but no, I don't, I personally don't often cry when I look at photos of people who have passed because I heavily believe that this was their journey and death was going to come for all of us and it's time, like that was their time. So no, when I look at photos of people in my life who have died, I don't normally cry. That is not an experience that I have because that was their story, right? I cried at the moment. I cried at the time, but I, I don't cry now. So I'm not saying that's good or bad. I'm saying why you're crying should matter. So you're usually crying for yourself, which is fine. And Jada is admitting she's still working on it. So that's fine. You know what I mean? Uh, but when you've, you're done working on it and you've healed, there should be an indicator of being able to talk about something without it destroying your life, right? So I think there's something there that kind of maybe has, you know, maybe there's that, you know, time to make Brittany a millionaire so she can relate to rich people. Please like the stream, subscribe and become a member. We need more members to have more emojis. Okay. We, uh, you know, we appreciate you guys being here. And by we, I mean me because <laughs> it's only me. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Please make me a millionaire so I can relate to rich people. For black people, we don't really process our emotions normally. I find that a lot of few... I find that a lot of the few rich and wealthy black folks still have the mindset of somehow of someone who's poor. It keeps them going. Interesting. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. You probably just can't you probably can't see her because it's hard to tell what's genuine. Thanks to this whole facade, it's understandable. Yeah, I think I am struggling to see her, you know. Ah, maybe she feels guilty to move on, especially because she lost him at a young age. Well, did she, you know, yeah, maybe she feels really bad over all of those things because like she didn't talk to him and she cut him out and blah, blah, blah. My family taught me to my t taught me to shove my grief down and let it fester. Jesus Christ. Are you waspy white? Damn. Damn. You can't see her. People can't see her because she knows only what she wants you to see. Common for people who have complex and intense trauma. Intense trauma. Mm. Yeah, interesting. She's having a humane reaction to a specific loss. We can't ever empathize. Well, I mean, again, you guys, she's not a fucking anomaly. Sometimes therapy and religion or culture can't correct the grief of losing a child. I know. I think it's a lack of introspection. I do. I really do. I'm sorry. Like, I really got to be really stern here with people. You cannot get stuck in the loop that you will never recover from grief. It is just not a part of us as a species. Biologically speaking, as a species, we literally handle grief the best, right? All animals feel grief. Even animals, not related to us as animals, feel grief. And yes, some human beings lose themselves to grief, but you don't have to, right? It could be your story, maybe from a, a, a reason outside of your, like maybe like you have a, a, a literal challenge but like we can empathize grief is like something humans we go to war we had a civil war in this country we have civil wars all over the world if we couldn't survive grief we would have been dead our species never would have made it we survive grief a lot of cultures come together and honor the dead for this reason some people shove it down and pretend it never happened right 
But we can empathize and we can sympathize. Jada is not going through something unique. She is grieving, which is universal. So again, like, you know what I mean? You're lucky you had a family who was emotionally available to show you how to grieve. That is true. That is true. I was lucky that I had that. And if I had kids, I would give that to them. You know? Her reaction to it and the elements involved are different, but the emotion is still grief. Yeah. Grief is not just grief because it's very individualistic. That is still true, but grief is grief. Death is death. How you relate to it is dependent on your introspection, meditation, and relationship with the consciousness. You know? Grief is an ancient uh, psychological reaction. We all experience it. No, physiological reaction. We all experience it in our own way through our own lenses, but it it's a universal phenomenon that is a biological response. It's been years, but I still cry about my mom. I mean, I cry about my parents now if I think about them dying, but it's also to prepare me for their death. I'm not saying you shouldn't cry, but why are you crying is the answer. Are you crying because you still haven't accepted it? Are you crying because you just miss them? Are you crying? Why are you crying? It's okay to cry because you miss somebody, right? And at the same time, do you have the right to miss somebody? If you're still crying over an ex-boyfriend you had when you were 15 and you're 20 years into a marriage, do you guys think that's a red flag or no? Do you think it is a red flag to cry over an ex-boyfriend you had when you were 15 if you're in a marriage 20 years later? Right. And I'm not talking about Jada. I'm talking about in general. Right. Because I would say that's a red flag. Something's wrong. Something is wrong. Right. If you cry because you miss your parents, that makes sense to me. You're a child and I will always miss my parents and I will cry over missing them. But I'm also going to radically accept that they've died at some point. Right. Crying because you miss someone isn't wrong unless it is. You know what I'm saying? And I think people are mistaking the why here why are you crying and is it even appropriate that you're so grieving right I do agree from a therapy perspective if the grief negatively impacts her life for so many years it needs addressing when I lost my parents most of my family really dropped the ball I don't really know why but my family just didn't want me around anymore and I think I make them uncomfortable that's so sad girl yeah. Sometimes I wonder if Jada's stereotype is in villainized because she doesn't come across as soft, cute, or feminine like Ariana, who has done similar things. Ariana is also a villain, though. Ariana is like the worst kind of villain. You know? It's like saying, hey, you haven't gone over this thing because you have money and resources. Why aren't you over X? That's just not how grief works. No, I agree that's not how grief works. I'm not saying that, right? Like, I agree that's not how grief works. But in some ways, it's interesting to me that you have all the money in the world to take all the time you need to learn about grief, but you're not doing it, right? That's interesting to me, you know? I don't know if I'll ever stop crying over my parents dying. I cry less and less, but something will always inevitably hit my grief button and I'll be sad. That's fair. That's fair. Oh my God. Cass, I cry because my cat is beautiful, but not for dead people. Brittany Simon, stop it. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying and you know it. That's not what I'm saying. Stop. It's always about the why Kay says Jada had access to the resources that could help her find a way, but she probably lacking the knowledge to know that she needed to ask why in the first place. True. She probably just didn't have the spoons or the, like the tools or the like she probably just didn't know. You know what I mean? People repressing emotion is very real and common in my bubble. Fair. You know? Yeah. Fair. Yeah. It's not that you won't, but it takes different amounts of time for everyone. That is true. That is true. You know? Grief when paired with trauma can cause the inability to move on, though uh, through it for some people. Not saying this is Jada's experience, but it could be. Very much could be, right? 
Discord says, I barely cried over my dad's passing. I love him still, but I just had mourned him already. So now I just get waves of nostalgia and I miss them. Um, I get a, be a, a wee bit misty eyed and go about my life. Yeah, I get that too. Especially if you have a family member who's died from a chronic illness and you know it's coming. You know what I mean? You're able to grieve in a very specific way, you know? Yeah. I wonder, Brittany, how long do you think you you'll will grieve if your partner died? Um, probably depends how he dies. If he's dying slowly from cancer, I'll probably be done grieving by the time he dies, if I'm being honest with you. Um, as somebody who again has helped people like at the end of their life, when it's a long road to death, you usually do all the grieving during the process. And by the time they die, it can take you weeks to months to minutes to to move past the grieving. Um, if my partner died, I don't know, him and I talk about that often, like, you know, how long are we going to wait? How long until we move on with our lives? And I think, um, all in due time, I think it depends on how we die. If it's sudden and out of the blue, probably take a little bit longer. If it's expected, it would take shorter, I think, you know, you know, I love these comments and I love the discourse and I really appreciate your comments because I know the subject is really heavy. So I really, really, really appreciate you guys like talking it out with me for sure. You know? Ah, oh, we're podunk wasps. Oh, a lot of white bubbles are like that. Like German and Norse American culture is very common to keep your emotions to yourself because it's seen as rude to put it on others. Yeah, yep, I've heard that. Interesting. There's an episode of Will and Grace about that. It's so funny. Yeah, it's interesting. You can only logic yourself out of grief, in my opinion, or else you'll always be sad. I feel like you you have to logic, but you also have to accept. You have to grieve. You have to be sad so you can stop being sad, right? Or you're allowed to be sad sometimes. Or again, it's very complicated. I'm not saying, oh, you're a horrible person if you're sad someone died. I'm saying, why are you sad, right? Because like, why matters? Why are you sad? And it's like, again, why do you think you should have a girlfriend? Why do you want a wife? Why do you want a husband? Why do you want millions of dollars? The why matters. You know what I mean? The why matters. I cry sometimes because I miss my mom. I'll always miss her. See, I understand missing people. Missing people, I feel, is a very healthy reason to cry. I miss somebody. Of course I'd cry. I miss my sister and she's alive. <laughs> and sometimes we have like, oh, I miss you. I haven't talked to you in so long, you know? So again, it's not crying that's bad. It's not missing people that's bad, right? I'm not questioning people's ability to grieve or be sad. I just want to know why, you know? And are you going to grieve so much that you're going to lose yourself? I know people who have lost themselves to grief that they have neglected their own children, neglected their own life, neglected their spouse. They've become a shell of a person because they've allowed themselves to think that grief was allowed to be the main character in their life. And the idea is like grief should be a character in your life and then you should kiss it on the forehead and send it on its way. Grief is a part of suffering, which is a part of introspection, which is a part of growing. Grief cannot be a main character in your life. And again, every culture handles this differently. But I grew up in a culture that was surrounded by death, surrounded by, you know, just the worst of the worst. And you still manage to sing, you still manage to love, you still manage to dance, you still manage because grief cannot be the main character when there's so much joy to be had. But grief is absolutely a common player in our lives. It has to be because we have feelings. We love people. We love our dogs. We love animals. We are allowed to grieve for things that we love. You know, but how much can you say you love them or yourself if you lose yourself to that grief? How could you say I love you and I love me so much so that I'm going to ruin my life for grief? No, right? Grieving is deep and profound, but it cannot be the main character in your life. It makes no sense. What are you holding on to? What, why won't you let the grief go? You know, missing someone is not grief. It's missing someone. You miss people that are alive. Grief is different. Grief is specific. 
Do your callers often mention grief to you? Your mindset would have helped me a lot. Sometimes it depends. Like right now, everything happening in the world, um, there's been conversations about grief a little bit. Um, sometimes it depends. I've had a few callers that have had issues with death or talk. You know what I mean? Cancer isn't slow. What do you mean by that, Ingrid? What do you mean by that cancer isn't slow? I mean, not for everybody, obviously, but like some people deal with their cancer for years before they die. So you have years to mourn somebody. What do you mean isn't slow? You know, <clears throat> it can be fast, though. It can be months or weeks, you know. Cancer takes people away so quickly. I mean, but not universally, right? Like some people have cancer for years and then it comes back. Like, you know what I mean? Um, it's all, Kay says, it's all about maintaining a healthy relationship with the emotion. You can experience it and feel whatever it has to tell you, but you don't let it control your life. Exactly. Yeah. Nero says, I think it's just weird with Jada because it happened 20 years ago that Tupac died and she started a new life with Will and everything. So it kind of shitty for Will, how she's still grieving. Yeah, it's interesting. Like I'm open to the fact that she hasn't learned how to grieve, which she's admitting out loud. So let's, let's watch this woman grieve. Let's allow her space to grieve, right? Sorry. <sighs> yeah, I am. Um... I lost Maxine and Pac back to back. So I like to, you know, this picture to be flanked by them. <laughs> yeah, I lost them back to back. Maxine was a good friend of yours. Um, Pac was your brother. Yeah, and she was like my sister, you know. She, um, I met Maxine on Jason's Lyric and uh, we became like super tight. And she lived in Canada and so she wanted to come to Hollywood and make a career for herself. So I told her that she could come live with me. So she came to, to live with me. Um, she, we, we feel as though she. I'm so sorry. Um, hey, Bay says, I also think that grief and CPTSD get mixed up and confuses the two are often interlinked. And I think that's to so true. So remember, and I, maybe this is my bad. When I'm talking about grief, I'm talking about a very specific thing. And I do think you're actually correct on this, Hebe, where I do think sometimes when I talk, I forget that my audience and the people listening to me might not know that I'm obsessed with categorization and words matter to me when we're talking about specific things in certain conversations. I'm open to switching up language and using different definitions. But when I'm saying grief, I'm not talking about the possibility of um, depression or anxiety, or those are symptoms of grief that are different. I'm talking about the relationship with grief. I'm not talking about CPTSD, which you're right, I think does get often mistaken for other things. So again, I want to make it really clear that, um, that when I'm talking about grief, I'm talking about the specific thing that is grief and not the related things that could coincide or overlap with it, which, you know what I mean? So I hope that makes sense, right? Um, Maiden says, I think some people view losing themselves in grief as a way to express how much someone meant to them. Yes. Which is why I say it's selfish and performative for the self. It's to let you know, I feel things. I know I feel like she, Jada just said, I lost both of them. I, I, I lost both of them. They died. They don't even get to have life anymore. And I kind of feel like, Yes, it is about us. And so we need to have that relationship with us, which Jada is expressing she is now having. So to be fair to Jada, she's now experiencing that really. I lost. I. It's about me. I lost somebody. Right? Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you for the clarification, Ingrid, that in your experience. Yeah. The cancer, one cancer took my grandma pretty quickly too. I think it was like a few months or a month. I have to recall. Yeah. If cancer doesn't get caught quickly enough, it's a matter of months to days. Yeah. For sure. If it's not caught early enough, if they don't go through remission, um, like my friend, I helped through his cancer diagnosis. He had cancer for like a year plus and it was a long, slow death. Even the last like two weeks we were together, hell, the last night he lived, it was like the longest night of my life. You know what I mean? So I feel you on that. I feel you. He um, had a misdiagnosis that she had some kind of thyroid disorder that really... um disrupted her psyche mm -hmm. and um, she ended up jumping off her mother's balcony and committed, she committed suicide. Um, so that was really tough. 
it seems it seems unimaginable that that chapter and season of your life could be filled with so much loss and so much complicated loss mm -hmm. you know because in all these situations as you write about in the book there are reflections where you you say in the book if i you know you're left with this feeling if i'd done this i could maybe i should have done it like this or I wish I'd treat that situation differently. In hindsight, as we know, is a wonderful thing, isn't it? Right. You know, and I've sat yeah. here with a lot of people that have lost a lot of people by by suicide, and they all have the same reflections. Yeah. They all have that last phone call with the person where they had to put up a boundary, and yeah. You know, I've sat here even in LA in that chair with. I remember Boz, um, her her partner at the time, calling and saying, "Listen, if you don't come and do this, I'll jump off this bridge," and then he doesn't. Yeah. It's like that existential disappointment <laughs> of just life being what it is. It's like grieving that grieving. It was like she in a she went from this like happy person to like having this condition that just right and so I just sometimes I just go this is when I just have to like reconcile with God. Mm. It's like, wow. See, I okay. So once again, I'm not discrediting anyone's lived experience. Your friend had a disease. It impacted her mental health. She committed suicide. It is sad. And you should grieve, but you should also be comforted that it makes complete sense. Like when someone dies in a car accident, that happens. It's within reason to assume somebody you know might die in a car accident. Or I have three brothers who went to the military. We were ready for one of them to get the call that maybe they wouldn't have survived the war, right? Or I have family in Iraq and we get calls saying like so-and-so passed away, like ISIS and this and this, right? There's something about mourning in the moment, in the moment. Why are we mourning 20 years after? How is this respectful to your friend's death or to the reasonable statistic of mental health people committing suicide at a high rate? Like, why aren't we using this to say, this is what happens when we disregard like people's mental health and instead it's still about Jada? Why is Jada's friend's death still about her? when it had nothing to do with her. Her friend had a disease that led to her mental instability and she accidentally killed herself. I, she sounds like she didn't even have the intention to do it, which I think suicide is, in my opinion, not intentional. I think when you make an intention to die like you're ready to die, it's m much more reasonable. I think suicide is often a cry for help. So again, why do you think people hold on to this idea, you know? You know? Okay, now Bryson and Tiger at the same time basically said that what helped me move on was knowing that my loved one would want me to be health healthy and joyful. Tiger says, my parents would never want me to be stuck in grief like this. That's what keeps me moving forward in the beginning, or that's what kept me moving forward in the beginning. They want me to live. Exactly. Now, to be fair, in my bubble, everyone in our life gives each other permission to move on. My siblings, my parents, we openly talk about, hey, if I die, you need to move the fuck on, right? Like, don't spend your life grieving over me. Like, what a waste of a life. You cannot do that. It's so disrespectful. Now, that's our bubble. That's not yours, and I don't mean to project onto you. I'm giving you another option, though. I'm saying in another life, you can love someone enough to let them go. In another life, be happy you had them for a moment. You know what I mean? Kay says, so true, the denial is super unhealthy. I think that's the problem I'm having, right? Is that if you really think, like, I'm so special, no one's ever going to die in my life, that's another part of it. Like, look, as a... as you know, my parents grew up in a world where any of their kids could have died at any moment because we were pretty adventurous as kids, right? And one time my sister was drowning in the pool. It was like two seconds, like her floaty flipped and she went under and we were all there as kids and we were like, oh my gosh, she's gone under. My dad jumps in the pool, flips her back over, you know, grabs her and she's fine. But in that moment, we were like, we almost became a statistic. We almost became the family that lost a kid to drowning. And I'm telling you this right now because of culture or belief or spirituality or prayer or something, it would not have destroyed our family. I just refuse to believe it could destroy our family because again, it's going to happen to someone's family. Whether it's my family or yours, someone's going to get their kid kidnapped. Someone's going to lose their kid in a car accident. Someone's going to get their kid something. So grieve in the moment, mourn in the moment but do not let it destroy your life. Remember for every day that your child is healthy, someone else's, else's child just died of cancer. For every day your child didn't choke today on their food, someone's kid choked today and died. For every day you get to be with somebody you love, somebody else's loved one died. 
Gratitude is so the key to grief. I am so grateful for every moment I have. And I will accept the mourning process and the grief process when someone dies. And I will let them go. Because I refuse to be ungrateful for the moment that I had with them. Right? Wow, God, like you really be doing some stuff. Like, you know what I mean? And it's like, and sometimes I get in grief around what life is. And then I have to make peace with it. It feels, if you think about your story, it feels confusing that God could seemingly hand someone so much, you know, wonderful <laughs> career, wonderful family, all of those things, but at the same time, and maybe, maybe there's a relationship, maybe there's a relationship between the two because had you not had the, had you not come from where you came from, maybe you wouldn't have had all the wonderful things that you have, but also had you not come from where you came from, maybe you wouldn't have experienced all the loss that you've experienced. Mm -hmm. So maybe there's a relationship between the two because I've not experienced that loss, but I don't come from where you come from. So my, I didn't lose friends growing up. Right. I didn't lose friends in, in, a, in my twenties either. Right. Wow. Um, Having all the different experiences that I've had, as painful as some- That's interesting. See, he never lost a friend growing up. That is so interesting. I don't have that lived experience, right? Like in my life growing up, it was pretty common that people died. And like I said, when you know hundreds of hundreds of people, people are always dying. You know what I mean? I just, two people I knew just died this week or last month. Like it's just, it's when you know enough people, someone's always dying, you know? Some of them are. It gives me the opportunity to join people in a certain manner, mm -hmm. you know? And in really powerful places, you know? Like I have a beautiful friendship with, um, Lauren London, and she is hmm. the widow of Nipsey Hussle. Oh, Nipsey was so sad. Ugh. And because of the loss that I went through with Pac, I could reach out to her and I could go, hey, anytime you need anything, anytime you need to talk, I'm here. And Lauren's quite like me, defenses, you know what I mean? But I just kept walking closer and closer. And I just say all that to say that we've been able to meet each other in a certain place because of the type of losses we've had mm -hmm. that can really create beautiful connection. You feel me? Mm -hmm. I feel you. Yeah. So there are blessings in pain. Mm. You just gotta, you just gotta know that to be true and wait for that door to open, you know? And that's just one, one tiny example of like, the blessings that I've found in a lot of the loss that I've had in my life in general, you know. There's almost a, an irony or a paradox in the fact that your pain caused a disconnection, but then the pain caused connection. Deep. Because heartbreak, there's this beautiful seed in heartbreak, which is like, it breaks you open. Mm. It breaks you open. And you got two places that you can go. You can go into the deep wells of darkness, or you can go into the deep wells of light. And I've been to both. <laughs> <laughs> and I've learned, I ain't trying to be over here no more. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so I always okay. use heartbreak, discontent, pain to help me search for bright light mm. and beautiful blessings within them. I always use... Oh, <laughs> you know what I mean? And so I always use heartbreak, discontent, pain to help me search for bright light. Is she saying that when I experience the darkness, I look for light? Or is she saying she evokes the dark to look for light? And One more time. Discontent, pain, to help me search for bright light. Heartbreak. I ain't trying to be over here no more. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so I always use heartbreak, discontent, pain, to help me search for bright light. And beautiful blessings within them. Hmm. In the opener of the book, you described in the prologue, the life that the world would have seen in over the next sort of 10 years of your life before you're before you turn 40 you describe the you know you're super successful hollywood actress you've got this husband who is you know will smith and he's a super successful hollywood act actor you've got these kids you've got family you've got the house you've got it all yeah externally you're killing the game so internally <laughs> you must be killing the game right internally you know i was spiritually bankrupt right I, I find it so i find it so interesting hearing you describe the relationship that both you and will had as it relates to conflict resolution uh -huh. I find it so interesting because I've come to learn over the last couple of years that the way we deal with conflict predicts the long-term health of our relationships. Oh God, yeah. And I think there's this professor, professor I think it's called Professor John Gottman who studied couples mm. and tried to figure out why they end up in divorce. And he says the number one reason is because they build contempt. contempt. 
<laughs> that's all about conflict resolution. How that you're dealing is. with your bullshit. Yes, absolutely. Now you remind me of my partner that, because she wants connection. She wants to talk. She wants to resolve things. She's, you know, she wants to deal with the emotions. I <laughs> <laughs> would like <laughs> to not. Right. I will buy you something to make sure that you're safe. Right. I'll pay for your stuff. Right. But I just want to work. Yeah. And, I, and that's the way you describe it. <laughs> 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 and so I resonated with Will in, in that. But yeah. I, I, you sharing how you felt throughout that story helped me to understand my partner. Beautiful. And all the conversations she's had with me about what she actually wants from me. Yeah. And me misunderstanding her because we have different love. Hmm. That's kind of funny. Cause they've, they've okay. Well, okay. Okay. Let's take a break. I haven't taken a break. It's almost midnight here. Okay. I asked my partner, um, if I died, how long it would take him to grieve. <laughs> and we both have the same answer, which is like, it's just dependent if it's a quick death or if it's not like, it would be so strange if it was out of the blue, but we have a five-year rule that if we disappear, then we have to wait like five years. So like if somehow um, like the cops came to his door and he, they're like, oh, Brittany's gone. Like she disappeared he, and we couldn't find her body. He has to wait five years for me to resurface before moving on. And same, like if they like, if they contact me and they're like, your husband is dead. And I'd be like, um, you know what I'm saying? Um, I wait five years. I'd wait like five years <clears throat> before I moved on, just in case. What if he's on an island? You know, what if, what if the cops couldn't find him because a werewolf kidnapped him? What if he went through a portal? You know, so we want to give each other time to like uh, meet up again in case it's just like a fluke. What if there's a zombie apocalypse and we can't find each other? What, you want us to just move on? You know what I mean? Did you watch Jane the Virgin? Yes. There's a similar situation on the show. Five years is a good number. Maybe six. Yeah, I loved Jane the Virgin. I didn't finish it, actually. I got pretty far, but I didn't end up finishing it. I should go back and finish it up. But yeah, okay, I am back. Um, but yeah, my partner and I definitely feel like, you know, if we had time to grieve, it'd be one thing. But if we didn't have time to grieve, that would be quite shocking, right? Like, I worry about that now. Obviously, there's always that fear, like, he could die. Like, I could die. Like, we are not always together. We might not die together. Like, there's a storm right now. And I'm like, what if the building falls down? I've already come up with 10 different escape routes because I have paranoia over tall buildings falling down, even though it's un it's just so it's stupid. It's paranoid. It doesn't make sense. And I've created like 10 escape plans. All of them, we die. And I was like, I can't see a way out of this. We're too high up. How do we get to the bottom? You know? So anyways. Anyways, let's keep going. Love languages. Yeah. And your love language starts when you're a kid, right? Yeah, for sure. And Will's does too. Absolutely. What was that conflict of your love languages? Will. FYI, love languages isn't based on any science, but it's a nice, fun categorization system that was created by a man, as everything is a construct. And humans came together to create this language called love languages. And I'm here for it. I feel like I have love languages. My partner does. But what we're really saying is that we have this thing and we like, this is how we express it. And this is how we like to be shown affection. But there's no science around like people having literal love languages, right? It was, you know, it was very much like yours. It's like, mm -mm, I want to work. I want to work hard so that you can have everything in the world that you'd ever want. You know, I'm, you're not going to need for anything, right? And my love language was like, but I just want you to be here with me. I don't need all of that stuff. I want to look in your eyes and, you know, feel your love and feel your protection here with me. And, mm. you know. It's like that connection. I wanted to feel like I wanted to make a masterpiece out of our connection, you know, and he wanted to make a masterpiece out of, you know, the, the, the life itself. Right. And neither is wrong. That's so funny. Cause that's how I feel about Jada. Have I switched the narratives in my head? I feel like Jada is the one who always wanted to make the masterpiece out of like the image. And I felt like Will struggled with his own image for sure. But it didn't feel that way. It felt like the opposite. Even the way they express their love, like, feels that it feels like the opposite to me. Maybe I've internalized misogyny. Neither is wrong. And that's what I had to learn. That, that, that's where we've come to now in understanding. Neither one of those wants are wrong. So how do you balance them? Because it can't be one or the other. How do we balance it? Like yin and yang. Everything about life is balance. So I just want you to know that. <laughs> 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 what do you mean? 
I don't know, man. See, I would say they were settling. I would say you should marry someone who has the same vision and has the same idea of what love is. Like my brother and his wife both think love is living on 20 acres and sitting there with their children and like spending time with themselves and not being on social media. Like my my sister-in-law, my brother-in-law don't have social media, right? They're just with their family. That's like what their version is. For me and my partner, it's like having our life together here, being kind of like doing it together. Like us first, everyone else second. Like I love everybody else, but like us first, everyone else second. You know what I mean? So it's interesting. Yeah, I don't see – this is the part in relationships I don't get. Like if you guys are so vastly different, I guess at that point you're invested enough to try, I guess. But if they've been separated since 2016, I guess it's not working. Yeah, I just, I just want you to know that because in, in, as couples, we get into these power struggles. No, my way is right. No, my way is right. Well, if you didn't have this, you know, you know. it gets into all of that, right? And it's like, huh, stop. It's not about anybody being right or wrong. How do you get the balance of it? That's it, right? And so- I mean, sometimes someone is right and someone is wrong, though. Like, right? Like, I don't know. I think I move my relationship more like what is most efficient for the team. So there is a right way to make it work for the team. And sometimes it looks like compromise. And sometimes it means someone's wrong, I guess. I don't, th I'm not afraid to be wrong in my relationship. And I don't think my partner is afraid to be wrong in the relationship. I, I think that I would argue. Yeah, I, it's a values thing, right? So I know nothing is objectively wrong in the scenario, but within the construct of the relationship, I think it's fine that things could be wrong, I guess. You know, it does feel like perhaps Jada doesn't want to admit that to herself. I don't know. I think it's perhaps, I think it, sorry, oh my God. I think it depends on the individual. Some people, they wish to like, make their whole lives around each other. And some people wish to not. Some people can find balance in both. Yeah, it, it you're right. It depends on personality for sure. Yeah. It took Will and I three decades. <laughs> Rip. Yeah, three decades, okay? Three decades. That's I feel what like that's a red flag. I feel like that's a red flag. We'll get to that. We'll get you. It doesn't have to be that, you know? It's like, do it now. Because that's what I've said to my girlfriend is I've told her that I've got this opportunity now because things are going well in my career. So I just want to focus for now. And then we're going to have all of our lives together. I actually said that to her one day and she reminded me that we play when we were arguing. Yeah. I was like, we're going to have all of our lives together. So like, we'll connect later. Yeah, we'll <laughs> connect later. It's like, what? What kind of foolishness is that? You know what I mean? And I'm going to tell you like this. I bet you when you're on your deathbed, you're not going to think about whatever it is you're trying to accomplish and achieve. Interesting. What do you think you're going to think about most when you're on your deathbed? Mm. How you were loved and how you loved. No? 100%. Okay. And even what? as I said it, I thought about Tupac and how you never know how long you've got left with. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, says we can all preach about anything, but if you're not living it, what are you even saying? Yeah, like, what are you saying? Both her and Will made decisions. Like, I see, I feel like neither of them, from the way that I've seen their career, have prioritized their relationships. Like, and again, maybe they should have divorced when they realized they wouldn't. But in my head, look, if you're going to date someone that's more married to their business than to you, that's a type of relationship to have for sure. Um, I wouldn't do it. Like, I don't care about money or success that much, right? But a lot of people do. But it is interesting because she's saying, I agree with what she's saying, but I don't feel like she make, if that makes any sense for the way she's run her own career, then why didn't she become a quiet wife in the background who spent time with her kids? Why did she make her children celebrities? Why did she make, like, why did she tell Will, let's be, like, why didn't she, you know what, I, I don't, I don't, something here doesn't make sense to me, right? If you would have, you would have, like, if you, like, you don't just fall into that much money. You had to make the effort. She wrote a book telling us the secret, like, personal things about her marriage. What does that have to do with, like, on your deathbed? You know, I don't know. Something doesn't feel right here. You know, I don't know. I think that Jada is a red flag. I feel like this whole thing is very weird because from the outside, it seems very much like Will was trying hard and Jada moved on. And that's where the conflict was. Cases sounds like her vibe is I've made all the relationship mistakes so I can tell you what to do instead. Maybe. Miss P says Jada uh, is so it feels very much like Jade is Jada is trying to get clout or something from telling it as a story. I don't know. Something feels wrong. Like. Again, when I look at people's lives, she's living self-help books. Stop it. I don't know. I want to believe her, but I can't because of the way she's run her own life. Like, why'd you even write this book? 
talking about personal, like the reason I don't write about my life and I struggle and I want to sometimes is like it will tell other people's stories. And I do try really hard to be aware that when I tell my story, I'm telling someone else's. It's very difficult, right? And that's why I don't share my family's names and I try to be pretty private about who's in my life and I don't share my partner's name and I keep his life private because they have asked me to do this. They've said like tell stories but like keep some details private. And I'm like for sure. Like the way I tell stories, I ask the people, you know what I mean? Like hey, like mm. – and then, you know, people who aren't in my life anymore, like that's just what it is, right? Nobody knows who you are. Forget it, you know? But yeah, it's interesting. Like she – I don't know, man. You don't know. Why would you ever want to wait and put that off? an excuse though isn't it it is an excuse to justify sure. my own toxic workaholism well you know i wouldn't call it toxic i'm, I'm, I'm always careful with this word toxic <laughs> that we're throwing around right because we're all so wounded exactly could she be a narcissist i don't know like maybe I, I just don't know like i i wouldn't even know i don't know and it's not listen when intimacy makes us have to look at our shit right mm -hmm. it's easy to go I piss you off. I got you this diamond ring. I got you this, you know, beautiful bag. I'm going to take you on this trip. It's like, right? But like real emotional intimacy. We got to we got to deal with our stuff. A lot of stuff comes up there. Hold up. Even right now, why is she painting it like Will is the one who didn't pay attention to her? Is that why she was she wanted to sleep around with other people? Is that why she slept with Jaden's friend? Is that why she opened up the mirror? Like, I don't even know why why do I feel like the whole story is twisting right now? Will Smith literally says in his own book that he was the one who had Jada sacrifice her career for his, who got married even though she didn't want to, and that he was selfish and not good to her. That's fair. That's true. Like, in the, in the in a sense, like, that makes sense to me. Then why didn't they, why did they stay together? You know what I mean? Like, because it depends on how you tell the story. The story could be like Jada wanted to be the bigger star. Jada didn't even want to get married, but she knew Will could get her there. Jada wanted to stay relevant. So depending on how you tell the story, right? I'm not sure. Will talks about not being good to his kids either. Okay, so they're both bad guys or what? Like, did they stay in the relationship for a reason? Why didn't they get divorced earlier? You know what I mean? Like, what is – it's so interesting that people put themselves uh, – three decades, I could not spend my life doing this. This sounds so toxic. Mm. But that's where – that's where connection and love and true happiness, true fulfillment is what's going on in our inner landscape. You talk of this loss of identity mm -hmm. when you married Will. And this is a quote I wrote down. It feels like I can't grasp my own journey. At times I feel resentful and angry. I don't know what to do about it. You and Will had these two sort of different visions for happiness in your lives together. His being that he wanted to take over the world as a global you know, movie star, all the things that he is. Um, and within there, you start to lose yourself a little bit, it seems. This word resentful. Yeah. Very interesting word. Yeah. Can you give color to that word? Why you, why you chose to use that word? Because it's true. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was like, I felt as though at that time, all right, if, if I'm, I mean, I want to help you do all of those things. I'm here to help you with that, right? Um, and I'm like, and in return, I should get a bit of what I want, which is connection, right? And so you just, for me, just giving and giving and giving and giving and giving and forgiving, forgetting, well, not even forgetting, not realizing that I was abandoning myself in the hopes that if I just keep pouring into this, if I just keep pouring into him, if I keep pouring into his dream. Okay, so is the story, is the story... Why isn't this getting picked up by the mainstream? If It just sounds like if Jada had this story, how is it not getting picked up by like, you know, do you think Jada is sus for, for at 50 sleeping with a 23-year-old? Yeah, obviously. And viewed her and Will uh, as mentors? Obviously. Is there a difference between August and Me Too victims? No, I think I think it's super sus when super old people sleep with super young people. But like, whatever. It could happen and it could make sense, but I think it's super weird. Um, so like, okay, so are they kind of in a situation where, uh, that's the problem with fame. I fucking hate money. That's the problem with like fame and like all this stuff. Cause Will could have gotten trapped and it sounds like he did in the loop of like the image. And also Jada got stuck in helping him with that image, but maybe the way they tried to help each other was like destructive and maybe they were never meant to be forever. You know, maybe a big part of it. You know what I mean? Is that they were both so unhealthy and trying to help each other. And they did, to be fair, like they became very wealthy. 
but at the sacrifice of like so much joy. Like I would argue there's not a lot of joy here, right? So it's kind of like Jada should never have slept with August. No rebuttal for that one. I mean, I think it's sussy, but whatever. I think people are broken and so broken people do broken things. But anyways, like I can understand from both of their perspectives just handling this so poorly, right? If we're going to be more nuanced and like look at Jada as a real person, I could imagine a story where – she thinks if I just sacrifice enough, Will will love me correctly. And at the same time, I just can't believe either of them because there's something, well, they lie, right? Like even Jada is willing to lie. Why did Jada separate from Will and then still make a, sh like, I don't know, hold on. Okay. Red Table Talk launched in 2018, running for five se seasons and nearly 130 episodes. Okay. And they separated in 2016, and they've been separated till this day, right? What was that show? How does that show existing and them playing off their marriage like they're in a good marriage and giving relationship advice coincide? with the story that Jada is telling us now. How does the story that Jada is telling us right now work with the reality that she put on this show and lie to the public about the status of their relationship and now is doing a tell-all book where she goes, gotcha, I was lying to you. <laughs> How does that coincide with her spinning this narrative that Will was the controlling one and she did everything for Will and she needed love and so Will needed fame and money. How does this work? You know what I'm saying? And again, obviously they could both just be in it together. They could both be toxic and destructive and they could both be dysfunctional on a level in which that it gets confusing. Because look, if you're playing the money game, if you're really playing the put on a good front game, you not only will you justify very bad behavior, like sleeping with your son's friend and sleeping around in a way that like hurts your spouse or maybe not just getting a divorce like a normal person or like whatever you're doing, you could make it, you know what I'm saying? Like you could stay in a bad situation. I feel like she does this thing where she beautifies or like fictionizes all of the ugliness in the life. Like she never wants to say toxic or dysfunctional. And I think that's weird. Like I don't trust people that are like, Oh, I avoid putting any negative connotation on my actions because I'm like, why? Sometimes like we're humans. We all do shit that's toxic. What are you trying to avoid? It sounds a little bit like she doesn't want to take responsibility for the negatives of the relationship, in my opinion. I'm going to eventually get what I want, right? And that's a false idea in so many ways, right? And so many of us do that. If Will looked back and was trying to give me whatever the hell it was I was asking for, it, it, it wouldn't, he wouldn't have been able to accomplish it anyway. Because if I'm not connected to myself, if I don't have a good relationship with me, there's nothing he can do. So I was going to be asked out anyway. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, that's part of the journey. There's no right. I mean, that is true. You're wrong. Everybody's always trying to find the good guy or bad guy in people's stories. There's no good guys or bad guys. <laughs> Jada. Sounds like something a bad guy would say. <laughs> Look, right and wrong, good and bad, they're constructs. But I believe you can be the bad guy in the, in the story, right? I believe you can be toxic. I believe you can be dysfunctional. And I don't like the idea that she's not owning up any negative word to her. Yes, it's all a journey, girl. Hitler was on a journey too. Can we all agree that it wasn't the greatest of all journeys? Like somebody's the bad guy in that story. Does anyone want to take a guess on who it was? <laughs> like, yes, Hitler is Hitler's story. But, like, he's the bad guy of the story. So, like, in Jada's world, they're, like, I'm okay. I don't know. I'm okay saying, like, oop, I was wrong. I feel like she doesn't want to say, like, wrong. Like, someone was wrong, you know? We're all wounded trying to figure this shit out, you know? And so it took me a long time to realize it is not his responsibility to make you happy. He can't. Well, mm, eh. 
it's mm, it's your introspective responsibility to know yourself in order to convey to your partners what you need. And then it's the responsibility of your partners to be honest on whether or not they can deliver and help you maintain your happiness and authenticity and joy. So a cohesive symbiotic relationship consists of, let's say, two people who are saying, I need this, can you give it to me? And I need this, can you give it to me? And it's rooted in something that's healthy. And then you you are that thing for each other. But when you overpromise or you say like, your happiness is not my responsibility, that can turn into a toxic thing where it's like, they're never gonna be a symbiotic relationship with you. So I'm not sure that I'm down with this language. I think I agree. Like I'm glad my partner and I went on our own introspective journeys on our own. And by the time we met, we were able to communicate to one another hey, I need this in a relationship. Can you provide this? And he said, okay, I need this in a relationship. Can you provide this? And then we both were like, yes, I qualify for this. We'd be very good partners together. And I love you as a consciousness. Bada bing, bada boom, put the ring on it, girl. You know what I'm saying? But the way she's talking right now, let's listen a little bit more. It almost makes it sound like she's saying she learned that Will isn't ever responsible for her happiness. I don't really get that. But hold on, let me see. It. It's impossible. But it took me forever. It's impossible to make you happy. He can't. It's impossible. What? But it took me forever. Hard-headed, stubborn, you know, because that romantic idea. And that's why I talk about checking the boxes. You mean like she had this toxic association of he's going to make you happy, meaning he's going to save you without you doing the work? Is that what she's saying? It's like I did everything I was supposed to do. You get to have your dream. How come I'm not having mine? And that's because Will was doing what he wanted to do. <laughs> he was making himself happy. He was making himself happy. And he says that to you, doesn't he? He says, you, when you separate, he says he wants you to go and... He's like, go. Go. Go make yourself happy? Go make yourself happy. And how did you receive that? Not well. <laughs> <laughs> not well. Because, you know, there can be truth. But you know what I'm saying? It's like how we, you know, I think... It was very true, but I think at that particular point in time, I was just still really resentful. I'm just like, you know, oh, so I helped you get your happiness. And now you just going, you know, throw me to the curb and, you know, I got to do it all on my own now, you know. But that's the truth. I had to do it on my own, <laughs> you know, just like he did. What? You got to do it on your own. What are we talking about? What is she talking about? Charles says, why does she feel so un un unbelievably inauthentic? I mean, that's a problem with Jada. Everyone always feels that way about her. What is she talking about? Okay, hold on. Brittany, be extrospective. Think about this. She could be talking about, see, the problem is like you're in a marriage. So your husband or wife, heterosexual relationship, monogamous, let's just say that dynamic. You are responsible for your spouse's happiness and joy in a sense because you're having a symbiotic relationship. And at the same time, they're responsible for the introspective journey of making sure to convey to you what that means. And then you're responsible for for not over promising that you can deliver on that. Right? Marco says, is she blaming Will because she feels like he inhibited her getting her to happiness? Well, I think like her and Will are selling this story that they chose Will's career over hers, which makes sense, by the way. You should go for the more successful career journey if you're going to be a team. And at the same time, like if you want to live two separate lives, it sounds like they separated so she could go live her life. But it depends on how you want to do marriage. Because again, the way that like I was taught to do marriage, the way that I seen like we're doing our marriage is like realistically, who's the one with the stronger career and whose career are we going to support harder than the others unless the careers coincide together. Because like, like I had a friend who was dating this guy and their careers both placed them in two different cities and neither of them wanted to give up their careers to be together. So I was like, break up, right? That's fair that both of you want to value your career over relationship. And I don't think either of you should quit your career for a relationship that's not worth it. But the question is, when does a relationship become worth quitting your career, right? Like remember in How I Met Your Mother, um, uh... Marshall and Lily, like Lily gets upset because she like quit her career of doing art to follow Marshall because he was a lawyer. So she went back to school and like was going to be an art student and did all that and then just like failed miserably. And she's like, what am I doing? I want to go back to my life with Marshall. I think if your career is meant to live coinciding like in, in, like in conjunction with the other person's career at will. But I think it makes sense that some couples have to pick and choose. And I'm not saying you have to. I'm saying 
it doesn't make sense to me. Something feels wrong here. Like if you have two successful careers, it could be the reason the marriage dissolves and that's fine. You could also throw away one career and pick another one. You could also pick one career as the focus, but do this thing. But if Will was doing his career so separate from hers, then why did she have to give up hers to be with Will? See, that that doesn't make sense to me. There's like something in the story that doesn't feel like reasonable to me. It feels like Will and Jada said, we're going to be together. And even though they should have broken up years ago, they just kept choosing to be together. You know what I mean? Hebe says, it's just the lack of respect she has for Will so loud in her actions, words, and behavior. Yeah, something about it feels weird to me. Miss P says, I think she's meaning like he couldn't make her happy because of what I wanted for him to do was not something he was capable of doing. Maybe like she couldn't force him to be a person he wasn't. Yeah, break up. That's what I'm saying. It feels like this was never a good relationship, like never symbiotic. They were never truly a team, but they kept trying to work to be together. It feels like they forced it. You know what I'm saying? Instead of just accepting like you're not compatible, my dudes. Somebody earlier said it seems like they love each other, but they're not compatible. And I think that's fair. I think she was pregnant unexpectedly. So you think they got married because they got pregnant? You know? I think she was mad that Will didn't want to compromise his career by getting her roles or compromise his reputation. So it put a wedge between him. I guess. Yeah, like some like everything about this story just feels like settling. Like they settled for each other and they did their best. But like it's obviously not a vibe. You got to do it on your own. What does that mean? Got to do it on your own. Do what? And a lot of that's what this this is about and me detoxing from needing fulfillment and validation outside of myself. Detoxing from needing it from will, my marriage, my family, a career. Like I had to get to the bare bones of Jada and okay. walk what I call the exiled lands. And those exiled lands are going into the crevices of, you know, those places within that were holding me back from myself. All the fears, all of the false information and false ideas of what life is and what a marriage is supposed to be and you know who I was supposed to be what a wife is like all of it perfectionism perfectionism and then I just went off to be completely imperfect and took joy in that because being in Hollywood I mean this is a place that values the appearance of perfectionism like everything looks perfect on the surface yeah and I think it's not a healthy idea it's just not healthy and it's not true and nobody can live up to that you know, which is why I've been dismantling that need to be perfect for myself. And that's been a painful ride, but. Leading up to your 40th birthday, mm -hmm. which is also where the book starts. Mm -hmm. I, I read the first pages of the prologue and I couldn't quite believe what I was reading mm -hmm. because the place you're at in your life, this chronic state of discontent that you describe. I, I remember when I got to the chapter 17 in the book, which is no soccer mom here. That was the first time I had to stop reading because it was a lot, a lot for me to take. Mm -hmm hearing that that's what was going on in your head and your mind, that's the way you viewed life. You didn't see any path forward for you. Um, you're 39 years old. Um, apparently, you know, on the surface, it seems like you've got everything that anyone would dream of having, but internally there's this chronic state of discontent. Yeah. If I was, I often say to people, if I was a fly on the wall, but if I was a fly inside the walls. <laughs> yeah. What, were you, what was going through your mind? 39 years old, about to turn 40. Oh, I was, I was in a very, very dark place. Very dark place. Just, I remember the line I read where you said, if I got to 4 p.m. every day. I was like, I made it. I made it. And even that was like so hard. I mean, you know, I was talking to my mother this morning because she just read the book and she said, I can't believe you didn't talk about how you woke up every day crying. Really? Yeah. And I was like, you know, Ma, I, I just, I think it was enough to tell people that I was looking for a cliff to drive off of, <laughs> you know? Hmm. And what she brought up was like, she knew I was unhappy, but she didn't know why. So it wasn't that people around me didn't know that I was really unhappy. It's just that everybody believed what I believe, which is why it was so hard for me to talk about, which is like, you've got everything. What are you unhappy about? Right? And so that's how I was feeling. You've got everything. What are you unhappy about? And that was just, I had so much shame around that. Yeah, that's a bummer. So like, okay, when you, okay, so hear me when I say this. When I say like, okay. When I say you've got everything, what are you unhappy about? It means you have enough of the tools to know the next step. Why don't you know the next step? And a big part of it is like materialism distracts you 
So like in my family, in my bubble, I feel like if there is an unhappiness, they do diminish, like they will critic, like if you say it's mental health, they'll dismiss you because like my, my family doesn't believe in mental health, you know, generally speaking, um, like my parents and stuff. So they would say like, why are you unhappy? Everything is perfect. Or they would say, um, you're struggling because you don't know Jesus, right? They would say that's what's missing. So people sometimes like, when you're really having a hard time, but you have everything, everyone hears that, not just rich people, people middle class, people who are poor, like people get told all the time by their family, like you have everything, what else do you want? You know what I mean? Because they don't want to admit there's something like deep down that they're struggling with, whether it's the meaning crisis, right? Check out John Verveke, or whether it's like my mental health, you know, go to a therapist, or whether it's you know, hey, I want to talk about this thing that happened in my childhood. You know what I mean? I wonder how her mom feels about the way that she talks or references her. You know, it's, you know, so I can understand that for Jada, this is like a, this is a lot to unpack, right? And if she's been rich and they've been focused on Will's career or her career, then they're not focused on getting deeper. And to be fair, when they had that like little round table thing, they were probably playing into the game of being a Hollywood couple. You know what I mean? But it's like anything else. I see this everywhere. Like I feel like Hollywood couples aren't different from every other couple. They just the magnitude is different, which makes it different. The only thing that's different in Hollywood than everyone else's life is that it's bigger. But it's the same thing. You know, ever go to a, like a church meeting and there's always the couple who tries to pretend like they're perfect and their marriage is great. But, you know, for a fact, they're unhappy. You know, the like famous couple in the church or their famous couple at the school or like, oh, that's everyone's like everyone knows that couple. And then there's like actually the couple that everyone loves or there's the, cu you know what I mean? So they were like this couple in Hollywood who was together for a very long time and they had an unortho unorthodox way of living and their kids were unique and they were like the cool family who kind of managed. But at the same time, there was so much. And then the stories just don't align for me. You know what I mean? It's just so fascinating. There's definitely some like something's missing from the stories. It's hard to tell because like they're not... I don't know how trustworthy they are as narrators if they're still fig unpacking stuff, right? That's what's so hard. But it is interesting. Like without a doubt, there is trauma here, right? There's like dysfunction. And so she's wading through it. It is hard to sympathize with her though, Jada. She's not a very sympathetic character, but I don't know why. Because I love tough women. I love, I think she's beautiful. But something about Jada is not a sympathetic character. And I don't know why. It's not that she, like, because, like, you know, it, it, I can't tell what it is other than she feels dishonest to me, right? I understand. And even then, there wasn't a lot of conversation around mental health. Right. And so I was just like, fuck it. I can't keep doing this. I went out. And it was just a really, really dark time. Mm. When you say you were looking for a cliff to drive off of, you're not saying that. Theoretically, or as a metaphor. No, I'm saying I was looking to the point where I was like, Big Sur. I knew exactly the route to drive. I've been there. It's a great camping spot. And it's this really narrow route. And sometimes it gets really foggy there at night. And you, I'm not I'm not making it out of that out of that drop. I, I remember driving that one time going to Big Sur because I was looking like here, like on my and I was like, these drops aren't going to like I need a drop that I'm not making it back. I don't want to be disfigured. I don't want I want out. And I knew I had to make it look like an accident because I did not want my kids to think that I had committed suicide. Mm. No, I was, I was, yeah, I was in a lot of pain. I was in a really, really dark place. And when you're in that place, you just can't see your way out. And you really think, I really thought something was really wrong with me because what I was feeling wasn't matching the exterior of my life. So I really did feel like I, I was just born broken. And I was just wired in a way that just. What was the truth? If that's how you felt, what was in hindsight now, what do you know to be the truth of that emotion and that state of your life, 39, 40 years old? What was actually going on? That I really feel like that sometimes when we get into these states of wanting to die, you know, for those of us who have had like suicidal thoughts and what have you, sometimes it is chemical. That's a different thing. I think mine was more psychological. Something is asking to die, but not you. And it's a, it's, it's a different way of looking at things, right? And so and it's, it is an it is extreme shift in which 
I had to get out of my hmm. cycle of self-hatred. Okay. Everything she's saying is right. But it's not hitting, you know? Maybe this is it. Discord says, not going to lie, I just don't get sympathetic towards her because she's talking without this, vo without this vulnerable um, down-to-earth place. Her talking is too motivational to me. Yeah, maybe that's it. Like, she's saying all the right things, right? But she's saying it in a way that I don't believe her. And I don't know why. It feels uh, like a show is being put on, like she's trying to make herself relatable to me instead of placing herself in an un or placing herself in a relatable position. Discourse says, does it feel like she is not being honest with herself even though she talks like she is? Maybe it's that. Miss P says she doesn't seem genuine like she is uh, PR speaking always. Yeah, maybe it's that. There's a cruelty there. It's, there. it's not just a harshness. It's like hateful. It sort of feels like it's a theme in her energy. Mm. But who knows? I could be projecting. Maybe. Kay says it sounds like she just knows the right words, but she's not actually opening up. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like she read a book on therapy and she's saying all the right words. And she's even saying things I've gone through. Like, the, like I should be able to relate to this. I should be like, yes. I don't believe her. Why don't I believe her? Yeah. Like she's saying all the things that I'm like, yeah, yeah, I did that. Yeah, that makes sense. That's correct. But it feels off. Like a man who talks about his military service, but you don't feel like he's ever served. Does that make sense? Like something in your guts, like you're not talking about it like you've really been to the military. You're talking about it like you're mimicking what it means to be in the military. Maybe because her public actions are not consistent slash the opposite of her words right now. Maybe. Kay says, like, this isn't her experience realizations. This is what she picked up from the self-help bubbles. Maybe, right? She talks like she's over things and I don't believe it. That too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Even though she said she wasn't, she's still working on it. I feel like making a book about her trauma instead of healing and therapy kind of makes sense for the celebrity bubble. That's true. Bryson says, you know how you hate music behind people talking in videos? Yes. It feels like there's this music playing in her imagination as she speaks. Yes. Like, is it just my neurodivergent brain that's like, I feel like I'm being lied to right now and I don't like it. But yeah, the reason I don't like the fake motivational music and videos, it's because it's selling me a product of how I should feel instead of me connecting with a real person. Like, I'm not connecting with her. So while she's talking, it feels so performative to me that I feel like I'm not connecting with her now to be fair I know how hard it is to be vulnerable and even I fall into this where I have moments when I'm talking with somebody else where I'm like more performing than being vulnerable but you guys probably get to see me be more vulnerable in a way but also I keep a distance because I'm professional it's very confusing but she feels like yeah I feel like she's telling me a story rather than a lived experience somehow I don't know why it took this long to connect but maybe it's a Scientology thing oh, I'm behind though, so maybe someone has already said it. Mm. She sounds like she's repeating a therapist and not connecting with an actual with an actual thoughts that are hers or her actual thoughts. Yeah, it feels like she read the book and she knows how to say it, but it doesn't feel real to me, and I don't like it. You know, it's like when Doctor K talks, I'm like, oh, he's gone through it. He knows what's up. He knows he's gone through the same thing. Like I, I am relating to this man. Like I feel ex like so pumped because I'm like, yes. When she talks, I'm like, hmm, mm -mm. even though everything she said about suicide 100% matches on to my lived experience with intrusive thoughts and suicidal ideation and everything, it doesn't feel like I can connect to her. It feels like she's weaponizing it and using it as a tool, trying to successfully maneuver these social dynamics with an ability being real, maybe. And yeah, she's associated with Scientology. But I don't think they're members. I think they go to events maybe, but I don't think they're members. I don't know. I, I remember an interview where Will said he sent his kids to a Scientology school, but I don't remember. I saw that years ago. But I remember thinking like, ew, why is Will sending his kids to a Scientology thing? Or maybe the reason why he doesn't feel real is because she had a ghostwriter. Stop it. <laughs> Stop it. I was in a cycle of self-hatred that I didn't even know. Oh, man. Because we're unconscious of it. So the mind is tricking us. You know what I mean? We got to be careful with this. This isn't as 
reliable as we think, you know? And so, um, but I was in a, I was in a cycle of self-hatred and it wasn't until, thank God for my son that I was, you know, he introduced me, um, his friend's father did ayahuasca and they happened to be talking about it. Did he introduce you to his friend? The one you had sex with? Okay, celebrities who go on ayahuasca trips. Okay, this is like the Chelsea Handler phenomenon. Chelsea Handler went on this ayahuasca trip that I do think profoundly changed her life, but she's still a two in that two bubble. That's why Chelsea's unbearable sometimes because she's such a, like a bubble thinker, which is like fine. But I feel like celebrities have access to drugs and go on these trips, but the bubble of celebrityism is like the strongest bubble to break because it is so tied to like so much temptation that I feel like they're never really having the real like breakthrough of introspection that they could be having. So I will say whatever she's about to say, I always feel bad when celebrities have drug like drug trips because I always feel like they never they never hit, you know, about it and they talk to me about it. Jaden came in the kitchen. He's like, you got to sit down with Moise. Or they have one ego death and they're like, I figured it out. Girl, wait until you have a bazillion. He's like, Mateo, you got to hear about this experience, ma, that their dad had. Was Jaden saying that intentionally? Did he know that you needed No, to he wasn't saying that. He was just curious. He was just, he knows I'm curious. He knows I'm a seeker. Right. Right. right? That was divine. And so I went and talked to them and I was like, hey, is your dad in town? And then their dad came and I talked to him and he, I was like, I need that. And then the universe opened up a door for me to have my own ceremony. Four days of like intense, intense ceremony. But that's when I got to see that cycle of self-hatred. I was like, this is you. These are your thoughts. This is how you feel about yourself. This is the problem. And so the medicine really showed me this pit of self-hatred I was in. And it helped me get out of it. Mm. Chapter 20 of the book. Uh, that's what it is. She's not out of it. And if he, she keeps saying she's out of it, but she's not out of it, right? Miss P says, it kind of reminds me of how Amber Heard spoke about her abuse where something was super off, but most of the people couldn't tell it was off until the trial. Agree. Um, yeah, they're getting the boost, but it's not giving them the real deal. Too many attachments, keeping them tied, uh, from going all the way. Exactly. K. It's like, she just said it. She goes, Oh, I did ayahuasca. And now I have no self-hatred girl. You think one trip of ayahuasca maybe, but come on. She romanticizes negative parts so much. She does. I, I think it's a red flag in people when I see that, you know, Val says she keeps, um, she feels like she still doesn't have an understanding of where her trauma and emotions come from, but she's using therapy words to wrongly describe it. Yeah. I feel like that too, right? And then she does this ayahuasca trip and she's like, I'm a changed person. Girl. <sighs> Discord says it's like she's using popular phrases and words, but it doesn't have any real feeling and emotion or weight behind it. <laughs> like a fucking skinwalker. Stop it. Yeah. It's like she's performing. I feel like this is really common. You know, sometimes I'll get that criticism from people, which I think is really funny, where they'll say Brittany Simon is like the girl who did too much LSD and she thinks like she discovered the universe. And I'm like, the drugs are just a tool, bro. Like meditation and therapy will get you further than drugs. I'm going to be real with you. Drugs are fun, but therapy and meditation will get you way further. Philosophy without the drugs, totally sober, will change your fucking brain unless you look at philosophy like politics. So many people in the philosophy part of the internet look at philosophy like they look at politics, and that's a mistake, right? Even if you read Rand and stuff, like, look, I've read Rand, okay? I've done the Rand journey. I've done it. But the reason Rand fails is because she turns it into politics. Philosophy should get you closer to an actual connection with the fact that you're alive and you're going to die. And most modern philosophy, most philosophy builds an illusion around the importance you have as like a living creature. And that's why I say like when you're, I feel like when you research philosophy or meditation or any of these things, it should bring you towards humility, not towards an obvious ego, right? Like they, they, they look at it like politics or like, what kind of a philosopher are you? And this is wrong. I'm going to debate you about your philosophy. And I'm like, ugh, icky. You're ruining it. You're ruining it. I used to look at philosophy like this when I was in the political bubbles. And I'm like, no, this isn't philosophy. Philosophy is about meaning and truth and knowledge and existence. You know, I even saw people in my comments talk about how like, oh yeah, what Brittany does isn't philosophy. What you do isn't philosophy. It's political philosophy. When you reference traditional philosophy through academia, 
You're not referencing ancient philosophy. You're not referencing anything but Western philosophy that has taught you to debate, demoralize, and tear apart. Not interesting. I want to know knowledge and wisdom and I want to know life. You think that's going to come from a bunch of philosophers that are high off their own farts? No, sir. But I get it. Like the debate bubble loves philosophy debate bubble which is why they expect you to be able to be like, who's your favorite philosopher? Who are you going to, like, I'm not going to debate with you on who, like, what kind of a philosophy, like, I'm a student of knowledge. I am not an objectivist. I'm not a stoic. I am a student of knowledge. And I will take anything that is good from anyone. Okay? Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Book. You, it's I like people get so close and so, and so much farther. You do one ayahuasca trip and you're further from the truth, but you feel like it's the truth because it popped a bubble. You read some philosophy, it pops a little bit of a bubble, so you think you're far, like closer to the truth, you're farther from the truth. I told surrender. Yeah. Surrender is an interesting word. Why is surrender so important in your journey? You have to surrender everything you think you are and everything you think you know. I've spoken to a lot of people that have done... That's the right way to look at it, but it's not showing through her work. Colleagues Anonymous, and they talk about the importance surrender. of surrender. Surrender, yeah. It's like surrendering, you know, for me also surrendering to a, power, a higher power. Mm. And that's a constant. That's every day I have to remind myself and deepen my surrender to a power far greater than myself. Chapter 21, the holy joke, the holy slap, and the holy lessons. Oh, holy slap. It's interesting because there's similarities between chapter 19 and chapter 21 in that you took a lot of the blame mm -hmm. for situations. Chapter 19, the entanglement conversation. Yeah. Because when you watch that clip online at the, at the red table, Will looks tired <laughs> and he looks sad. And yeah. he says that thing, he says, I'm gonna get you back. Yeah. It, did, it made it look like you had cheated on him or something. Right. I had to like check the facts because if you see that clip in isolation, it looks like you cheated on Will or something, which yeah. is not what happened. Yeah. But you put that out anyway. You put, I did. You could have not put that out. I know. Do you regret putting that out? No. You don't? I don't. If I didn't put that out, I wouldn't have seen that next place of healing that I needed. Okay. Because I can take so much like discomfort. It wasn't until I saw how the people around me were affected. I mean, my mother, my kids, my friends, people, like, they were like, how could you do this? And I was like, well, I just wanted to end everything, you know, Will wasn't ready for the world to know mm -hmm. that we weren't together and that we were living separate lives. And I just took it because I just wanted to stop. I just wanted to end. People were like, no. My mother was like, what are you? She was like, you need to get your ass in therapy. <laughs> she was like, you are codependent as hell. Oh, you know, and everybody was just so and then how people that love me so much were affected by that time. I don't think it would have penetrated. And for me to really look at that part of myself. OK, if it hadn't been for how the people around me reacted, because hmm. I don't really care about public in that way, like most people do. I don't whatever, because I understand the chaos and the just absurdity of all of that. But people who love me. I needed that mirror to see really care about public in that way like most people do I don't whatever because I understand the chaos and the just absurdity of all of that but people who love me I needed that mirror to see that place of healing that needed to happen in me in the dynamic within myself what was that dynamic within yourself just like martyrdom oh okay throwing yourself hmm. under the yeah, yeah that martyrdom that I'm, I will martyrdom the holy slap yeah you, you, you write about in the book how you didn't realize that will had actually slapped chris yeah until much later you thought it, you suspected maybe it was a skit i thought or a it joke. was a skit and then i realized it wasn't but i didn't think that he actually made contact with chris looked like he ducked it social media grabbed onto this eye roll mm -hmm. and they um social media believed that that eye roll was some kind of like <laughs> go get him will yeah and even if it was it was like i can't force will to do anything you, know? you and will went together grabbed onto this eye roll mm -hmm. and they um social media believed that that eye roll was some kind of like <laughs> go get him will yeah and even if it was it was like i can't force will to do anything you, and know? you and will weren't together we weren't together as <laughs> you know who's got the hardest job tonight Javier Bardem and his wife. <laughs> Can't wait. Uh oh, Richard. <laughs> that was a nice one. Okay. I'm out here. All right.
Hold on. <laughs> it's, that, was a, that was a nice one. Okay. I'm out here. Uh-oh, Richard. <laughs> oh, wow. 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 <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. Will Smith just smacked the shit out of me. Keep my wife's name out your fucking mouth. Wow, dude. Yeah. It was a G.I. Jane jump. Keep my wife's name out your fucking mouth. I'm going to, okay? <laughs> I can, oh, okay. That was a... Greatest night in the history of television. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. You know, what? The um, social media believe Like he ducked it. Maybe it was a skit. I thought or a it joke. was a skit, and then I realized it wasn't, but I didn't think that he actually made contact with Chris. Looked like he ducked it. Social media grabbed onto this eye roll, mm -hmm. and they, um, social media believed that that eye roll was some kind of like, <laughs> go get him, Will. Yeah, and even if it was, it was like, I can't force Will to do anything. You, know? you and Will weren't together. We weren't together as, you know. What do we think about that? Right? Um. It's like she can't take fucking responsibility for anything. Nothing is ever her responsibility. Nothing is ever wrong. Nothing. That's what I don't like about her. Nothing is ever something. Like with Jada, it feels like she's always telling a story where she's like, I can't make Will do anything. <laughs> like, what? Like that, yeah, I want to know what, same rain. Like, um, I want, I love to know what Will or Kenny was Kenny says, I'd love to know what Will was thinking with because the switch up was wild. The switch up was wild. How do you go from laughing to the slap? He was laughing. Like, I just, this is so weird. Now, maybe the biggest, con if you're ready for Britney conspiracy theory number 72, what if Chris and Will and Jada were in on it? Or what if Chris and Will were in on it together? And it forced Will. What if Will was like, yo, Jada and I are separated? Because apparently Chris slid in the DMs at some point. I don't know if that's true. I heard. But what if, what if, okay, Will was like, yo, I really want to feel connected to Jada. Can you like do something so I can like defend her in public? No, you're right. That's retarded. But listen, I'm just saying, like, there's something here that feels weird to me, right? Like something is off. I thought you didn't like conspiracy theories. It was a joke. That's why it was a joke. Bernice, Bernice conspiracy theories are the best ones because they're jokes. Um, are we, are you sure he knows they're not together? It doesn't make sense. I don't. What's her name? Jada Pinkett Smith, Pinkett Smith says, Chris Rock asked her out amid Will Smith divorce rumors. Jada Pinkett Smith says, comedian Chris Rock asked her to go on a date with him amid rumors that she and Will Smith were divorcing. The actress 20, 52 had revealed she and her husband had secretly been separated for seven years as she promotes her upcoming memoir, Worthy. She told People Magazine, I think every summer all reports would come out that me and Will were getting a divorce. And this particular summer, Chris, he thought we were getting a divorce. She recalled, so he asked me, and basically he was like, I'd love to take you out. And I was like, what do you mean? And he was like, well, aren't you and Will getting a divorce? And I was like, no, Chris, those are just rumors. So she lied again. This bitch lie every minute, this bitch lie. He was appalled, and she profusely apologized. And he profusely apologized, and that was it. So, to be clear, there was rumors they were getting a divorce. They were separated. She said they were fake rumors because they don't get divorced. She's willing to sleep with Jaden's friend, but not with Chris, which is fine. To be fair, I think Chris has a rape allegation against him. Chris 
rock rape allegation. Uh, yep, Chris Rock sexually, allegedly sexually assaulted a woman in the Four Seasons Hotel in 1998. She made claims that it resulted in a child, but the DNA proved otherwise, so she could be lying. Sounds like it could be a lie. So anyways, it doesn't matter. The point is, is, what do we think? Didn't he just show up to one of her book signings and they talked about how much he loved their relationship? I don't fucking, I'm just exhausted. Jesus, what an, that's what I mean. Listen, no one's story is this complicated. Someone, there's too many lies here. And this is why no one fucking likes Jada or Will right now. Because something is wrong. It's a whole ass mess. It is. Something is fucking wrong. Too many fucking loop, like too many holes in this story. That's why we're not enjoying it. That's why we don't trust Jada. And we don't, I don't trust Will either. It just, something feels too fucking weird, bro. Too many holes in this story. We were family. I yeah. was there with him as family, but we weren't together at that time. Were you surprised by the reaction? And so they weren't together at the time. So she told Chris they weren't getting a divorce. So Chris had every right to slide into those DMs because they weren't even in a relationship. To that moment, both for you, but also for Will. And yes and no. I was surprised at how much. I knew I was going to get blamed, but like, I didn't think that it was going to be. Oh my God. What if Lupita was in on it? Okay. And those facial expressions just added to this. Maybe Lupita. I love her though. So team Lupita. I, I mean, it was insane. You know, it was like, wow. Um, but I knew, I knew we were, I knew it was going to be a storm. In the book, you say protection is your love language. Mm -hmm. He protected you, didn't he? Um, Did you see that as an act of love? You know, it's a really complicated moment. <laughs> it's a really complex moment. I would say yes and no in a certain manner, you know? Um, but I definitely think in his way. But it was it was so much more. It wasn't about me. That's why it's complex, right? It's like it was about a lot more than just that moment. A lot more than just me. That's what I know. You know what I mean? Because you know well, and you know where you come from. And yeah, and I, I, there was a lot that was stirring up for him at that time because of emancipation. And he and Chris have their own history. Going back to the 80s. Yeah, going back to the 80s. And it's a deep one. Jada, thank you. No, I don't believe this. Thank you for writing this book because it's it's not until we understand people's context that we understand them. And when we understand them- I don't understand the context. I need to read the book. Apparently I need to read the book. We realize that they are just so much like us. Yeah. In the wounded, the imperfect, the- I'm not this dysfunctional. I'll just say it right now. Survival, the defense, all of those I things. I feel like if you ask me about my life, it's very simple. Okay. Very normal. Traumatized queer kid from a religious bubble, found secularism, moved on, became a nudist, got married. Very easy story. My dysfunction is not the same, but yes, we all feel the same and mourn the same and love the same, but something is fishy about her story. Things, And that's exactly what I got from reading Worthy. Um, but also, as I said to you, I think before we started recording, there were so many moments in there that acted as the advice that no one around me could have given me because they've not walked in those stairs. You, you act as an elder to me in the book because you're, you've helped me to figure out and shine a light on a certain area of my behavior, which comes from um, maybe a wound that I have that is going to hold me back and lead me to a place I don't want to go to. I promise you, yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you're right, you use the word breadcrumbs, but that's exactly what the book is. It's these these, it's your story, but throughout your story, you leave these little nuggets of wisdom and lessons that will guide those that read the book to a better place in their own lives. And they can subjectively define what that better place is, but yeah. the wisdom is enduring because the wisdom is human and it's true. So there's something in there for everybody. It's one of the best books I've ever read because of the, the writing style, the vividness. I, I felt like I was in your grandmother's garden. I felt like I was there at um, all of the key moments when you, when you have what I described, what I thought was a panic attack on the highway and yeah. those moments, the moments of sadness. The vividness of the writing is so, is so profound, but the vulnerability of the book is the most impressive thing. It's easy not to be vulnerable. It's easy to paint a narrative that is self-serving, but that's not what you do here. You seem to be in the pursuit of the truth. And that's exactly what I take away from this book. So thank you so much, Jada. Thank you. Thank you for creating a safe space at your gray table <laughs> <laughs> and uh, for holding my tears today. I appreciate that. Thank you. I don't know. I don't know. She's just not a sympathetic victim to me. I'm not like, oh, I don't care about her life very much. Something about it just doesn't seem authentic. I can't vibe with it. I don't know what it is. Um... I'd very much be curious to see if Brittany review both Will and Jada's books. I don't know, man. That's such a commitment. Oh, that's such a commitment of time. Maybe. I don't know. That's such a commitment of time. It's interesting how she's bringing up Will and his, Will's history with Chris Rock, and I feel like she has no business highlighting it. It's not even that. Will was laughing at Chris. Like, why was she laughing? You know what I mean? And then he switched. I don't get it. 
he sounds so fake with what he said to her. Maybe. I don't know. I just, there's something here. I still can't get the Jadis, like, I can't relate to Jada at all, but it's not my job to relate to everybody, right? It's none of our jobs to relate to everybody universally. Everyone's going to have their unique story and we're all going to relate how we do. You know what I mean? Dun, 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 dun. 